The second part of chapter nineteen of Women in Love. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Women in Love by D. H. Lawrence. Chapter nineteen. Mooney. The second part. The next day, however, he felt wistful and yearning. He thought he had been wrong, perhaps. Perhaps he had been wrong to go to her with an idea of what he wanted. Was it really only an idea? Or was it the interpretation of a profound yearning? If the latter, how was it he was always talking about sensual fulfilment? The two did not agree very well. Suddenly he found himself face to face with a situation. It was as simple as this, fatally simple. On the one hand, he knew he did not want a further sensual experience, something deeper, darker than ordinary life could give. He remembered the African fetishes he had seen at Halliday's so often. There came back to him one, a statuette about two feet high, a tall, slim, elegant figure from West Africa, in dark wood, glossy and suave. It was a woman, with hair dressed high like a melon-shaped dome. He remembered her vividly. She was one of his soul's intimates. Her body was long and elegant. Her face was crushed tiny like a beetle's. She had rows of round, heavy collars like a column of quoits on her neck. He remembered her, her astonishing, cultured elegance, her diminished, beetle face, the astounding, long, elegant body on short, ugly legs, with such protuberant buttocks, so weighty and unexpected, below her slim, long loins. She knew what he himself did not know. She had thousands of years of purely sensual, purely unspiritual knowledge behind her. It must have been thousands of years since her race had died, mystically. That is, since the relation between the senses and the outspoken mind had broken, leaving the experience all in one sort, mystically sensual. Thousands of years ago, that which was imminent in himself must have taken place in these Africans. The goodness, the holiness, the desire for creation and productive happiness must have lapsed, leaving the single impulse for knowledge in one sort. Mindless, progressive knowledge through the senses, knowledge arrested and ending in the senses, mystic knowledge in disintegration and dissolution, knowledge such as the beetles have, which live purely within the world of corruption and cold dissolution. This was why her face looked like a beetle's, this was why the Egyptians worshipped the ball-rolling scarab, because of the principle of knowledge in dissolution and corruption. There is a long way we can travel after the death-break, after that point when the soul in intense suffering breaks, breaks away from its organic hold like a leaf that falls. We fall from the connection with life and hope. We lapse from pure integral being, from creation and liberty, and we fall into the long, long African process of purely sensual understanding, knowledge in the mystery of dissolution. He realised now that this is a long process, thousands of years it takes after the death of the creative spirit. He realised that there were great mysteries to be unsealed, sensual, mindless, dreadful mysteries, far beyond the phallic cult. How far, in their inverted culture, 
had these West Africans gone beyond phallic knowledge? Very, very far. Birkin recalled again the female figure, the elongated, long, long body, the curious, unexpected, heavy buttocks, the long, imprisoned neck, the face with tiny features like a beetle's. This was far beyond any phallic knowledge, sensual, subtle realities, far beyond the scope of phallic investigation. There remained this way, this awful African process, to be fulfilled. It would be done differently by the white races. The white races, having the Arctic North behind them, the vast abstraction of ice and snow, would fulfil a mystery of ice-destructive knowledge, snow-abstract annihilation. Whereas the West Africans, controlled by the burning death abstraction of the Sahara, had been fulfilled in sun-destruction, the putrescent mystery of sun-rays. Was this then all that remained? Was there left now nothing but to break off from the happy creative being? Was the time up? Is our day of creative life finished? Does there remain to us only the strange, awful afterwards of the knowledge in dissolution, the African knowledge, but different in us, who are blonde and blue-eyed from the north? Birkin thought of Gerald. He was one of these strange, white, wonderful demons from the north, fulfilled in the destructive frost mystery. And was he fated to pass away in this knowledge, this one process of frost knowledge, death by perfect cold? Was he a messenger, an omen of the universal dissolution into whiteness and snow? Birkin was frightened. He was tired, too, when he had reached this length of speculation. Suddenly his strange, strained attention gave way. He could not attend to these mysteries any more. There was another way, the way of freedom. There was the paradisal entry into pure, single being, the individual soul taking precedence over love and desire for union, stronger than any pangs of emotion, a lovely state of free, proud singleness, which accepted the obligation of the permanent connection with others, and with the other submits to the yoke and leash of love, but never forfeits its own proud individual singleness, even while it loves and yields. There was the other way, the remaining way, and he must run to follow it. He thought of Ursula, how sensitive and delicate she really was, her skin so over-fine, as if one's skin were wanting. She was really so marvellously gentle and sensitive. Why did he ever forget it? He must go to her at once. He must ask her to marry him. They must marry at once, and so make a definite pledge, enter into a definite communion. He must set out at once and ask her this moment. There was no moment to spare. He drifted on swiftly to Beldover, half unconscious of his own movement. He saw the town on the slope of the hill, not straggling, but as if walled in with the straight final streets of miners' dwellings, making a great square, and it looked like Jerusalem to his fancy. The world was all strange and transcendent. Rosalind opened the door to him. She started slightly as a young girl will, and said, "'Oh, I'll tell father,' with which she disappeared, leaving Birkin in the hall, looking at some reproductions from Picasso, lately introduced by Gudrun. He was admiring the almost wizard, sensuous apprehension of the earth when Will Brangwen appeared, rolling down his shirt-sleeves. "'Well,' said Brangwen, "'I'll get a coat.' 
and he too disappeared for a moment. Then he returned and opened the door of the drawing-room, saying, "'You must excuse me, I was just doing a bit of work in the shed. Come inside, will you?' Birkin entered and sat down. He looked at the bright, reddish face of the other man, at the narrow brow and the very bright eyes, and at the rather sensual lips that unrolled wide and expansive under the black cropped moustache. How curious it was that this was a human being! What Brangwen thought himself to be, how meaningless it was, confronted with the reality of him! Birkin could see only a strange, inexplicable, almost patternless collection of passions and desires and suppressions and traditions and mechanical ideas, all cast unfused and disunited into this slender, bright-faced man of nearly fifty, who was as unresolved now as he was at twenty, and as uncreated. How could he be the parent of Ursula, when he was not created himself? He was not a parent. A slip of living flesh had been transmitted through him, but the spirit had not come from him. The spirit had not come from any ancestor, it had come out of the unknown. A child is the child of the mystery, or it is uncreated. "'The weather's not so bad as it has been,' said Brangwen, after waiting a moment. There was no connection between the two men. "'No,' said Birkin, "'it was full moon two days ago.' "'Oh, you believe in the moon, then, affecting the weather?' "'No, I don't think I do. I don't really know enough about it.' "'You know what they say. The moon and the weather may change together, but the change of the moon won't change the weather.' "'Is that it?' said Birkin. "'I hadn't heard it.' There was a pause. Then Birkin said, "'Am I hindering you? I called to see Ursula, really. Is she at home?' "'I don't believe she is. I believe she's gone to the library. "'I'll just see.' Birkin could hear him inquiring in the dining-room. "'No,' he said, coming back. "'But she won't be long. You wanted to speak to her?' Birkin looked across at the other man, with curious, calm, clear eyes. "'As a matter of fact,' he said, "'I wanted to ask her to marry me.' A point of light came on the golden-brown eyes of the elder man. "'Oh!' he said, looking at Birkin, then dropping his eyes before the calm, steadily watching look of the other. "'Was she expecting you, then?' "'No,' said Birkin. "'No? I didn't know anything of this sort was on foot,' Brangwen smiled awkwardly. Birkin looked back at him, and said to himself, "'I wonder why it should be on foot.' Aloud he said, "'No, it's perhaps rather sudden.' At which, thinking of his relationship with Ursula, he added, "'But I don't know.' "'Quite sudden, is it?' "'Ah,' oh, said Brangwen, rather baffled and annoyed. "'In one way,' replied Birkin, "'not in another.' There was a moment's pause, after which Brangwen said, "'Well, she pleases herself.' "'Oh, yes,' said Birkin calmly. A vibration came into Brangwen's strong voice as he replied, "'Though I shouldn't want her to be in too big a hurry, either. It's no good looking round afterwards when it's too late.' "'Oh, it need never be too late,' said Birkin, "'as far as that goes.' "'How do you mean?' asked the father. "'If one repents being married, the marriage is at an end,' said Birkin. "'You think so?' "'Yes.' "'Aye, well, that may be your way of looking at it.' Birkin, in silence, thought to himself, "'So it may. As for your way of looking at it, William Brangwen, it needs a little explaining.' "'I suppose—' said Brangwen. "'You know what sort of people we are. 
what sort of a bringing up she's had. She, thought Birkin to himself, remembering his childhood's corrections, is the cat's mother. Do I know what sort of a bringing up she's had? he said aloud. He seemed to annoy Brangwen intentionally. Well, he said, she's had everything that's right for a girl to have, as far as possible, as far as we could give it her. I'm sure she has, said Birkin, which caused a perilous full stop. The father was becoming exasperated. There was something naturally irritant to him in Birkin's mere presence. "'And I don't want to see her going back on it all,' he said, in a clanging voice. "'Why?' said Birkin. This monosyllable exploded in Brangwen's brain like a shot. "'Why? I don't believe in your new-fangled ways and new-fangled ideas, in and out like a frog in a gallipot. It would never do for me.' Birkin watched him with steady, emotionless eyes. The radical antagonism in the two men was rousing. "'Yes, but are my ways and ideas newfangled?' asked Birkin. "'Are they?' Brangwen caught himself up. "'I'm not speaking of you in particular,' he said. "'What I mean is that my children have been brought up to think and do according to the religion that I was brought up in myself, and I don't want to see them going away from that.' There was a dangerous pause. "'And beyond that?' asked Birkin. The father hesitated. He was in a nasty position. "'Eh? What do you mean? All I want to say is that my daughter—' He tailed off into silence, overcome by futility. He knew that in some way he was off the track. "'Of course,' said Birkin. "'I don't want to hurt anybody or influence anybody. Ursula does exactly as she pleases.' There was a complete silence, because of the utter failure in mutual understanding. Birkin felt bored. Her father was not a coherent human being. He was a roomful of old echoes. The eyes of the younger man rested on the face of the elder. Brangwen looked up and saw Birkin looking at him. His face was covered with inarticulate anger and humiliation, and sense of inferiority in strength. "'And as for beliefs, that's one thing,' he said. "'But I'd rather see my daughters dead to-morrow than that they should be at the beck and call of the first man that likes to come and whistle for them.' A queer, painful light came into Birkin's eyes. "'As to that,' he said, I only know that it's much more likely that it's I who am at the beck and call of the woman than she at mine. Again there was a pause. The father was somewhat bewildered. I know, he said. She'll please herself, she always has done. I've done my best for them, but that doesn't matter. They've got themselves to please, and if they can help it, they'll please nobody but themselves. "'But she's a right to consider her mother, and me as well.' Brangwen was thinking his own thoughts. "'And I tell you this much, I would rather bury them than seeing them getting into a lot of loose ways, such as you see everywhere nowadays. I'd rather bury them.' "'Yes, but you see,' said Birkin, slowly, rather wearily, bored again by this new turn. They won't give either you or me the chance to bury them, because they're not to be buried." Brangwen looked at him, in a sudden flare of impotent anger. "'Now, Mr. Birkin,' he said, "'I don't know what you've come here for, and I don't know what you're asking for. But my daughters are my daughters, and it's my business to look after them while I can.' Birkin's brows knitted suddenly, his eyes concentrated in mockery but he remained perfectly stiff and still. There was a pause. "'I've nothing against your marrying Ursula,' Brangwen began at length. "'It's got nothing to do with me. She'll do as she likes, me or no me.' Birkin turned away, 
looking out of the window and letting go his consciousness. After all, what good was this? It was hopeless to keep it up. He would sit on till Ursula came home, then speak to her, then go away. He would not accept trouble at the hands of her father. It was all unnecessary, and he himself need not have provoked it. The two men sat in complete silence, Birkin almost unconscious of his own whereabouts. He had come to ask her to marry him. Well, then, he would wait on and ask her. As for what she said, whether she accepted or not, he did not think about it. He would say what he had come to say, and that was all he was conscious of. He accepted the complete insignificance of this household for him. But everything now was as if fated. He could see one thing ahead and no more. From the rest he was absolved entirely from the time being. It had to be left to fate and chance to resolve the issues. At length they heard the gate. They saw her coming up the steps with a bundle of books under her arm. Her face was bright and abstracted as usual, with the abstraction, that look of being not quite there, not quite present to the facts of reality that galled her father so much. She had a maddening faculty of assuming a light of her own, which excluded the reality, and within which she looked radiant, as if in sunshine. They heard her go into the dining-room and drop her armful of books on the table. "'Did you bring me that girl's own?' cried Rosalind. "'Yes, I brought it, but I forgot which one it was you wanted.' "'You would!' cried Rosalind angrily. "'It's right, for a wonder.' Then they heard her say something in a lowered tone. "'Where?' cried Ursula. Again her sister's voice was muffled. Brangwen opened the door and called in his strong, brazen voice, "'Ursula!' She appeared in a moment, wearing her hat. "'Oh, how do you do?' she cried, seeing Birkin, and all dazzled as if taken by surprise. He wondered at her, knowing she was aware of his presence. She had her queer, radiant, breathless manner, as if confused by the actual world, unreal to it, having a complete, bright world of herself alone. "'Have I interrupted a conversation?' she asked. "'No, only a complete silence,' said Birkin. "'Oh,' said Ursula, vaguely, absent. Their presence was not vital to her. She was withheld, she did not take them in. It was a subtle insult that never failed to exasperate her father. "'Mr. Birkin came to speak to you, not to me,' said her father. "'Oh, did he?' she exclaimed vaguely, as if it did not concern her. Then, recollecting herself, she turned to him rather radiantly, but still quite superficially, and said, "'Was it anything special?' "'I hope so,' he said, ironically. "'To propose to you, according to all accounts,' said her father. "'Oh,' said Ursula. "'Oh!' mocked her father, imitating her. "'Have you nothing more to say?' She winced, as if violated. "'Did you really come to propose to me?' she asked of Birkin, as if it were a joke. "'Yes,' he said. I suppose I came to propose. He seemed to fight shy of the last word. "'Did you?' she cried, with her vague radiance. He might have been saying anything whatsoever. She seemed pleased. "'Yes,' he answered. "'I wanted to—I wanted you to agree to marry me.' She looked at him. His eyes were flickering with mixed lights— wanting something of her, yet not wanting it. She shrank a little, as if she were exposed to his eyes, and as if it were a pain to her. She darkened, her soul clouded over, she turned aside, 
she had been driven out of her own radiant single world. And she dreaded contact. It was almost unnatural to her at these times. Yes, she said vaguely, in a doubting, absent voice. Birkin's heart contracted swiftly, in a sudden fire of bitterness. It all meant nothing to her. He had been mistaken again. She was in some self-satisfied world of her own. He and his hopes were accidentals, violations to her. It drove her father to a pitch of mad exasperation. He had had to put up with this all his life from her. "'Well, what do you say?' he cried. She winced. Then she glanced down at her father, half frightened, and she said, "'I didn't speak, did I?' as if she were afraid she might have committed herself. "'No,' said her father, exasperated. "'But you needn't look like an idiot. You've got your wits, haven't you?' She ebbed away in silent hostility. "'I've got my wits. What does that mean?' she repeated in a sullen voice of antagonism. "'You heard what was asked you, didn't you?' cried her father in anger. "'Of course I heard.' "'Well, then, can't you answer?' thundered her father. "'Why should I?' At the impertinence of this retort he went stiff, but he said nothing. "'No,' said Birkin, to help out the occasion, "'there's no need to answer at once. You can say when you like.' Her eyes flashed with a powerful light. "'Why should I say anything?' she cried. "'You do this off your own bat. It has nothing to do with me. Why do you both want to bully me?' "'Bully you! Bully you!' cried her father in bitter, rancorous anger. "'Bully you! Why, it's a pity you can't be bullied into some sense and decency. Bully you! You'll see to that, you self-willed creature!' She stood suspended in the middle of the room, her face glimmering and dangerous. She was set in satisfied defiance. Birkin looked up at her. He too was angry. "'But none is bullying you,' he said, in a very soft, dangerous voice also. "'Oh, yes!' she cried. "'You both want to force me into something!' "'That is an illusion of yours.' he said ironically. "'Illusion!' cried her father. "'A self-opinionated fool, that's what she is!' Birkin rose, saying, "'However, we'll leave it for the time being.' And without another word he walked out of the house. "'You fool! You fool!' her father cried to her with extreme bitterness. She left the room and went upstairs, singing to herself, but she was terribly fluttered, as after some dreadful fight. From her window she could see Birkin going up the road. He went in such a blithe drift of rage that her mind wandered over him. He was ridiculous, but she was afraid of him. She was as if escaped from some danger. Her father sat below, powerless in humiliation and chagrin. It was as if he were possessed with all the devils after one of these unaccountable conflicts with Ursula. He hated her as if his only reality were in hating her to the last degree. He had all hell in his heart. But he went away to escape himself. He knew he must despair, yield, give in to despair and have done. Ursula's face closed. She completed herself against them all. Recoiling upon herself, she became hard and self-completed, like a jewel. She was bright and invulnerable, quite free and happy, perfectly liberated in her self-possession. Her father had to learn not to see her blithe obliviousness, or it would have sent him mad. She was so radiant with all things— in her possession of perfect hostility. She would go on now for days like this, in this bright, frank state of seemingly pure spontaneity, 
so essentially oblivious of the existence of anything but herself, but so ready and facile in her interest. Ah, it was a bitter thing for a man to be near her, and her father cursed his fatherhood. But he must learn not to see her, not to know. She was perfectly stable in resistance when she was in this state, so bright and radiant and attractive in her pure opposition, so very pure, and yet mistrusted by everybody, disliked on every hand. It was her voice, curiously clear and repellent, that gave her away. Only Gudrun was in accord with her. It was at these times that the intimacy between the two sisters was most complete, as if their intelligence were one. They felt a strong, bright bond of understanding between them, surpassing everything else. And during all these days of blind, bright abstraction and intimacy of his two daughters, the father seemed to breathe an air of death, as if he were destroyed in his very being. He was irritable to madness, he could not rest. His daughters seemed to be destroying him. But he was inarticulate and helpless against them. He was forced to breathe the air of his own death. He cursed them in his soul, and only wanted that they should be removed from him. They continued radiant in their easy female transcendency, beautiful to look at. They exchanged confidences. They were intimate in their revelations to the last degree, giving each other at last every secret. They withheld nothing. They told everything, till they were over the border of evil. And they armed each other with knowledge. They extracted the subtlest flavours from the apple of knowledge. It was curious how their knowledge was complementary, that of each to that of the other. Ursula saw her men as sons, pitied their yearning, and admired their courage, and wondered over them, as a mother wonders over her child, with a certain delight in their novelty. But to Gudrun they were the opposite camp. She feared them and despised them, and respected their activities even overmuch. "'Of course,' she said easily, "'there is a quality of life in Birkin which is quite remarkable. "'There is an extraordinary rich spring of life in him, really amazing, "'the way he can give himself to things. "'But there are so many things in life that he simply doesn't know. "'Either he is not aware of their existence at all, "'or he dismisses them as merely negligible.' things which are vital to the other person. In a way, he is not clever enough, he is too intense in spots. Yes, cried Ursula, too much of a preacher. He is really a priest. Exactly. He can't hear what anybody else has to say. He simply cannot hear. His own voice is so loud. Yes, he cries you down. He cries you down repeated Gudrun, and by mere force of violence. And of course it is hopeless. Nobody is convinced by violence. It makes talking to him impossible, and living with him, I should think, would be more than impossible. "'You don't think one could live with him?' asked Ursula. "'I think it would be too wearing, too exhausting. One would be shouted down every time, and rushed into his way without any choice. He would want to control you entirely. He cannot allow that there is any other mind than his own. And then the real clumsiness of his mind is its lack of self-criticism. No, I think it would be perfectly intolerable. Yes, assented Ursula vaguely. She only half agreed with Gudrun. The nuisance is, she said, that one would find almost any man intolerable after a fortnight. "'It's perfectly dreadful,' said Gudrun. "'But Birkin, he is too positive. 
He couldn't bear it if you called your soul your own. Of him that is strictly true. Yes, said Ursula. You must have his soul. Exactly. And what can you conceive more deadly? This was all so true that Ursula felt jarred to the bottom of her soul with ugly distaste. She went on with the discord jarring and jolting through her in the most barren of misery. Then there started a revulsion from Gudrun. She finished life off so thoroughly. She made things so ugly and so final. As a matter of fact, even if it were as Gudrun said about Birkin, other things were true as well. But Gudrun would draw two lines under him and cross him out, like an account that is settled. There he was, summed up, paid for, settled, done with. And it was such a lie. This finality of Gudrun's, this dispatching of people and things in a sentence, it was all such a lie. Ursula began to revolt from her sister. One day, as they were walking along the lane, they saw a robin sitting on the top twig of a bush, singing shrilly. The sisters stood to look at him. An ironical smile flickered on Gudrun's face. "'Doesn't he feel important?' smiled Gudrun. "'Doesn't he?' exclaimed Ursula, with a little ironical grimace. "'Isn't he a little Lloyd George of the air?' "'Isn't he? Little Lloyd George of the air! That's just what they are!' cried Gudrun in delight. Then for days Ursula saw the persistent obtrusive birds as stout, short politicians lifting up their voices from the platform, little men who must make themselves heard at any cost. But even from this there came the revulsion. Some yellow hammers suddenly shot along the road in front of her. And they looked to her so uncanny and inhuman, like flaring yellow barbs shooting through the air on some weird living errand, that she said to herself, After all, it is impudence to call them little Lloyd Georges. They are really unknown to us. They are the unknown forces. It is impudence to look at them, as if they were the same as human beings. They are of another world. How stupid anthropomorphism is! Gudrun is really impudent, insolent, making herself the measure of everything, making everything come down to human standards. Rupert is quite right. Human beings are boring, painting the universe with their own image. The universe is non-human, thank God. It seemed to her irreverence, destructive of all true life, to make little Lloyd Georges of the birds. It was such a lie towards the robins, and such a defamation. Yet she had done it herself. But under Gudrun's influence, so she exonerated herself. So she withdrew again from Gudrun, and from that which she stood for. She turned in spirit towards Birkin again. She had not seen him since the fiasco of his proposal. She did not want to, because she did not want the question of her acceptance thrust upon her. She knew what Birkin meant when he asked her to marry him. Vaguely, Without putting it into speech, she knew. She knew what kind of love, what kind of surrender he wanted. And she was not at all sure that this was the kind of love that she herself wanted. She was not at all sure that it was this mutual unison in separateness that she wanted. She wanted unspeakable intimacies. She wanted to have him utterly, finally, to have him as her own. Oh, 
so unspeakably, in intimacy, to drink him down, ah, oh, like a life-draught. She made great professions to herself of her willingness to warm his foot-soles between her breasts after the fashion of the nauseous Meredith poem. But only on condition that he, her lover, loved her absolutely, with complete self-abandon. And subtly enough, she knew he would never abandon himself finally to her. He did not believe in final self-abandonment. He said it openly. It was his challenge. She was prepared to fight him for it, for she believed in an absolute surrender to love. She believed that love far surpassed the individual. He said the individual was more than love, or than any relationship. For him, the bright, single soul accepted love as one of its conditions, a condition of its own equilibrium. She believed that love was everything. Man must render himself up to her. He must be quaffed to the dregs by her. Let him be her man utterly, and she in return would be his humble slave whether she wanted it or not. End of chapter 19 Recording by Ruth Golding Chapter 20 of Women in Love This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding Women in Love by D. H. Lawrence Chapter 20 Gladiatorial After the fiasco of the proposal, Birkin had hurried blindly away from Beldover, in a whirl of fury. He felt he had been a complete fool that the whole scene had been a farce of the first water. But that did not trouble him at all. He was deeply, mockingly angry that Ursula persisted always in this old cry, "'Why do you want to bully me?' and in her bright, insolent abstraction. He went straight to Shortlands. There he found Gerald standing with his back to the fire in the library as motionless as a man is, who is completely and emptily restless, utterly hollow. He had done all the work he wanted to do, and now there was nothing. He could go out in the car, he could run to town, but he did not want to go out in the car, he did not want to run to town, he did not want to call on the Thirlbys, he was suspended motionless, in an agony of inertia, like a machine that is without power. This was very bitter to Gerald, who had never known what boredom was, who had gone from activity to activity, never at a loss. Now, gradually, everything seemed to be stopping in him. He did not want any more to do the things that offered. Something dead within him just refused to respond to any suggestion. He cast over in his mind what it would be possible to do to save himself from this misery of nothingness, relieve the stress of this hollowness. And there were only three things left that would rouse him, make him live. One was to drink or smoke hashish. The other was to be soothed by Birkin, and the third was women. And there was no one for the moment to drink with, nor was there a woman, and he knew Birkin was out. So there was nothing to do but to bear the stress of his own emptiness. 
when he saw Birkin, his face lit up in a sudden, wonderful smile. "'By God, Rupert,' he said, "'I'd just come to the conclusion that nothing in the world mattered except somebody to take the edge off one's being alone. The right somebody.' The smile in his eyes was very astonishing, as he looked at the other man. It was the pure gleam of relief. His face was pallid and even haggard. "'The right woman, I suppose you mean?' said Birkin spitefully. "'Of course, for choice. Failing that, an amusing man.' He laughed as he said it. Birkin sat down near the fire. "'What were you doing?' he asked. "'I? Nothing. I'm in a bad way just now. Everything's on edge, and I can neither work nor play. I don't know whether it's a sign of old age, I'm sure.' "'You mean you're bored?' "'Bored? I don't know. I can't apply myself. And I feel the devil is either very present inside me, or dead.' Birkin glanced up and looked in his eyes. "'You should try hitting something,' he said. Gerald smiled. "'Perhaps,' he said, "'so long as it was something worth hitting.' "'Quite,' said Birkin, in his soft voice. There was a long pause, during which each could feel the presence of the other. "'One has to wait,' said Birkin. "'Ah, God, waiting! What are we waiting for?' "'Some old Johnny says there are three cures for ennui. "'Sleep, drink, and travel,' said Birkin. "'All oh, cold eggs,' said Gerald. "'In sleep you dream, in drink you curse, "'and in travel you yell at a porter. "'No, work and love are the two. "'When you're not at work you should be in love.' "'Be it, then,' said Birkin. "'Give me the object,' said Gerald. "'The possibilities of love exhaust themselves. "'Do they? And then what?' "'Then you die,' said Gerald. "'So you ought,' said Birkin. "'I don't see it,' replied Gerald. "'He took his hands out of his trousers' pockets "'and reached for a cigarette. "'He was tense and nervous.' He lit the cigarette over a lamp, reaching forward and drawing steadily. He was dressed for dinner, as usual in the evening, although he was alone. "'There's a third one, even to your two, said Birkin. "'Work, love, and fighting. You forget the fight.' "'I suppose I do,' said Gerald. "'Did you ever do any boxing?' "'No.' "'I don't think I did,' said Birkin. "'Aye.' Gerald lifted his head and blew the smoke slowly into the air. "'Why?' said Birkin. "'Nothing. I thought we might have a round. "'It is perhaps true that I want something to hit. "'It's a suggestion.' "'So you think you might as well hit me?' said Birkin. "'You?' "'Well, perhaps. In a friendly kind of way, of course.' "'Quite,' said Birkin, bitingly. Gerald stood leaning back against the mantelpiece. He looked down at Birkin, and his eyes flashed with a sort of terror, like the eyes of a stallion that are bloodshot and overwrought, turned glancing backwards in a stiff terror. "'I feel that if I don't watch myself I shall find myself doing something silly,' he said. "'Why not do it?' said Birkin coldly. Gerald listened with quick impatience. He kept glancing down at Birkin, as if looking for something from the other man. "'I used to do some Japanese wrestling,' said Birkin. "'A Jap lived in the same house with me in Heidelberg.' and he taught me a little. But I was never much good at it.' "'You did!' exclaimed Gerald. 
that's one of the things I've never ever seen done. You mean jiu-jitsu, I suppose? Yes, but I am no good at those things. They don't interest me. They don't? They do me. What's the start? I'll show you what I can, if you like, said Birkin. You will? A queer, smiling look tightened Gerald's face for a moment, as he said, "'Well, I'd like it very much.' "'Then we'll try jiu-jitsu. Only you can't do much in a starched shirt.' "'Then let us strip and do it properly. Hold a minute.' He rang the bell and waited for the butler. "'Bring a couple of sandwiches and a siphon,' he said to the man. "'and then don't trouble me any more to-night, or let anybody else.' The man went. Gerald turned to Birkin with his eyes lighted. "'And you used to wrestle with a Jap,' he said. "'Did you strip?' "'Sometimes.' "'You did. What was he like, then, as a wrestler?' "'Good, I believe. I am no judge. He was very quick and slippery and full of electric fire.' It is a remarkable thing. What a curious sort of fluid force they seem to have in them, those people. Not like a human grip, like a polyp. Gerald nodded. I should imagine so, he said, to look at them. They repel me, rather. Repel and attract both. They are very repulsive when they are cold, and they look grey. But when they are hot and roused, there is a definite attraction, a curious kind of full electric fluid, like eels. Well, yes, probably. The man brought in the tray and set it down. Don't come in any more, said Gerald. The door closed. Well then, said Gerald, shall we strip and begin? Will you have a drink first? No, I, I don't want one. Neither do I. Gerald fastened the door and pushed the furniture aside. The room was large. There was plenty of space. It was thickly carpeted. Then he quickly threw off his clothes and waited for Birkin. The latter, white and thin, came over to him. Birkin was more a presence than a visible object. Gerald was aware of him completely, but not really visually. Whereas Gerald himself was concrete and noticeable, a piece of pure, final substance. Now, said Birkin, I will show you what I learned and what I remember. You let me take you so and his hands closed on the naked body of the other man. In another moment he had Gerald swung over lightly and balanced against his knee head downwards. Relaxed, Gerald sprang to his feet with eyes glittering. "'That's smart,' he said. "'Now try again.' So the two men began to struggle together. They were very dissimilar. Birkin was tall and narrow. His bones were very thin and fine. Gerald was much heavier and more plastic. His bones were strong and round. His limbs were rounded. All his contours were beautifully and fully moulded. He seemed to stand with a proper rich weight on the face of the earth, whilst Birkin seemed to have the centre of gravitation in his own middle. And Gerald had a rich frictional kind of strength, rather mechanical but sudden and invincible, whereas Birkin was abstract as to be almost intangible. He impinged invisibly upon the other man, scarcely seeming to touch him like a garment, and then suddenly piercing in a tense fine grip that seemed to penetrate into the very quick of Gerald's being. They stopped, they discussed methods, they practised grips and throws, they became accustomed to each other, to each other's rhythm, 
they got a kind of mutual physical understanding. And then, again, they had a real struggle. They seemed to drive their white flesh deeper and deeper against each other, as if they would break into a oneness. Birkin had a great subtle energy that would press upon the other man with an uncanny force, weigh him like a spell put upon him. Then it would pass, and Gerald would heave free, with white, heaving, dazzling movements. So the two men entwined and wrestled with each other, working nearer and nearer. Both were white and clear, but Gerald flushed smart red where he was touched, and Birkin remained white and tense. He seemed to penetrate into Gerald's more solid, more diffuse bulk, to interfuse his body through the body of the other, as if to bring it subtly into subjection, always seizing with some rapid, necromantic foreknowledge every motion of the other flesh converting and counteracting it, playing upon the limbs and trunk of Gerald like some hard wind. It was as if Birkin's whole physical intelligence interpenetrated into Gerald's body, as if his fine, sublimated energy entered into the flesh of the fuller man like some potency, casting a fine net a prison through the muscles into the very depths of Gerald's physical being. So they wrestled swiftly, rapturously, intent and mindless at last, two essential white figures working into a tighter, closer oneness of struggle, with a strange octopus-like knotting and flashing of limbs in the subdued light of the room. A tense white knot of flesh, gripped in silence between the walls of old brown books. Now and again came a sharp gasp of breath, or a sound like a sigh, then the rapid thudding of movement on the thickly carpeted floor then the strange sound of flesh escaping under flesh. Often, in the white interlaced knot of violent living being that swayed silently, there was no head to be seen, only the swift tight limbs, the solid white backs, the physical junction of two bodies clinched into oneness. Then would appear the gleaming ruffled head of Gerald as the struggle changed then, for a moment, the dun-coloured, shadow-like head of the other man would lift up from the conflict, the eyes wide and dreadful and sightless. At length Gerald lay back inert on the carpet, his breast rising in great slow panting, whilst Birkin kneeled over him almost unconscious. Birkin was much more exhausted. He caught little short breaths, he could scarcely breathe any more. The earth seemed to tilt and sway, and a complete darkness was coming over his mind. He did not know what happened. He slid forward, quite unconscious, over Gerald, and Gerald did not notice. Then he was half conscious again, aware only of the strange tilting and sliding of the world, the world was sliding, everything was sliding off into the darkness, and he was sliding, endlessly, endlessly away. He came to consciousness again, hearing an immense knocking outside. What could be happening? What was it? The great hammer-stroke resounding through the house. He did not know. And then it came to him that it was his own heart beating. But that seemed impossible. The noise was outside. No, it was inside himself, it was his own heart. 
and the beating was painful, so strained, surcharged. He wondered if Gerald heard it. He did not know whether he was standing, or lying, or falling. When he realised that he had fallen prostrate upon Gerald's body, he wondered, he was surprised. But he sat up, steadying himself with his hand, and waiting for his heart to become stiller and less painful. It hurt very much, and took away his consciousness. Gerald, however, was still less conscious than Birkin. They waited dimly, in a sort of not-being, for many uncounted, unknown minutes. "'Of course,' panted Gerald, "'I didn't have to be rough with you. I had to keep back my force.' Birkin heard the sound as if his own spirit stood behind him, outside him, and listened to it. His body was in a trance of exhaustion, his spirit heard thinly, his body could not answer. Only he knew his heart was getting quieter. He was divided entirely between his spirit, which stood outside and knew, and his body that was a plunging, unconscious stroke of blood. "'I could have thrown you using violence,' panted Gerald. "'But you beat me right enough.' "'Yes,' said Birkin, hardening his throat and producing the words in the tension there. "'You're much stronger than I. You could beat me easily.' Then he relaxed again to the terrible plunging of his heart and his blood. "'It surprised me,' panted Gerald, "'what strength you've got! Almost supernatural!' "'For a moment,' said Birkin. He still heard as if it were his own disembodied spirit hearing, standing at some distance behind him. It drew nearer, however, his spirit and the violent striking of blood in his chest was sinking quieter, allowing his mind to come back. He realised that he was leaning with all his weight on the soft body of the other man. It startled him, because he thought he had withdrawn. He recovered himself and sat up. But he was still vague and unestablished. He put out his hand to steady himself, it touched the hand of Gerald that was lying out on the floor, and Gerald's hand closed warm and sudden over Birkin's. They remained exhausted and breathless, the one hand clasped closely over the other. It was Birkin whose hand, in swift response, had closed in a strong warm clasp over the hand of the other. Gerald's clasp had been sudden and momentaneous. The normal consciousness, however, was returning, ebbing back. Birkin could breathe almost naturally again. Gerald's hand slowly withdrew. Birkin slowly, dazedly rose to his feet and went towards the table. He poured out a whisky and soda. Gerald also came for a drink. "'It was a real set, too, wasn't it?' said Birkin, looking at Gerald with darkened eyes. "'God, yes!' said Gerald. He looked at the delicate body of the other man, and added, "'It wasn't too much for you, was it?' "'No. One ought to wrestle and strive and be physically close. It makes one sane.' "'You do think so?' "'I do. Don't you?' "'Yes,' said Gerald. There were long spaces of silence between their words. The wrestling had some deep meaning to them, an unfinished meaning. We are mentally, spiritually intimate, therefore we should be more or less physically intimate too. It is more whole. "'Certainly it is.' said Gerald. Then he laughed pleasantly, adding, "'It's rather wonderful to me.' He stretched out his arms handsomely. 
Yes, said Birkin. I don't know why one should have to justify oneself. No. The two men began to dress. I also think that you are beautiful, said Birkin to Gerald, and that is enjoyable too. One should enjoy what is given. You think I'm beautiful? How do you mean, physically? asked Gerald, his eyes glistening. Yes. You have a northern kind of beauty, like light refracted from snow, and a beautiful plastic form. Yes, that is there to enjoy as well. We should enjoy everything. Gerald laughed in his throat and said, That's certainly one way of looking at it. I can say this much. I feel better. It has certainly helped me. Is this the Bruderschaft you wanted? Perhaps. Do you think this pledges anything? I don't know, laughed Gerald. At any rate, one feels freer and more open now, and that is what we want. Certainly, said Gerald. They drew to the fire with the decanters and the glasses and the food. I always eat a little before I go to bed, said Gerald. I sleep better. I should not sleep so well, said Birkin. No? There you are, we're not alike. I'll put a dressing gown on. Birkin remained alone, looking at the fire. His mind had reverted to Ursula. She seemed to return again into his consciousness. Gerald came down wearing a gown of broad-barred, thick black and green silk, brilliant and striking. "'You are very fine,' said Birkin, looking at the full robe. "'It was a caftan in Bacara, said Gerald. "'I like it.' "'I like it, too.' Birkin was silent, thinking how scrupulous Gerald was in his attire, how expensive, too. He wore silk socks, and studs of fine workmanship, and silk underclothing, and silk braces. Curious! This was another of the differences between them. Birkin was careless and unimaginative about his own appearance. "'Of course you,' said Gerald, as if he had been thinking, "'there's something curious about you. You're curiously strong. One doesn't expect it. It's rather surprising.' Birkin laughed. He was looking at the handsome figure of the other man blonde and comely in the rich robe. And he was half thinking of the difference between it and himself, so different, as far perhaps apart as man from woman, yet in another direction. But really it was Ursula, it was the woman who was gaining ascendance over Birkin's being at this moment. Gerald was becoming dim again, lapsing out of him. "'Do you know,' he said suddenly, "'I went and proposed to Ursula Brangwen tonight that she should marry me.' He saw the blank, shining wonder come over Gerald's face. "'You did?' "'Yes. Almost formally, speaking first to her father, as it should be in the world, though that was accident or mischief. Gerald only stared in wonder, as if he did not grasp. "'You don't mean to say that you seriously went and asked her father to let you marry her?' "'Yes,' said Birkin. "'I did.' "'What, had you spoken to her before about it, then?' "'No, not a word. I suddenly thought I would go there and ask her.' and her father happened to come instead of her. So I asked him first. "'If you could have her,' concluded Gerald. "'Yes, that.' "'And you didn't speak to her?' "'Yes, she came in afterwards, so it was put to her as well.' "'It was! And what did she say then? You're an engaged man?' "'No.' She only said she didn't want to be bullied into answering. She what? 
said she didn't want to be bullied into answering. Said she didn't want to be bullied into answering? Why? What did she mean by that? Birkin raised his shoulders. Can't say, he answered. Didn't want to be bothered just then, I suppose. But is this really so? And what did you do then? I walked out of the house and came here. You came straight here? Yes. Gerald stared in amazement and amusement. He could not take it in. But is this really true as you say it now? Word for word. It is. He leaned back in his chair, filled with delight and amusement. Well, that's good, he said. And so you came here to wrestle with your good angel, did you? Did I? said Birkin. Well, it looks like it. Isn't that what you did? Now Birkin could not follow Gerald's meaning. And what's going to happen? said Gerald. You're going to keep open the proposition, so to speak? I suppose so. I vowed to myself I would see them all to the devil. But I suppose I shall ask her again in a little while. Gerald watched him steadily. So you're fond of her, then? he asked. I think I love her, said Birkin, his face going very still and fixed. Gerald glistened for a moment with pleasure, as if it were something done specially to please him. Then his face assumed a fitting gravity, and he nodded his head slowly. "'You know,' he said, "'I always believed in love, true love. But where does one find it nowadays?' "'I don't know,' said Birkin. "'Very rarely,' said Gerald. Then, after a pause, "'I've never felt it myself, not what I should call love. I've gone after women and been keen enough over some of them, but I've never felt love. I don't believe I've ever felt as much love for a woman as I have for you. Not love. You understand what I mean? Yes, I'm sure you've never loved a woman. You feel that, do you? And do you think I ever shall? You understand what I mean? He put his hand to his breast, closing his fist there, as if he would draw something out. I mean that, that I can't express what it is, but I know it. What is it, then? asked Birkin. You see, I can't put it into words. I mean, at any rate, something abiding, something that can't change. His eyes were bright and puzzled. Now, do you think I shall ever feel that for a woman? he said anxiously. Birkin looked at him and shook his head. I don't know, he said. I could not say. Gerald had been on the qui vive as awaiting his fate. Now he drew back in his chair. No, he said, and neither do I, and neither do I. We are different, you and I, said Birkin. I can't tell your life. No, said Gerald, no more can I. But I'll tell you, I begin to doubt it, that you will ever love a woman. Well, yes, what you would truly call love. You doubt it. Well, I begin to. There was a long pause. Life has all kinds of things, said Birkin. There isn't only one road. Yes, I believe that too. I believe it. And mind you, I don't care how it is with me. I don't care how it is. So long as I don't feel... He paused, and a blank, barren look passed over his face to express his feeling. So long as I feel I've 
lived somehow. And I don't care how it is, but I want to feel that. Fulfilled, said Birkin. Well, perhaps it is fulfilled. I don't use the same words as you. It is the same. End of chapter 20 Recording by Ruth Golding Chapter 21 of Women in Love This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding Women in Love by D. H. Lawrence Chapter 21 Threshold Gudrun was away in London, having a little show of her work with a friend, and looking round, preparing for flight from Beldover. Come what might, she would be on the wing in a very short time. She received a letter from Winifred Cry, ornamented with drawings. Father also has been to London to be examined by the doctors. It made him very tired. They say he must rest a very great deal, so he is mostly in bed. He brought me a lovely tropical parrot in faience of Dresden ware, also a man ploughing, and two mice climbing up a stalk, also in faience. The mice were Copenhagen ware. They are the best, but mice don't shine so much, otherwise they are very good. Their tails are slim and long. They all shine nearly like glass. Of course it is the glaze, but I don't like it. Gerald likes the man ploughing the best. His trousers are torn. He is ploughing with an ox, being, I suppose, a German peasant. It is all grey and white, white shirt and grey trousers, but very shiny and clean. Mr. Birkin likes the girl best, under the hawthorn blossom, with a lamb, and with daffodils painted on her skirts, in the drawing-room, but that is silly, because the lamb is not a real lamb, and she is silly too. Dear Miss Brangwen, are you coming back soon? You are very much missed here. I enclose a drawing of father sitting up in bed. He says he hopes you are not going to forsake us. Oh, dear Miss Brangwen, I am sure you won't. Do come back and draw the ferrets. They are the most lovely noble darlings in the world. We might carve them in hollywood, playing against a background of green leaves. Oh, do let us, for they are most beautiful. Father says we might have a studio. Gerald says we could easily have a beautiful one over the stables. It would only need windows to be put in the slant of the roof, which is a simple matter. Then you could stay here all day and work, and we could live in the studio like two real artists like the man in the picture in the hall, with the frying-pan, and the walls all covered with drawings. I long to be free, to live the free life of an artist. Even Gerald told father that only an artist is free, because he lives in a creative world of his own. Gudrun caught the drift of the family intentions in this letter. Gerald wanted her to be attached to the household at Shortlands. He was using Winifred as his stalking-horse. The father thought only of his child. He saw a rock of salvation in Gudrun. And Gudrun admired him for his perspicacity. The child, moreover, was really exceptional. Gudrun was quite content. She was quite willing, given a studio, to spend her days at Shortlands. She disliked the grammar school already thoroughly. She wanted to be free. If a studio were provided, she would be free to go on with her work. She would await the turn of events with complete serenity. And she was really interested in Winifred. She would be quite glad to understand the girl. So there was quite a little festivity on Winifred's account the day Gudrun returned to Shortlands. "'You should make a bunch of flowers to give to Miss Brangwen when she arrives,' Gerald said, smiling to his sister. "'Oh, no!' cried Winifred. "'It's silly.' "'Not at all. It's a very charming and ordinary attention.' "'Oh, it is silly!' 
protested Winifred, with all the extreme mauvaise honte of her years. Nevertheless, the idea appealed to her. She wanted very much to carry it out. She flitted round the greenhouses and the conservatory, looking wistfully at the flowers on their stems. And the more she looked, the more she longed to have a bunch of the blossoms she saw, the more fascinated she became with her little vision of ceremony, and the more consumedly shy and self-conscious she grew, till she was almost beside herself. She could not get the idea out of her mind. It was as if some haunting challenge prompted her, and she had not enough courage to take it up. So again she drifted into the greenhouses, looking at the lovely roses in their pots, and at the virginal cyclamens, and at the mystic white clusters of a creeper. The beauty, oh, the beauty of them! And oh, the paradisal bliss, if she should have a perfect bouquet, and could give it to Gudrun the next day! Her passion and her complete indecision almost made her ill. At last she slid to her father's side. Daddy, she said. What, my precious? But she hung back, the tears almost coming to her eyes in her sensitive confusion. Her father looked at her, and his heart ran hot with tenderness, an anguish of poignant love. What do you want to say to me, my love? Daddy, her eyes smiled laconically. Isn't it silly if I give Miss Brangwen some flowers when she comes? The sick man looked at the bright, knowing eyes of his child, and his heart burned with love. No, darling, that's not silly. It's what they do to queens. This was not very reassuring to Winifred. She half suspected that queens in themselves were a silliness. Yet she so wanted her little romantic occasion. "'Shall I, then?' she asked. "'Give Miss Brangwen some flowers. Do, Bertie. Tell Wilson I say you are to have what you want.' The child smiled a small, subtle, unconscious smile to herself, in anticipation of her way. "'But I won't get them till tomorrow,' she said. "'Not till tomorrow, Bertie. Give me a kiss, then." Winifred silently kissed the sick man, and drifted out of the room. She again went the round of the greenhouses and the conservatory, informing the gardener, in her high, peremptory, simple fashion, of what she wanted, telling him all the blooms she had selected. "'What do you want these for?' Wilson asked. "'I want them,' she said. She wished servants did not ask questions. "'Ay, you've said as much, but what do you want them for? For decoration, or to send away, or what?' "'I want them for a presentation bouquet.' "'A presentation bouquet? Who's coming, then? The Duchess of Portland?' "'No.' "'Oh, not her.' Well, you'll have a rare poppy show if you put all the things you've mentioned into your bouquet. Yes, I want a rare poppy show. You do. Then there's no more to be said. The next day Winifred, in a dress of silvery velvet, and holding a gaudy bunch of flowers in her hand, waited with keen impatience in the schoolroom, looking down the drive for Gudrun's arrival. It was a wet morning. Under her nose was the strange fragrance of hothouse flowers. The bunch was like a little fire to her. She seemed to have a strange new fire in her heart. This slight sense of romance stirred her like an intoxicant. At last she saw Gudrun coming, and she ran downstairs to warn her father and Gerald. They, laughing at her anxiety and gravity, came with her into the hall. The manservant came hastening to the door, and there he was, relieving Gudrun of her umbrella and then of her raincoat. The welcoming party hung back, till their visitor entered the hall. Gudrun was flushed with the rain, her hair was blown in loose little curls, she was like a flower just opened in the rain, 
the heart of the blossom just newly visible, seeming to emit a warmth of retained sunshine. Gerald winced in spirit, seeing her so beautiful and unknown. She was wearing a soft blue dress, and her stockings were of dark red. Winifred advanced with odd, stately formality. "'We are so glad you've come back,' she said. "'These are your flowers.' She presented the bouquet. "'Mine!' cried Gudrun. She was suspended for a moment, then a vivid flush went over her. She was as if blinded for a moment with a flame of pleasure. Then her eyes, strange and flaming, lifted and looked at the father and at Gerald. And again Gerald shrank in spirit, as if it would be more than he could bear as her hot, exposed eyes rested on him. There was something so revealed, she was revealed beyond bearing to his eyes. He turned his face aside, and he felt he would not be able to avert her and he writhed under the imprisonment. Gudrun put her face into the flowers. "'But how beautiful they are!' she said in a muffled voice. Then with a strange, suddenly revealed passion she stooped and kissed Winifred. Mr. Cry went forward with his hand held out to her. "'I was afraid you were going to run away from us,' he said playfully. Gudrun looked up at him with a luminous, roguish, unknown face. "'Really?' she replied. "'No, I didn't want to stay in London.' Her voice seemed to imply that she was glad to get back to Shortlands. Her tone was warm and subtly caressing. "'That is a good thing,' smiled the father. "'You see, you are very welcome here among us.' Gudrun only looked into his face with dark blue, warm, shy eyes. She was unconsciously carried away by her own power. "'And you look as if you came home in every possible triumph,' Mr. Cry continued, holding her hand. "'No,' she said, glowing strangely. "'I haven't had any triumph till I came here.' "'Ah, come, come. We're not going to hear any of those tales. "'Haven't we read notices in the newspaper, Gerald?' "'You came off pretty well,' said Gerald to her, shaking hands. "'Did you sell anything?' "'No,' she said, "'not much.' "'Just as well,' he said. She wondered what he meant, but she was all aglow with her reception, carried away by this little flattering ceremonial on her behalf. "'Winifred,' said the father, "'Have you a pair of shoes for Miss Brangwen? "'You had better change at once.' "'Gudrun went out with her bouquet in her hand. "'Quite a remarkable young woman,' said the father to Gerald when she had gone. "'Yes,' replied Gerald briefly, as if he did not like the observation. "'Mr. Cry liked Gudrun to sit with him for half an hour. Usually he was ashy and wretched, with all the life gnawed out of him, but as soon as he rallied he liked to make believe that he was just as before, quite well and in the midst of life, not of the outer world, but in the midst of a strong essential life, and to this belief Gudrun contributed perfectly. With her he could get by stimulation those precious half-hours of strength and exaltation and pure freedom, when he seemed to live more than he had ever lived. She came to him as he lay propped up in the library. His face was like yellow wax, his eyes darkened, as it were sightless. His black beard now streaked with grey, seemed to spring out of the waxy flesh of a corpse. Yet the atmosphere about him was energetic and playful. Gudrun subscribed to this perfectly. To her fancy he was just an ordinary man. Only his rather terrible appearance was photographed upon her soul, away beneath her consciousness. She knew that, in spite of his playfulness, his eyes could not change from their darkened vacancy. 
They were the eyes of a man who is dead. "'Ah, this is Miss Brangwen,' he said, suddenly rousing as she entered, announced by the man-servant. "'Thomas, put Miss Brangwen a chair here. That's right.' He looked at her soft, fresh face with pleasure. It gave him the illusion of life. "'Now you will have a glass of sherry and a little piece of cake. Thomas?' "'No, thank you,' said Gudrun. And as soon as she had said it, her heart sank horribly. The sick man seemed to fall into a gap of death at her contradiction. She ought to play up to him, not contravene him. In an instant she was smiling her rather roguish smile. "'I don't like sherry very much,' she said, "'but I like almost anything else.' The sick man caught at this straw instantly. "'Not sherry, no, something else. What then? What is there, Thomas?' "'Port wine? Curacao?' "'I would love some Curacao,' said Gudrun, looking at the sick man confidingly. "'You would. Well then, Thomas, Curacao, and a little cake, or a biscuit?' "'A biscuit,' said Gudrun. She did not want anything, but she was wise. "'Yes.' He waited till she was settled with her little glass and her biscuit. Then he was satisfied. "'You have heard the plan,' he said with some excitement, "'for a studio for Winifred over the stables.' "'No!' exclaimed Gudrun in mock wonder. "'Oh, I thought Winnie wrote it to you in her letter.' "'Oh, yes, of course. But I thought perhaps it was only her own little idea.' Gudrun smiled subtly, indulgently. The sick man smiled also, elated. "'Oh, no! It is a real project. There is a good room under the roof of the stables, with sloping rafters. We had thought of converting it into a studio.' "'How very nice that would be!' cried Gudrun, with excited warmth. The thought of the rafters stirred her. "'You think it would? Well, it can be done.' "'But how perfectly splendid for Winifred! Of course it is just what is needed if she is to work at all seriously. One must have one's workshop, otherwise one never ceases to be an amateur.' "'Is that so? Yes. Of course I should like you to share it with Winifred.' "'Thank you so much!' Gudrun knew all these things already, but she must look shy and very grateful, as if overcome. "'Of course, what I should like best would be if you could give up your work at the grammar school, and just avail yourself of the studio and work there, well, as much or as little as you liked.' He looked at Gudrun with dark, vacant eyes. She looked back at him as if full of gratitude. These phrases of a dying man were so complete and natural, coming like echoes through his dead mouth. "'And as to your earnings, you don't mind taking from me what you have taken from the Education Committee, do you? I don't want you to be a loser.' "'Oh!' said Gudrun. "'If I can have the studio and work there, I can earn money enough, really I can.' "'Well,' he said, pleased to be the benefactor, "'we can see about all that. You wouldn't mind spending your days here?' "'If there were a studio to work in,' said Gudrun, "'I could ask for nothing better.' "'Is that so?' He was really very pleased. But already he was getting tired. She could see the grey, awful semi-consciousness of mere pain and dissolution coming over him again, the torture coming into the vacancy of his darkened eyes. It was not over yet, this process of death. She rose softly, saying, "'Perhaps you will sleep. I must look for Winifred.' She went out, telling the nurse that she had left him. Day by day 
the tissue of the sick man was further and further reduced. Nearer and nearer the process came, towards the last knot which held the human being in its unity. But this knot was hard and unrelaxed, the will of the dying man never gave way. He might be dead in nine-tenths, yet the remaining tenth remained unchanged, till it too was torn apart. With his will he held the unit of himself firm, but the circle of his power was ever and ever reduced. It would be reduced to a point at last, then swept away. To adhere to life he must adhere to human relationships, and he caught at every straw. Winifred, the butler, the nurse, Gudrun, these were the people who meant all to him in these last resources. Gerald, in his father's presence, stiffened with repulsion. It was so, to a less degree, with all the other children except Winifred. They could not see anything but the death when they looked at their father. It was as if some subterranean dislike overcame them. They could not see the familiar face, hear the familiar voice, they were overwhelmed by the antipathy of visible and audible death. Gerald could not breathe in his father's presence, he must get out at once. And so, in the same way, the father could not bear the presence of his son. It sent a final irritation through the soul of the dying man. The studio was made ready, Gudrun and Winifred moved in. They enjoyed so much the ordering and the appointing of it. And now they need hardly be in the house at all. They had their meals in the studio. They lived there safely, for the house was becoming dreadful. There were two nurses in white flitting silently about, like heralds of death. The father was confined to his bed. There was a come and go of sotto voce sisters and brothers and children. Winifred was her father's constant visitor. Every morning, after breakfast, she went into his room when he was washed and propped up in bed, to spend half an hour with him. "'Are you better, Daddy?' she asked him invariably. And invariably he answered, "'Yes, I think I'm a little better, pet.' She held his hand in both her own, lovingly and protectively and this was very dear to him. She ran in again as a rule at lunch-time to tell him the course of events, and every evening, when the curtains were drawn and his room was cosy, she spent a long time with him. Gudrun was gone home. Winifred was alone in the house. She liked best to be with her father. They talked and prattled at random, he always as if he were well, just the same as when he was going about so that Winifred, with a child's subtle instinct for avoiding the painful things, behaved as if nothing serious was the matter. Instinctively she withheld her attention, and was happy. Yet in her remoter soul she knew as well as the adults knew, perhaps better. Her father was quite well in his make-belief with her, but when she went away he relapsed under the misery of his dissolution. But still there were these bright moments, though as his strength waned, his faculty for attention grew weaker, and the nurse had to send Winifred away to save him from exhaustion. He never admitted that he was going to die. He knew it was so, he knew it was the end. Yet even to himself he did not admit it. He hated the fact mortally. His will was rigid. He could not bear being overcome by death. For him there was no death. And yet at times he felt a great need to cry out and to wail and complain. He would have liked to cry aloud to Gerald, so that his son should be horrified out of his composure. Gerald was instinctively aware of this, 
and he recoiled to avoid any such thing. This uncleanness of death repelled him too much. One should die quickly like the Romans, one should be master of one's fate in dying as in living. He was convulsed in the clasp of this death of his father's, as in the coils of the great serpent of Laocoon. The great serpent had got the father, and the son was dragged into the embrace of horrifying death along with him. He resisted always, and in some strange way he was a tower of strength to his father. The last time the dying man asked to see Gudrun, he was grey with near death. Yet he must see someone, he must, in the intervals of consciousness, catch into connection with the living world, lest he should have to accept his own situation. Fortunately he was most of his time dazed and half gone, and he spent many hours dimly thinking of the past, as it were dimly reliving his old experiences. But there were times, even to the end, when he was capable of realising what was happening to him in the present, the death that was on him. And these were the times when he called in outside help, no matter whose. For to realise this death that he was dying was a death beyond death, never to be born. It was an admission never to be made. Gudrun was shocked by his appearance and by the darkened, almost disintegrated eyes that still were unconquered and firm. "'Well,' he said in his weakened voice, "'and how are you and Winifred getting on?' "'Oh, very well indeed,' replied Gudrun. There were slight dead gaps in the conversation, as if the ideas called up were only elusive straws floating on the dark chaos of the sick man's dying. "'The studio answers all right,' he said. "'Splendid! It couldn't be more beautiful and perfect,' said Gudrun. She waited for what he would say next. "'And you think Winifred has the makings of a sculptor?' It was strange how hollow the words were, meaningless. "'I'm sure she has. She will do good things one day.' "'Ah! Then her life won't be altogether wasted, you think?' Gudrun was rather surprised. "'Sure it won't!' she exclaimed softly. "'That's right.' Again Gudrun waited for what he would say. "'You find life pleasant. It is good to live, isn't it?' he asked, with a pitiful faint smile that was almost too much for Gudrun. "'Yes,' she smiled. She would lie at random. "'I get a pretty good time, I believe.' "'That's right.' A happy nature is a great asset." Again Gudrun smiled, though her soul was dry with repulsion. Did one have to die like this, having the life extracted forcibly from one, whilst one smiled and made conversation to the end? Was there no other way? Must one go through all the horror of this victory over death, the triumph of the integral will that would not be broken till it disappeared utterly? One must. It was the only way. She admired the self-possession and the control of the dying man exceedingly, but she loathed the death itself. She was glad the everyday world held good, and she need not recognise anything beyond. "'You are quite all right here. Nothing we can do for you. Nothing you find wrong in your position?' "'Except that you are too good to me,' said Gudrun. "'Ah, well. 
"'The fault of that lies with yourself,' he said. And he felt a little exultation that he had made this speech. He was still so strong and living, but the nausea of death began to creep back on him in reaction. Gudrun went away back to Winifred. Mademoiselle had left. Gudrun stayed a good deal at Shortlands, and a tutor came in to carry on Winifred's education, but he did not live in the house. He was connected with the grammar school. One day Gudrun was to drive with Winifred and Gerald and Birkin to town in the car. It was a dark, showery day. Winifred and Gudrun were ready and waiting at the door. Winifred was very quiet, but Gudrun had not noticed. Suddenly the child asked, in a voice of unconcern, "'Do you think my father's going to die, Miss Brangwen?' Gudrun started. "'I don't know,' she replied. "'Don't you truly?' "'Nobody knows for certain. He may die, of course.' The child pondered a few moments. Then she asked, "'But do you think he will die?' It was put almost like a question in geography or science, insistent, as if she would force an admission from the adult. The watchful, slightly triumphant child was almost diabolical. "'Do I think he will die?' repeated Gudrun. "'Yes, I do.' But Winifred's large eyes were fixed on her and the girl did not move. "'He is very ill,' said Gudrun. A small smile came over Winifred's face, subtle and sceptical. "'I don't believe he will,' the child asserted mockingly, and she moved away into the drive. Gudrun watched the isolated figure, and her heart stood still. Winifred was playing with a little rivulet of water, absorbedly, as if nothing had been said. "'I've made a proper dam,' she said, out of the moist distance. Gerald came to the door from out of the hall behind. "'It is just as well she doesn't choose to believe it,' he said. Gudrun looked at him. Their eyes met, and they exchanged a sardonic understanding. "'Just as well,' said Gudrun. He looked at her again, and a fire flickered up in his eyes. "'Best to dance while Rome burns, since it must burn, don't you think?' he said. She was rather taken aback, but gathering herself together she replied, "'Oh, better dance than wail, certainly.' "'So I think.' and they both felt the subterranean desire to let go, to fling away everything, and lapse into a sheer unrestraint, brutal and licentious. A strange black passion surged up pure in Gudrun. She felt strong, she felt her hands so strong, as if she could tear the world asunder with them. She remembered the abandonments of Roman licence, and her heart grew hot. She knew she wanted this herself also, or something, something equivalent. Ah, if that which was unknown and suppressed in her were once let loose, what an orgiastic and satisfying event it would be! And she wanted it. She trembled slightly from the proximity of the man who stood just behind her, suggestive of the same black licentiousness that rose in herself. She wanted it with him, this unacknowledged frenzy. For a moment the clear perception of this preoccupied her, distinct and perfect in its final reality. Then she shut it off completely, saying, "'We might as well go down to the lodge after Winifred. We can get in the car there. So we can, he answered, going with her. They found Winifred at the lodge, admiring the litter of pure-bred white puppies. The girl looked up, 
and there was a rather ugly, unseeing cast in her eyes as she turned to Gerald and Gudrun. She did not want to see them. "'Look!' she cried. Three new puppies! Marshall says this one seems perfect. Isn't it a sweetling? But it isn't so nice as its mother. She turned to caress the fine white bull terrier bitch that stood uneasily near her. My dearest Lady Cry, she said, you are beautiful as an angel on earth. Angel, angel. Don't you think she's good enough and beautiful enough to go to heaven, Gudrun? They will be in heaven, won't they? And especially my darling Lady Cry. Mrs. Marshall, I say. Yes, Miss Winifred, said the woman, appearing at the door. Oh, do call this one Lady Winifred if she turns out perfect, will you? Do tell Marshall to call it Lady Winifred. I'll tell him, but I'm afraid that's a gentleman puppy, Miss Winifred. Oh, no! There was the sound of a car. There's Rupert, cried the child, and she ran to the gate. Birkin, driving his car, pulled up outside the lodge gate. We're ready, cried Winifred. I want to sit in front with you, Rupert, may I? I'm afraid you'll fidget about and fall out, he said. No, I won't. I do want to sit in front next to you. It makes my feet so lovely and warm from the engines. Birkin helped her up amused at sending Gerald to sit by Gudrun in the body of the car. "'Have you any news, Rupert?' Gerald called as they rushed along the lanes. "'News?' exclaimed Birkin. "'Yes!' Gerald looked at Gudrun, who sat by his side, and he said, his eyes narrowly laughing, "'I want to know whether I ought to congratulate him, but I can't get anything definite out of him.' Gudrun flushed deeply. "'Congratulate him on what?' she asked. "'There was some mention of an engagement. At least he said something to me about it.' Gudrun flushed darkly. "'You mean with Ursula?' she said in challenge. "'Yes, that is so, isn't it?' "'I don't think there's any engagement,' said Gudrun coldly. "'That's so. Still no developments, Rupert?' he called. Where? Matrimonial? No. How's that? called Gudrun. Birkin glanced quickly round. There was irritation in his eyes also. Why? he replied. What do you think of it, Gudrun? Oh! she cried, determined to fling her stone also into the pool since they had begun. I don't think she wants an engagement. Naturally, she's a bird that prefers the bush. Gudrun's voice was clear and gong-like. It reminded Rupert of her father's, so strong and vibrant. And I, said Birkin, his face playful but yet determined, I want a binding contract, and am not keen on love, particularly free love. They were both amused. Why this public avowal? Gerald seemed suspended a moment in amusement. "'Love isn't good enough for you?' he called. "'No!' shouted Birkin. "'Ha! Well, that's being over-refined,' said Gerald, and the car ran through the mud. "'What's the matter, really?' said Gerald, turning to Gudrun. This was an assumption of a sort of intimacy that irritated Gudrun, almost like an affront. It seemed to her that Gerald was deliberately insulting her, and infringing on the decent privacy of them all. "'What is it?' she said in her high, repellent voice. "'Don't ask me. I know nothing about ultimate marriage, I assure you, or even penultimate.' "'Only the ordinary, unwarrantable brand,' replied Gerald. "'Just so. Same here.' I am no expert on marriage and degrees of ultimateness. Seems to be a bee that buzzes loudly in Rupert's bonnet. Exactly. But that is his trouble, exactly. Instead of wanting a woman for herself, he wants his ideas fulfilled. 
which, when it comes to actual practice, is not good enough. Oh, no! Best go slap for what's womanly in woman, like a bull at a gate. Then he seemed to glimmer in himself. You think love is the ticket, do you? he asked. Certainly, while it lasts, you only can't insist on permanency, came Gudrun's voice, strident above the noise. "'Marriage or no marriage, ultimate or penultimate, or just so-so. Take the love as you find it.' "'As you please, or as you don't please,' she echoed. "'Marriage is a social arrangement, I take it, and has nothing to do with the question of love.' His eyes were flickering on her all the time. She felt as if he were kissing her freely and malevolently. It made the colour burn in her cheeks but her heart was quite firm and unfailing. "'You think Rupert is off his head a bit?' Gerald asked. Her eyes flashed with acknowledgment. "'As regards a woman, yes,' she said, "'I do. There is such a thing as two people being in love for the whole of their lives, perhaps. But marriage is neither here nor there, even then. If they are in love, well and good.' If not, why break eggs about it? Yes, said Gerald. That's how it strikes me. But what about Rupert? I can't make out. Neither can he nor anybody. He seems to think that if you marry, you can get through marriage into a third heaven or something, all very vague. Very? And who wants a third heaven? As a matter of fact, Rupert has a great yearning to be safe to tie himself to the mast. "'Yes, it seems to me he's mistaken there, too,' said Gudrun. "'I'm sure a mistress is more likely to be faithful than a wife, just because she's her own mistress. No, he says he believes that a man and wife can go further than any other two beings, but where is not explained. They can know each other heavenly and hellish, but particularly hellish, so perfectly that they go beyond heaven and hell into—there it all breaks down—into nowhere. "'Into paradise,' he says," laughed Gerald. Gudrun shrugged her shoulders. "'Je m'en fiche of your paradise,' she said. "'Not being a Mohammedan,' said Gerald. Birkin sat motionless, driving the car, quite unconscious of what they said. And Gudrun, sitting immediately behind him, felt a sort of ironic pleasure in thus exposing him. "'He says,' she added, with a grimace of irony, "'that you can find an eternal equilibrium in marriage if you accept the unison and still leave yourself separate. Don't try to fuse.' "'Doesn't inspire me.' said Gerald. "'That's just it,' said Gudrun. "'I believe in love, in a real abandon, if you're capable of it,' said Gerald. "'So do I,' said she. "'And so does Rupert, too, though he is always shouting.' "'No,' said Gudrun. "'He won't abandon himself to the other person. You can't be sure of him.' That's the trouble, I think. Yet he wants marriage. Marriage, et puis? Le paradis, mocked Gudrun. Birkin, as he drove, felt a creeping of the spine, as if somebody was threatening his neck. But he shrugged with indifference. It began to rain. Here was a change. He stopped the car and got down to put up the hood. End of chapter 21 Recording by Ruth Golding Chapter 22 of Women in Love This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Women in Love by D. H. Lawrence. Chapter 22. 
woman to woman. They came to the town, and left Gerald at the railway station. Gudrun and Winifred were to come to tea with Birkin, who expected Ursula also. In the afternoon, however, the first person to turn up was Hermione. Birkin was out, so she went into the drawing-room, looking at his books and papers, and playing on the piano. Then Ursula arrived. She was surprised, unpleasantly so, to see Hermione, of whom she had heard nothing for some time. "'It is a surprise to see you,' she said. "'Yes,' said Hermione. "'I've been away at Aix. "'Oh, for your health?' "'Yes.' The two women looked at each other. Ursula resented Hermione's long, grave, downward-looking face. There was something of the stupidity and the unenlightened self-esteem of a horse in it. "'She's got a horse face,' Ursula said to herself. "'She runs between blinkers.' It did seem as if Hermione, like the moon, had only one side to her penny. There was no obverse. She stared out all the time on the narrow, but to her complete, world of the extant consciousness. In the darkness she did not exist. Like the moon, one half of her was lost to life. Her self was all in her head. She did not know what it was spontaneously to run, or move like a fish in the water, or a weasel on the grass. She must always know. But Ursula only suffered from Hermione's one-sidedness. She only felt Hermione's cool evidence, which seemed to put her down as nothing. Hermione who brooded and brooded till she was exhausted with the ache of her effort at consciousness, spent and ashen in her body, who gained so slowly and with such effort her final and barren conclusions of knowledge, was apt, in the presence of other women, whom she thought simply female, to wear the conclusions of her bitter assurance like jewels, which conferred on her an unquestionable distinction, established her in a higher order of life. She was apt, mentally, to condescend to women such as Ursula, whom she regarded as purely emotional. Poor Hermione! It was her one possession, this aching certainty of hers. It was her only justification. She must be confident here, for God knows she felt rejected and deficient enough elsewhere. In the life of thought, of the spirit, she was one of the elect, and she wanted to be universal. But there was a devastating cynicism at the bottom of her. She did not believe in her own universals, they were sham. She did not believe in the inner life, it was a trick not a reality. She did not believe in the spiritual world, it was an affectation. In the last resort, she believed in mammon, the flesh, and the devil. These at least were not sham. She was a priestess without belief, without conviction, suckled in a creed outworn, and condemned to the reiteration of mysteries that were not divine to her. Yet there was no escape. She was a leaf upon a dying tree. What help was there, then, but to fight still for the old withered truths, to die for the old outworn belief, to be a sacred and inviolate priestess of desecrated mysteries? The old great truths had been true and she was a leaf of the old great tree of knowledge that was withering now. To the old and last truth, then, she must be faithful, even though cynicism and mockery took place at the bottom of her soul. "'I am so glad to see you,' she said to Ursula in her slow voice that was like an incantation. 
You and Rupert have become quite friends. Oh, yes, said Ursula. He is always somewhere in the background. Hermione paused before she answered. She saw perfectly well the other woman's vaunt. It seemed truly vulgar. Is he? she said slowly, and with perfect equanimity. And do you think you'll marry? The question was so calm and mild, so simple and bare and dispassionate, that Ursula was somewhat taken aback, rather attracted. It pleased her almost like a wickedness. There was some delightful naked irony in Hermione. Well, replied Ursula, he wants to awfully, but I'm not so sure. Hermione watched her with slow, calm eyes. She noted this new expression of vaunting. How she envied Ursula, a certain unconscious positivity, even her vulgarity. "'Why aren't you sure?' she asked in her easy sing-song. She was perfectly at her ease, perhaps even rather happy in this conversation. "'You don't really love him?' Ursula flushed a little at the mild impertinence of this question, and yet she could not definitely take offence. Hermione seemed so calmly and sanely candid. After all, it was rather great to be able to be so sane. "'He says it isn't love he wants,' she replied. "'What is it, then?' Hermione was slow and level. "'He wants me really to accept him in marriage.' Hermione was silent for some time, watching Ursula with slow, pensive eyes. "'Does he?' she said at length, without expression, then rousing. "'And what is it you don't want? You don't want marriage?' "'No, I don't, not really.' I don't want to give the sort of submission he insists on. He wants me to give myself up, and I simply don't feel that I can do it." Again there was a long pause before Hermione replied, "'Not if you don't want to.' Then again there was silence. Hermione shuddered with a strange desire. Ah. If only he had asked her to subserve him, to be his slave. She shuddered with desire. "'You see, I can't, but exactly in what does—' They had both begun at once. They both stopped. Then Hermione, assuming priority of speech, resumed as if wearily, "'To what does he want you to submit?' He says he wants me to accept him non-emotionally and finally. I really don't know what he means. He says he wants the demon part of himself to be mated physically, not the human being. You see, he says one thing one day, and another the next, and he always contradicts himself. And always thinks about himself and his own dissatisfaction said Hermione slowly. Yes, cried Ursula, as if there were no one but himself concerned. That makes it so impossible. But immediately she began to retract. He insists on my accepting God knows what in him, she resumed. He wants me to accept him as, as an absolute, but it seems to me he doesn't want to give anything. He doesn't want real warm intimacy. He won't have it. He rejects it. He won't let me think, really. And he won't let me feel. He hates feelings. There was a long pause, bitter for Hermione. Oh, if only he would have made this demand of her. Her he drove into thought, drove inexorably into knowledge and then execrated her for it. "'He wants me to sink myself,' 
Ursula resumed, not to have any being of my own. Then why doesn't he marry an odalisk? said Hermione, in her mild sing-song. If it is that he wants. Her long face looked sardonic and amused. Yes, said Ursula vaguely. After all, the tiresome thing was, he did not want an odalisk, he did not want a slave. Hermione would have been his slave. There was in her a horrible desire to prostrate herself before a man, a man who worshipped her, however, and admitted her as the supreme thing. He did not want an odalisk. He wanted a woman to take something from him, to give herself up so much that she could take the last realities of him, the last facts, the last physical facts, physical and unbearable. And if she did, would he acknowledge her? Would he be able to acknowledge her through everything, or would he use her just as his instrument, use her for his own private satisfaction, not admitting her? That was what the other men had done. They had wanted their own show, and they would not admit her. They turned all she was into nothingness. Just as Hermione now betrayed herself as a woman, Hermione was like a man, she believed only in men's things. She betrayed the woman in herself. And Birkin, would he acknowledge, or would he deny her? Yes, said Hermione as each woman came out of her own separate reverie. "'It would be a mistake. I think it would be a mistake.' "'To marry him?' asked Ursula. "'Yes,' said Hermione slowly. "'I think you need a man, soldierly, strong-willed.' Hermione held out her hand and clenched it with rhapsodic intensity. You should have a man like the old heroes. You need to stand behind him as he goes into battle. You need to see his strength and to hear his shout. You need a man physically strong and virile in his will, not a sensitive man. There was a break, as if the Pythoness had uttered the oracle. And now the woman went on in a rhapsody-wearied voice. And you see, Rupert isn't this. He isn't. He is frail in health and body. He needs great, great care. Then he is so changeable and unsure of himself. It requires the greatest patience and understanding to help him. And I don't think you are patient. You would have to be prepared to suffer, dreadfully. I can't tell you how much suffering it would take to make him happy. He lives an intensely spiritual life at times. Too, too wonderful. And then come the reactions. I can't speak of what I have been through with him. We have been together so long, I really do know him, I do know what he is. And I feel I must say it, I feel it would be perfectly disastrous for you to marry him, for you even more than for him. Hermione lapsed into bitter reverie. He is so uncertain, so unstable. He wearies and then reacts. I couldn't tell you what his reactions are. I couldn't tell you the agony of them. That which he affirms and loves one day, a little later he turns on it in a fury of destruction. He is never constant, always this awful, dreadful reaction. Always the quick change from good to bad, bad to good, and nothing is so devastating, nothing. Yes, said Ursula humbly, you must have suffered. 
an unearthly light came on Hermione's face. She clenched her hand like one inspired. "'And one must be willing to suffer, willing to suffer for him hourly, daily, if you are going to help him, if he is to keep true to anything at all.' "'And I don't want to suffer hourly and daily,' said Ursula. "'I don't. I should be ashamed. I think it is degrading not to be happy.' Hermione stopped and looked at her a long time. "'Do you?' she said at last. And this utterance seemed to her a mark of Ursula's far distance from herself. For to Hermione suffering was the greatest reality, come what might. Yet she too had a creed of happiness. "'Yes,' she said. One should be happy. But it was a matter of will. Yes, said Hermione, listlessly now. I can only feel that it would be disastrous, disastrous, at least to marry in a hurry. Can't you be together without marriage? Can't you go away and live somewhere without marriage? I do feel that marriage would be fatal for both of you. I think for you even more than for him, and I think of his health. Of course, said Ursula, I don't care about marriage. It isn't really important to me. It's he who wants it. It is his idea for the moment, said Hermione, with that weary finality and a sort of si jeunesse savait infallibility. There was a pause, then Ursula broke into faltering challenge. You think I'm merely a physical woman, don't you? No, indeed, said Hermione. No, indeed, but I think you're vital and young. It isn't a question of years, or even of experience. It is almost a question of race. Rupert is race old, he comes of an old race, and you seem to me so young. You come of a young, inexperienced race. Do I? said Ursula. But I think he is awfully young on one side. Yes, perhaps childish in many respects. Nevertheless, they both lapsed into silence. Ursula was filled with deep resentment and a touch of hopelessness. "'It isn't true,' she said to herself, silently addressing her adversary. "'It isn't true, and it is you who want a physically strong, bullying man, not I. It is you who want an unsensitive man, not I. You don't know anything about Rupert, not really, in spite of the years you have had with him.' You don't give him a woman's love, you give him an ideal love, and that is why he reacts away from you. You don't know. You only know the dead things. Any kitchen maid would know something about him, you don't know. What do you think your knowledge is but dead understanding that doesn't mean a thing? You are so false and untrue, how could you know anything? What is the good of your talking about love, you untrue spectre of a woman? How can you know anything when you don't believe? You don't believe in yourself and your own womanhood, so what good is your conceited, shallow cleverness?" The two women sat on in antagonistic silence. Hermione felt injured that all her good intention, all her offering, only left the other woman in vulgar antagonism. But then— Ursula could not understand, never would understand, could never be more than the usual jealous and unreasonable female, with a good deal of powerful female emotion, female attraction, and a fair amount of female understanding, but no mind. Hermione had decided long ago that where there was no mind it was useless to appeal for reason, one had merely to ignore the ignorant. And Rupert— he had now reacted towards the strongly female, healthy, selfish woman. It was his reaction for the time being. There was no helping it at all. 
It was all a foolish backward and forward, a violent oscillation that would at length be too violent for his coherency, and he would smash and be dead. There was no saving him. This violent and directionless reaction between animalism and spiritual truth would go on in him till he tore himself in two between the opposite directions, and disappeared meaninglessly out of life. It was no good. He too was without unity, without mind, in the ultimate stages of living. Not quite man enough to make a destiny for a woman. They sat on till Birkin came in and found them together. He felt at once the antagonism in the atmosphere, something radical and insuperable, and he bit his lip, but he affected a bluff manner. "'Hello, Hermione, are you back again? How do you feel?' "'Oh, better. And how are you? You don't look well.' "'Oh, I believe Gudrun and Winnie Cry are coming in to tea. At least they said they were. We shall be a tea-party. What train did you come by, Ursula?' It was rather annoying to see him trying to placate both women at once. Both women watched him, Hermione with deep resentment and pity for him, Ursula very impatient. He was nervous, and apparently in quite good spirits, chattering the conventional commonplaces. Ursula was amazed and indignant at the way he made small talk. He was adept as any fa in Christendom. She became quite stiff, she would not answer. It all seemed to her so false and so belittling. And still Gudrun did not appear. "'I think I shall go to Florence for the winter,' said Hermione at length. "'Will you?' he answered. "'But it is so cold there.' "'Yes, but I shall stay with Palestra. It is quite comfortable.' "'What takes you to Florence?' "'I don't know,' said Hermione slowly. Then she looked at him with her slow, heavy gaze. "'Barnes is starting his school of ascetics, and Ollandese is going to give a set of discourses on the Italian national policy.' "'Both rubbish,' he said. "'No, I don't think so,' said Hermione. Which do you admire, then? I admire both. Barnes is a pioneer. And then I am interested in Italy, in her coming to national consciousness. I wish she'd come to something different from national consciousness, then, said Birkin, especially as it only means a sort of commercial industrial consciousness. I hate Italy and her national rant, and I think Barnes is an amateur. Hermione was silent for some moments, in a state of hostility. But yet she had got Birkin back again into her world. How subtle her influence was! She seemed to start his irritable attention into her direction exclusively, in one minute. He was her creature. "'No,' she said, "'you are wrong.' Then a sort of tension came over her. She raised her face like the pythoness inspired with oracles, and went on in rhapsodic manner. Il Sandro mi scrive che ha colto il più grande entusiasmo. Tutti i giovani, e fanciulli e ragazzi, sono tutti... She went on in Italian, as if, in thinking of the Italians, she thought in their language. He listened with a shade of distaste to her rhapsody, then he said, "'For all that, I don't like it. Their nationalism is just industrialism, that and a shallow jealousy I detest so much.' "'I think you're wrong. I think you're wrong,' said Hermione. "'It seems to me purely spontaneous and beautiful, the modern Italian's passion, for it is a passion.' for Italy. L'Italia—' "'Do you know Italy well?' Ursula asked of Hermione. Hermione hated to be broken in upon in this manner, yet she answered mildly, "'Yes, pretty well. 
I spent several years of my girlhood there with my mother. My mother died in Florence. Oh! There was a pause, painful to Ursula and to Birkin. Hermione, however, seemed abstracted and calm. Birkin was white, his eyes glowed as if he were in a fever, he was far too overwrought. How Ursula suffered in this tense atmosphere of strained wills! Her head seemed bound round by iron bands. Birkin rang the bell for tea. They could not wait for Gudrun any longer. When the door was opened, the cat walked in. "'Michio, Michio,' called Hermione in her slow, deliberate sing-song. The young cat turned to look at her, then with his slow and stately walk he advanced to her side. "'Vieni, vieni qua,' Hermione was saying, in her strange, caressive, protective voice, as if she were always the elder, the mother superior. Viene dire buon giorno alla zia. Mi ricorde, mi ricorde bene. Non è vero, piccolo. È vero che mi ricordi? È vero? And slowly she rubbed his head, slowly and with ironic indifference. Does he understand Italian? said Ursula, who knew nothing of the language. Yes, said Hermione at length. His mother was Italian. She was born in my waste-paper basket in Florence, on the morning of Rupert's birthday. She was his birthday present. Tea was brought in. Birkin poured out for them. It was strange how inviolable was the intimacy which existed between him and Hermione. Ursula felt that she was an outsider. The very teacups and the old silver was a bond between Hermione and Birkin. It seemed to belong to an old past world which they inhabited together, and in which Ursula was a foreigner. She was almost a parvenu in their old cultured milieu. Her convention was not their convention, their standards were not her standards but theirs were established, they had the sanction and the grace of age. He and she together, Hermione and Birkin, were people of the same old tradition, the same withered, deadening culture, and she, Ursula, was an intruder. So they always made her feel. Hermione poured a little cream into a saucer. The simple way she assumed her rights in Birkin's room maddened and discouraged Ursula. There was a fatality about it, as if it were bound to be. Hermione lifted the cat and put the cream before him. He planted his two paws on the edge of the table, and bent his gracious young head to drink. Sicuro che capisce italiano, sang Hermione. Non l'avra dimenticato la lingua della mamma. She lifted the cat's head with her long, slow, white fingers, not letting him drink, holding him in her power. It was always the same, this joy in power she manifested, peculiarly in power over any male being. He blinked forbearingly with a male bored expression, licking his whiskers. Hermione laughed in her short, grunting fashion. Ecco, il bravo ragazzo, come è superbo questo! She made a vivid picture, so calm and strange with the cat. She had a true static impressiveness. She was a social artist in some ways. The cat refused to look at her, indifferently avoided her fingers, and began to drink again, his nose down to the cream, perfectly balanced, as he lapped with his odd little click. "'It's bad for him, teaching him to eat at table,' said Birkin. "'Yes,' said Hermione, easily assenting. Then, looking down at the cat, 
she resumed her old mocking humorous sing-song. Ti imparano fare brute cose, brute cose. She lifted the Mino's white chin on her forefinger, slowly. The young cat looked round with a supremely forbearing air, avoided seeing anything, withdrew his chin, and began to wash his face with his paw. Hermione grunted her laughter, pleased. "'Bel giovanotto,' she said. The cat reached forward again and put his fine white paw on the edge of the saucer. Hermione lifted it down with delicate slowness. This deliberate, delicate carefulness of movement reminded Ursula of Gudrun. No, non è permesso di mettere il zampino nel tondinetto. Non piace al babbo, un signor gatto così selvatico. And she kept her finger on the softly planted paw of the cat and her voice had the same whimsical, humorous note of bullying. Ursula had her nose out of joint. She wanted to go away now. It all seemed no good. Hermione was established for ever. She herself was ephemeral, and had not yet even arrived. "'I will go now,' she said suddenly. Birkin looked at her almost in fear, he so dreaded her anger. "'But there is no need for such hurry,' he said. "'Yes,' she answered, "'I will go.' And turning to Hermione, before there was time to say any more, she held out her hand and said, "'Good-bye.' "'Good-bye,' sang Hermione, detaining the hand. "'Must you really go now?' "'Yes, I think I'll go,' said Ursula her face set and averted from Hermione's eyes. "'You think you will?' But Ursula had got her hand free. She turned to Birkin with a quick, almost jeering, "'Good-bye!' And she was opening the door before he had time to do it for her. When she got outside the house, she ran down the road in fury and agitation. It was strange the unreasoning rage and violence Hermione roused in her by her very presence. Ursula knew she gave herself away to the other woman. She knew she looked ill-bred, uncouth, exaggerated. But she did not care. She only ran up the road lest she should go back and jeer in the faces of the two she had left behind. For they outraged her. End of chapter 22 Recording by Ruth Golding Chapter 23 of Women in Love This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Ruth Golding Women in Love by D. H. Lawrence Chapter 23 Excurse Next day Birkin sought Ursula out. It happened to be the half-day at the grammar school. He appeared towards the end of the morning, and asked her would she drive with him in the afternoon. She consented, but her face was closed and unresponding, and his heart sank. The afternoon was fine and dim. He was driving the motor-car, and she sat beside him, but still her face was closed against him, unresponding. When she became like this, like a wall against him, his heart contracted. His life now seemed so reduced that he hardly cared any more. At moments it seemed to him he did not care a straw whether Ursula or Hermione or anybody else existed or did not exist. Why bother? Why strive for a coherent, satisfied life? Why not drift on in a series of accidents, like a picaresque novel? Why not? Why bother about human relationships? 
Why take them seriously, male or female? Why form any serious connections at all? Why not be casual, drifting along, taking all for what it was worth? And yet, still, he was damned and doomed to the old effort at serious living. Look, he said, what I bought. The car was running along a broad white road between autumn trees. He gave her a little bit of screwed-up paper. She took it and opened it. "'How lovely!' she cried. She examined the gift. "'How perfectly lovely!' she cried again. "'But why do you give them me?' She put the question offensively. His face flickered with bored irritation. He shrugged his shoulders slightly. "'I wanted to,' he said coolly. "'But why, why should you?' "'Am I called on to find reasons?' he asked. There was a silence, whilst she examined the rings that had been screwed up in the paper. "'I think they are beautiful,' she said. "'Especially this. This is wonderful.' It was a round opal, red and fiery, set in a circle of tiny rubies. "'You like that best?' he said. "'I think I do.' "'I like the sapphire,' he said. "'This?' It was a rose-shaped, beautiful sapphire with small brilliants. "'Yes,' she said. "'It is lovely.' She held it in the light. "'Yes, perhaps it is the best.' "'The blue,' he said. "'Yes, wonderful.' He suddenly swung the car out of the way of a farm cart. It tilted on the bank. He was a careless driver, yet very quick. But Ursula was frightened. There was always that something regardless in him which terrified her. She suddenly felt he might kill her by making some dreadful accident with the motor-car. For a moment she was stony with fear. "'Isn't it rather dangerous the way you drive?' she asked him. "'No, it isn't dangerous,' he said. And then, after a pause, "'Don't you like the yellow ring at all?' It was a squarish topaz, set in a frame of steel, or some other similar mineral, finely wrought. "'Yes,' she said. "'I do like it. But why did you buy these rings?' "'I wanted them. They're second-hand.' "'You bought them for yourself?' "'No, rings look wrong on my hands.' "'Why did you buy them, then?' "'I bought them to give to you.' "'But why? Surely you ought to give them to Hermione. You belong to her.' He did not answer. She remained with the jewels shut in her hand. She wanted to try them on her fingers, but something in her would not let her. And, moreover, she was afraid her hands were too large. She shrank from the mortification of a failure to put them on any but her little finger. They travelled in silence through the empty lanes. Driving in a motor-car excited her. She forgot his presence, even. "'Where are we?' she asked suddenly. "'Not far from Worksop.' "'And where are we going?' "'Anywhere.' It was the answer she liked. She opened her hand to look at the rings. They gave her such pleasure as they lay, the three circles, with their knotted jewels, entangled in her palm. She would have to try them on. She did so secretly, unwilling to let him see, so that he should not know her finger was too large for them. But he saw, nevertheless. He always saw, if she wanted him not to. It was another of his hateful, watchful characteristics. Only the opal with its thin wire loop would go on her ring finger. And she was superstitious. No, there was ill-portent enough. She would not accept this ring from him in pledge. "'Look,' she said, putting forward her hand, 
that was half closed and shrinking. The others don't fit me. He looked at the red, glinting, soft stone on her oversensitive skin. Yes, he said. But opals are unlucky, aren't they? she said wistfully. No, I prefer unlucky things. Luck is vulgar. Who wants what luck would bring? I don't. But why? she laughed, and, consumed with a desire to see how the other rings would look on her hand, she put them on her little finger. They can be made a little bigger, he said. Yes, she replied doubtfully, and she sighed. She knew that in accepting the rings she was accepting a pledge. Yet fate seemed more than herself. She looked again at the jewels. They were very beautiful to her eyes, not as ornament or wealth, but as tiny fragments of loveliness. "'I'm glad you bought them,' she said, putting her hand half unwillingly, gently on his arm. He smiled slightly. He wanted her to come to him, but he was angry at the bottom of his soul, and indifferent. He knew she had a passion for him, really, but it was not finally interesting. There were depths of passion when one became impersonal and indifferent, unemotional. Whereas Ursula was still at the emotional, personal level, always so abominably personal. He had taken her as he had never been taken himself. He had taken her at the roots of her darkness and shame, like a demon, laughing over the fountain of mystic corruption which was one of the sources of her being, laughing, shrugging, accepting, accepting finally. As for her, when would she so much go beyond herself as to accept him at the quick of death? She now became quite happy. The motor-car ran on, the afternoon was soft and dim. She talked with lively interest, analysing people and their motives, Gudrun, Gerald. He answered vaguely. He was not very much interested any more in personalities and in people. People were all different, but they were all enclosed nowadays in a definite limitation, he said. There were only about two great ideas, two great streams of activity remaining, with various forms of reaction therefrom. The reactions were all varied in various people, but they followed a few great laws, and intrinsically there was no difference. They acted and reacted involuntarily, according to a few great laws, and once the laws, the great principles, were known, people were no longer mystically interesting. They were all essentially alike. The differences were only variations on a theme. None of them transcended the given terms. Ursula did not agree. People were still an adventure to her but perhaps not as much as she tried to persuade herself. Perhaps there was something mechanical now in her interest. Perhaps also her interest was destructive, her analysing was a real tearing to pieces. There was an underspace in her, where she did not care for people and their idiosyncrasies, even to destroy them. She seemed to touch for a moment this under-silence in herself. She became still, and she turned for a moment purely to Birkin. "'Won't it be lovely to go home in the dark?' she said. "'We might have tea rather late, shall we, and have high tea? Wouldn't that be rather nice?' "'I promise to be at Shortlands for dinner,' he said. "'But it doesn't matter. You can go tomorrow. "'Hermione is there,' he said, in rather an uneasy voice. "'She's going away in two days. "'I suppose I ought to say good-bye to her. 
I shall never see her again. Ursula drew away, closed in a violent silence. He knitted his brows, and his eyes began to sparkle again in anger. "'You don't mind, do you?' he asked irritably. "'No, I don't care. Why should I? Why should I mind?' Her tone was jeering and offensive. "'That's what I ask myself,' he said. "'Why should you mind? But you seem to.' His brows were tense with violent irritation. "'I assure you I don't. I don't mind in the least. Go where you belong. It's what I want you to do.' "'Oh, you fool!' he cried. "'With your go where you belong. It's finished between Hermione and me. She means much more to you, if it comes to that, than she does to me. For you can only revolt in pure reaction from her and to be her opposite is to be her counterpart. "'Ah! Opposite!' cried Ursula. "'I know your dodges. I'm not taken in by your word-twisting. You belong to Hermione in her dead show. Well, if you do, you do. I don't blame you. But then you've nothing to do with me.' In his inflamed, overwrought exasperation he stopped the car, and they sat there in the middle of the country lane to have it out. It was a crisis of war between them, so they did not see the ridiculousness of their situation. "'If you weren't a fool, if only you weren't a fool!' he cried in bitter despair. "'You'd see that one could be decent, even when one has been wrong. I was wrong to go on all those years with Hermione. It was a deathly process.' But after all, one can have a little human decency. But no, you would tear my soul out with your jealousy at the very mention of Hermione's name. I jealous? I jealous? You are mistaken if you think that. I'm not jealous in the least of Hermione. She has nothing to me. Not that. And Ursula snapped her fingers. No, it's you who are a liar. It's you who must return like a dog to his vomit. It is what Hermione stands for that I hate. I hate it. It is lies. It is false. It is death. But you want it. You can't help it. You can't help yourself. You belong to that old deathly way of living. Then go back to it. But don't come to me, for I've nothing to do with it." And in the stress of her violent emotion she got down from the car and went to the hedgerow, picking unconsciously some flesh-pink spindleberries, some of which were burst, showing their orange seeds. "'Ah, you are a fool!' he cried bitterly, with some contempt. "'Yes, I am! I am!' I'm a fool, and thank God for it. I'm too big a fool to swallow your cleverness. God be praised. You go to your women. Go to them. They're your sort. You've always had a string of them trailing after you, and you always will. Go to your spiritual brides, but don't come to me as well, because I'm not having any, thank you. You're not satisfied, are you? Your spiritual brides can't give you what you want. They aren't common and fleshy enough for you, aren't they? So you come to me and keep them in the background. You'll marry me for daily use, but you'll keep yourself well provided with spiritual brides in the background. I know your dirty little game. Suddenly a flame ran over her, and she stamped her foot madly on the ground, and he winced, afraid that she would strike him. "'And I! I'm not spiritual enough! I'm not as spiritual as that Hermione!' Her brows knitted, her eyes blazed like a tiger's. "'Then go to her, that's all I say! Go to her! Go! Ha! She's spiritual! Spiritual! She! A dirty materialist as she is!' She's spiritual. What does she care for? 
What is her spirituality? What is it? Her fury seemed to blaze out and burn his face. He shrank a little. I tell you it's dirt, dirt, and nothing but dirt. And it's dirt you want, you crave for it. Spiritual. Is that spiritual, her bullying, her conceit, her sordid materialism? She's a fishwife, a fishwife, she is such a materialist, and all so sordid. What does she work out to in the end, with all her social passion, as you call it? Social passion! What social passion has she? Show it me. Where is it? She wants petty, immediate power. She wants the illusion that she is a great woman. That is all. In her soul she's a devilish unbeliever, common as dirt. That's what she is at the bottom, and all the rest is pretense. But you love it. You love the sham spirituality. It's your food. And why? Because of the dirt underneath. Do you think I don't know the foulness of your sex life and hers? I do. And it's that foulness you want, you liar. Then have it, have it. You're such a liar. She turned away spasmodically tearing the twigs of spindleberry from the hedge, and fastening them with vibrating fingers in the bosom of her coat. He stood watching in silence. A wonderful tenderness burned in him at the sight of her quivering, so sensitive fingers, and at the same time he was full of rage and callousness. "'This is a degrading exhibition.' he said coolly. "'Yes, degrading indeed,' she said. "'But more to me than to you.' "'Since you choose to degrade yourself,' he said. Again the flash came over her face, the yellow lights concentrated in her eyes. "'You!' she cried. "'You, you truth-lover! You purity-monger! It's stinks your truth and your purity. It stinks of the offal you feed on, you scavenger dog, you eater of corpses. You are foul, foul, and you must know it. Your purity, your candour, your goodness. Yes, thank you, we've had some. What you are is a foul, deathly thing, obscene. That's what you are, obscene and perverse. You and love. You may well say you don't want love. No, you want yourself and dirt and death. That's what you want. You are so perverse, so death-eating. And then there's a bicycle coming, he said, writhing under her loud denunciation. She glanced down the road. I don't care, she cried. Nevertheless, she was silent. The cyclist, having heard the voices raised in altercation, glanced curiously at the man and the woman, and at the standing motor-car, as he passed. "'Afternoon,' he said cheerfully. "'Good afternoon,' replied Birkin coldly. They were silent as the man passed into the distance. A clearer look had come over Birkin's face. He knew she was in the main right. He knew he was perverse, so spiritual on the one hand and in some strange way degraded on the other. But was she herself any better? Was anybody any better? It may all be true, lies and stink and all, he said. But Hermione's spiritual intimacy is no rottener than your emotional jealous intimacy. One can preserve the decencies even to one's enemies, for one's own sake. Hermione is my enemy to her last breath. That's why I must bow her off the field. 
You, you and your enemies and your bows. A pretty picture you make of yourself. But it takes nobody in but yourself. I jealous, I. What I say, her voice sprang into flame, I say because it is true, do you see? Because you are you, a foul and false liar, a whited sepulchre. That's why I say it, and you hear it. And be grateful, he added with a satirical grimace. Yes, she cried, and if you have a spark of decency in you, be grateful. Not having a spark of decency, however, he retorted. No, she cried, you haven't a spark. And so you can go your way and I'll go mine. It's no good, not the slightest. So you can leave me now. I don't want to go any further with you. Leave me. You don't even know where you are, he said. Oh, don't bother. I assure you I shall be all right. I've got ten shillings in my purse and that will take me back from anywhere you have brought me to. She hesitated. The rings were still on her fingers, two on her little finger, one on her ring finger. Still she hesitated. Very good, he said. The only hopeless thing is a fool. You are quite right, she said. Still she hesitated. Then an ugly, malevolent look came over her face. She pulled the rings from her fingers and tossed them at him. One touched his face, the others hit his coat, and they scattered into the mud. "'And take your rings,' she said, "'and go and buy yourself a female elsewhere. There are plenty to be had who will be quite glad to share your spiritual mess, or to have your physical mess.' and leave your spiritual mess to Hermione." With which she walked away, desultorily, up the road. He stood motionless, watching her sullen, rather ugly walk. She was sullenly picking and pulling at the twigs of the hedge as she passed. She grew smaller, she seemed to pass out of his sight. A darkness came over his mind. Only a small mechanical speck of consciousness hovered near him. He felt tired and weak. Yet also he was relieved. He gave up his old position. He went and sat on the bank. No doubt Ursula was right. It was true, really, what she said. He knew that his spirituality was concomitant of a process of depravity, a sort of pleasure in self-destruction. There really was a certain stimulant in self-destruction for him, especially when it was translated spiritually. But then he knew it, he knew it, and had done. And was not Ursula's way of emotional intimacy, emotional and physical, was it not just as dangerous as Hermione's abstract, spiritual intimacy? Fusion, fusion, this horrible fusion of two beings, which every woman and most men insisted on, was it not nauseous and horrible anyhow? whether it was a fusion of the spirit or of the emotional body. Hermione saw herself as the perfect idea to which all men must come. And Ursula was the perfect womb, the bath of birth to which all men must come. And both were horrible. Why could they not remain individuals, limited by their own limits? Why this dreadful all-comprehensiveness, this hateful tyranny? Why not leave the other being free? Why try to absorb, or melt, or merge? One might abandon oneself utterly to the moments, but not to any other being. 
he could not bear to see the rings lying in the pale mud of the road. He picked them up and wiped them unconsciously on his hands. They were the little tokens of the reality of beauty, the reality of happiness in warm creation. But he had made his hands all dirty and gritty. There was a darkness over his mind, the terrible knot of consciousness that had persisted there like an obsession was broken, gone. His life was dissolved in darkness over his limbs and his body. But there was a point of anxiety in his heart now. He wanted her to come back. He breathed lightly and regularly like an infant that breathes innocently, beyond the touch of responsibility. She was coming back. He saw her drifting desultorily under the high hedge, advancing towards him slowly. He did not move, he did not look again. He was as if asleep, at peace, slumbering and utterly relaxed. She came up and stood before him, hanging her head. "'See what a flower I found you,' she said wistfully holding a piece of purple-red bell-heather under his face. He saw the clump of coloured bells and the tree-like tiny branch, also her hands with their over-fine, over-sensitive skin. "'Pretty,' he said, looking up at her with a smile, taking the flower. Everything had become simple again, quite simple the complexity gone into nowhere. But he badly wanted to cry, except that he was weary and bored by emotion. Then a hot passion of tenderness for her filled his heart. He stood up and looked into her face. It was new and, oh, so delicate in its luminous wonder and fear. He put his arms round her, and she hid her face on his shoulder. It was peace, just simple peace, as he stood folding her quietly there on the open lane. It was peace at last. The old detestable world of tension had passed away at last. His soul was strong and at ease. She looked up at him. The wonderful yellow light in her eyes now was soft and yielded. They were at peace with each other. He kissed her softly, many, many times. A laugh came into her eyes. "'Did I abuse you?' she asked. He smiled too, and took her hand that was so soft and given. "'Never mind,' she said. "'It is all for the good.' He kissed her again, softly, many times. "'Isn't it?' she said. "'Certainly,' he replied. "'Wait, I shall have my own back.' She laughed suddenly, with a wild catch in her voice, and flung her arms around him. "'You're mine, my love, aren't you?' she cried, straining him close. Yes, he said softly. His voice was so soft and final, she went very still, as if under a fate which had taken her. Yes, she acquiesced, but it was accomplished without her acquiescence. He was kissing her quietly, repeatedly, with a soft, still happiness that almost made her heart stop beating. "'My love!' she cried, lifting her face and looking with frightened, gentle wonder of bliss. Was it all real? But his eyes were beautiful and soft, and immune from stress or excitement, 
beautiful and smiling lightly to her, smiling with her. She hid her face on his shoulder, hiding before him, because he could see her so completely. She knew he loved her. And she was afraid, she was in a strange element, a new heaven round about her. She wished he were passionate, because in passion she was at home, but this was so still and frail, as space is more frightening than force. Again, quickly, she lifted her head. "'Do you love me?' she said, quickly, impulsively. "'Yes,' he replied, not heeding her motion, only her stillness. She knew it was true. She broke away. "'So you ought,' she said, turning round to look at the road. "'Did you find the rings?' "'Yes.' "'Where are they?' "'In my pocket.' She put her hand into his pocket and took them out. She was restless. "'Shall we go?' she said. "'Yes,' he answered. And they mounted to the car once more, and left behind them this memorable battlefield. They drifted through the wild late afternoon in a beautiful motion that was smiling and transcendent. His mind was sweetly at ease, the life flowed through him as from some new fountain. He was as if born out of the cramp of a womb. "'Are you happy?' she asked him, in her strange, delighted way. "'Yes,' he said. "'So am I,' she cried in sudden ecstasy, putting her arm round him and clutching him violently against her as he steered the motor-car. "'Don't drive much more,' she said. I don't want you to be always doing something. No, he said. We'll finish this little trip, and then we'll be free. We will, my love, we will, she cried in delight, kissing him as he turned to her. He drove on in a strange new wakefulness, the tension of his consciousness broken. He seemed to be conscious all over, all his body awake with a simple glimmering awareness, as if he had just come awake, like a thing that is born, like a bird when it comes out of an egg, into a new universe. They dropped down a long hill in the dusk, and suddenly Ursula recognised on her right hand, below in the hollow, the form of Southall Minster. "'Are we here?' she cried with pleasure. The rigid, sombre, ugly cathedral was settling under the gloom of the coming night as they entered the narrow town. The golden lights showed like slabs of revelation in the shop windows. "'Father came here with mother,' she said, "'when they first knew each other. He loves it. He loves the Minster. Do you?' "'Yes. It looks like quartz crystals sticking up out of the dark hollow. We'll have our high tea at the Saracen's Head.' As they descended, they heard the minster bells playing a hymn when the hour had struck six. Glory to thee, my God, this night, for all the blessings of the light. So to Ursula's ear the tune fell out, drop by drop, from the unseen sky onto the dusky town. It was like dim, bygone centuries sounding. It was all so far off. She stood in the old yard of the inn, smelling of straw and stables and petrol. Above she could see the first stars. What was it all? This was no actual world. It was the dream world of one's childhood, a great circumscribed reminiscence. The world had become unreal. She herself was a strange, transcendent reality. They sat together in a little parlour by the fire. "'Is it true?' she said, wondering. "'What?' "'Everything. Is everything true?' 
the best is true, he said, grimacing at her. Is it? she replied, laughing, but unassured. She looked at him. He seemed still so separate. New eyes were opened in her soul. She saw a strange creature from another world in him. It was as if she were enchanted, and everything were metamorphosed. She recalled again the old magic of the book of Genesis, where the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. And he was one of these, one of these strange creatures from the beyond, looking down at her and seeing she was fair. He stood on the hearth-rug looking at her, at her face that was upturned exactly like a flower, a fresh, luminous flower, glinting, faintly golden with the dew of the first light. And he was smiling faintly, as if there were no speech in the world, save the silent delight of flowers in each other. Smilingly they delighted in each other's presence, pure presence, not to be thought of, even known. But his eyes had a faintly ironical contraction. And she was drawn to him strangely, as in a spell. Kneeling on the hearth-rug before him, she put her arms round his loins, and put her face against his thigh. Riches! Riches! She was overwhelmed with a sense of a heavenful of riches. "'We love each other!' she said, in delight. "'More than that,' he answered, looking down at her with his glimmering, easy face. Unconsciously, with her sensitive fingertips, she was tracing the back of his thighs, following some mysterious life-flow there. She had discovered something, something more than wonderful, more wonderful than life itself. It was the strange mystery of his life-motion, there, at the back of the thighs, down the flanks. It was a strange reality of his being, the very stuff of being, there in the straight downflow of the thighs. It was here she discovered him one of the sons of God, such as were in the beginning of the world, not a man, something other, something more. This was release at last. She had had lovers, she had known passion, but this was neither love nor passion. It was the daughters of men coming back to the sons of God, the strange, inhuman sons of God, who are in the beginning. Her face was now one dazzle of released golden light, as she looked up at him and laid her hands full on his thighs, behind, as he stood before her. He looked down at her with a rich, bright brow, like a diadem above his eyes. She was beautiful as a new marvellous flower opened at his knees. A paradisal flower she was, beyond womanhood, such a flower of luminousness. Yet something was tight and unfree in him. He did not like this crouching, this radiance, not altogether. It was all achieved for her. She had found one of the sons of God from the beginning and he had found one of the first, most luminous daughters of men. She traced with her hands the line of his loins and thighs at the back, and a living fire ran through her from him darkly. It was a dark flood of electric passion she released from him, drew into herself. She had established a rich new circuit, a new current of passional electric energy between the two of them, 
released from the darkest poles of the body, and established in perfect circuit. It was a dark fire of electricity that rushed from him to her, and flooded them both with rich peace, satisfaction. "'My love!' she cried, lifting her face to him, her eyes, her mouth open in transport. "'My love!' he answered, bending and kissing her, always kissing her. She closed her hands over the full, rounded body of his loins as he stooped over her. She seemed to touch the quick of the mystery of darkness that was bodily him. She seemed to faint beneath, and he seemed to faint stooping over her. It was a perfect passing away for both of them, and at the same time the most intolerable accession into being, the marvellous fullness of immediate gratification, overwhelming, out-flooding from the source of the deepest life-force, the darkest, deepest, strangest life-source of the human body, at the back and base of the loins. After a lapse of stillness, after the rivers of strange dark fluid richness had passed over her, flooding, carrying away her mind, and flooding down her spine and down her knees, past her feet, a strange flood, sweeping away everything and leaving her an essential new being, she was left quite free. She was free in complete ease, her complete self. So she rose, stilly and blithe, smiling at him. He stood before her, glimmering, so awfully real, that her heart almost stopped beating. He stood there, in his strange, whole body, that had its marvellous fountains, like the bodies of the sons of God who were in the beginning. There were strange fountains of his body, more mysterious and potent than any she had imagined or known, more satisfying, ah, finally, mystically, physically satisfying. She had thought there was no source deeper than the phallic source, and now, behold, from the smitten rock of the man's body, from the strange, marvellous flanks and thighs, deeper, further in mystery than the phallic source, came the floods of ineffable darkness and ineffable riches. They were glad, and they could forget perfectly. They laughed, and went to the meal provided. There was a venison pasty, of all things, a large, broad-faced cut ham, eggs and cresses and red beetroot, and medlars and apple tart, and tea. "'What good things!' she cried with pleasure. "'How noble it looks! Shall I pour out the tea?' She was usually nervous and uncertain at performing these public duties, such as giving tea, but to-day she forgot. She was at her ease, entirely forgetting to have misgivings. The teapot poured beautifully from a proud, slender spout. Her eyes were warm with smiles as she gave him his tea. She had learned at last to be still and perfect. "'Everything is ours,' she said to him. "'Everything.' he answered. She gave a queer little crowing sound of triumph. "'I'm so glad!' she cried, with unspeakable relief. "'So am I,' he said. "'But I'm thinking we'd better get out of our responsibilities as quick as we can.' "'What responsibilities?' she asked, wondering. 
we must drop our jobs like a shot. A new understanding dawned into her face. Of course, she said, there's that. We must get out, he said. There's nothing for it but to get out quick. She looked at him doubtfully across the table. But where? she said. I don't know, he said. We'll just wander about for a bit. Again she looked at him quizzically. I should be perfectly happy at the mill, she said. It's very near the old thing, he said. Let us wander a bit. His voice could be so soft and happy-go-lucky, it went through her veins like an exhilaration. Nevertheless she dreamed of a valley, and wild gardens and peace. She had a desire too for splendour, an aristocratic extravagant splendour. Wandering seemed to her like restlessness, dissatisfaction. "'Where will you wander to?' she asked. "'I don't know. I feel as if I would just meet you and we'd set off, just towards the distance.' "'But where can one go?' she asked anxiously. "'After all, there is only the world, and none of it is very distant.' "'Still,' he said, "'I should like to go with you nowhere. "'It would be rather wandering just to nowhere. "'That's the place to get to, nowhere. "'One wants to wander away from the world's somewheres "'into our own nowhere.' Still she meditated. "'You see, my love,' she said, "'I'm so afraid that while we are only people, "'we've got to take the world that's given, "'because there isn't any other.' "'Yes, there is,' he said. "'There's somewhere where we can be free, "'somewhere where one needn't wear much clothes, none even.' where one meets a few people who have gone through enough and can take things for granted, where you be yourself without bothering. There is somewhere. There are one or two people. But where? she sighed. Somewhere. Anywhere. Let's wander off. That's the thing to do. Let's wander off. Yes, she said thrilled at the thought of travel, but to her it was only travel. To be free, he said, to be free in a free place, with a few other people. Yes, she said wistfully, those few other people depressed her. It isn't really a locality, though, he said. It's a perfected relation between you and me and others, the perfect relation, so that we are free together. It is, my love, isn't it? she said. It's you and me. It's you and me, isn't it? She stretched out her arms to him. He went across and stooped to kiss her face. Her arms closed round him again. Her hands spread upon his shoulders, moving slowly there, moving slowly on his back, down his back, slowly, with a strange recurrent rhythmic motion, yet moving slowly down, pressing mysteriously over his loins, over his flanks. The sense of the awfulness of riches that could never be impaired flooded her mind, like a swoon a death in most marvellous possession, mystic sure. She possessed him so utterly and intolerably that she herself lapsed out. And yet she was only sitting still in the chair, with her hands pressed upon him, and lost. Again he softly kissed her. "'We shall never go apart again,' he murmured quietly and she did not speak, but only pressed her hands firmer down upon the source of darkness in him. 
they decided, when they woke again from the pure swoon, to write their resignations from the world of work there and then. She wanted this. He rang the bell and ordered note-paper without a printed address. The waiter cleared the table. "'Now then,' he said, "'yours first. Put your home address and the date, then Director of Education, Town Hall, Sir. Now then, I don't know how one really stands. I suppose one could get out of it in less than a month. Anyhow, Sir, I beg to resign my post as class mistress in the Willie Green Grammar School. I should be very grateful if you would liberate me as soon as possible, without waiting for the expiration of the month's notice. That'll do. Have you got it? Let me look. Ursula Brangwen. Good. Now I'll write mine. I ought to give them three months, but I can plead health. I can arrange it all right. He sat and wrote out his formal resignation. Now, he said, when the envelopes were sealed and addressed, shall we post them here, both together? I know Jackie will say, here's a coincidence, when he receives them in all their identity. Shall we let him say it or not? I don't care, she said. No, he said, pondering. It doesn't matter, does it? she said. Yes, he replied. Their imaginations shall not work on us. I'll post yours here, mine after. I cannot be implicated in their imaginings. He looked at her with his strange, non-human singleness. "'Yes, you are right,' she said. She lifted her face to him, all shining and open. It was as if he might enter straight into the source of her radiance. His face became a little distracted. "'Shall we go?' he said. "'As you like,' she replied. They were soon out of the little town and running through the uneven lanes of the country. Ursula nestled near him into his constant warmth, and watched the pale-lit revelation racing ahead the visible night. Sometimes it was a wide old road, with grass spaces on either side, flying magic and elfin in the greenish illumination. Sometimes it was trees looming overhead. Sometimes it was bramble-bushes, sometimes the walls of a crew-yard and the butt of a barn. "'Are you going to Shortlands to dinner?' Ursula asked him suddenly. He started. "'Good God!' he said. "'Shortlands never again! Not that! Besides, we should be too late.' "'Where are we going, then? To the mill?' "'If you like.' Pity to go anywhere on this good dark night. Pity to come out of it, really. Pity we can't stop in this good darkness. It is better than anything ever would be, this good, immediate darkness. She sat, wondering. The car lurched and swayed. She knew there was no leaving him. The darkness held them both and contained them. It was not to be surpassed. Besides, she had a full, mystic knowledge of his suave loins of darkness, dark-clad and suave, and in this knowledge there was some of the inevitability and the beauty of fate, fate which one asks for, which one accepts in full. He sat still, like an Egyptian pharaoh driving the car. He felt as if he were seated in immemorial potency, like the great carven statues of real Egypt, as real and as fulfilled with subtle strength as these are, with a vague inscrutable smile on the lips. He knew what it was to have the strange and magical current of force in his back and loins, and down his legs. Force so perfect that it stayed him immobile, and left his face subtly, mindlessly smiling. He knew what it was to be awake and potent, 
in that other basic mind, the deepest physical mind, and from this source he had a pure and magic control, magical, mystical, a force in darkness like electricity. It was very difficult to speak. It was so perfect to sit in this pure living silence, subtle, full of unthinkable knowledge and unthinkable force, upheld immemorially in timeless force, like the immobile, supremely potent Egyptians, seated for ever in their living, subtle silence. "'We need not go home,' he said. This car has seats that let down and make a bed, and we can lift the hood. She was glad and frightened. She cowered near to him. But what about them at home? she said. Send a telegram. Nothing more was said. They ran on in silence. But with a sort of second consciousness, he steered the car towards a destination, for he had the free intelligence to direct his own ends. His arms and his breast and his head were rounded and living like those of the Greek. He had not the unawakened straight arms of the Egyptian, nor the sealed slumbering head. A lambent intelligence played secondarily above his pure Egyptian concentration in darkness. They came to a village that lined along the road. The car crept slowly along, until he saw the post-office. Then he pulled up. "'I will send a telegram to your father,' he said. "'I will merely say, spending the night in town, shall I?' "'Yes,' she answered. She did not want to be disturbed into taking thought. She watched him move into the post-office. It was also a shop, she saw. Strange he was. Even as he went into the lighted public place he remained dark and magic. The living silence seemed the body of reality in him, subtle, potent, indiscoverable. There he was. In a strange uplift of elation she saw him, the being never to be revealed, awful in its potency, mystic and real. This dark, subtle reality of him, never to be translated, liberated her into perfection, her own perfected being. She too was dark and fulfilled in silence. He came out, throwing some packages into the car. "'There is some bread and cheese and raisins and apples and hard chocolate,' he said, in his voice that was as if laughing, because of the unblemished stillness and force which was the reality in him. She would have to touch him. To speak, to see, was nothing. It was a travesty to look and to comprehend the man there. Darkness and silence must fall perfectly on her. Then she could know mystically, in unrevealed touch. She must lightly, mindlessly connect with him, have the knowledge which is death of knowledge, the reality of surety in not knowing. Soon they had run on again into the darkness, she did not ask where they were going, she did not care. She sat in a fullness and a pure potency that was like apathy, mindless and immobile. She was next to him, and hung in a pure rest, as a star is hung, balanced unthinkably. Still there remained a dark lambency of anticipation. She would touch him. With perfect fine fingertips of reality, she would touch the reality in him, the suave, 
pure, untranslatable reality of his loins of darkness. To touch, mindlessly in darkness to come in pure touching upon the living reality of him, his suave, perfect loins and thighs of darkness. This was her sustaining anticipation. And he too waited, in the magical steadfastness of suspense, for her to take this knowledge of him as he had taken it of her. He knew her darkly, with the fullness of dark knowledge. Now she would know him, and he too would be liberated. He would be night-free, like an Egyptian, steadfast in perfectly suspended equilibrium, pure, mystic nodality of physical being. They would give each other this star equilibrium which alone is freedom. She saw that they were running among trees, great old trees with dying bracken undergrowth. The palish gnarled trunks showed ghostly, and like old priests in the hovering distance, the fern rose magical and mysterious. It was a night all darkness, with low cloud. The motor-car advanced slowly. "'Where are we?' she whispered. "'In Sherwood Forest.' It was evident he knew the place. He drove softly, watching. Then they came to a green road between the trees. They turned cautiously round, and were advancing between the oaks of the forest down a green lane. The green lane widened into a little circle of grass, where there was a small trickle of water at the bottom of a sloping bank. The car stopped. "'We will stay here,' he said, and put out the lights. He extinguished the lamps at once, and it was pure night, with shadows of trees like realities of other nightly beings. He threw a rug onto the bracken, and they sat in stillness and mindless silence. There were faint sounds from the wood, but no disturbance, no possible disturbance. The world was under a strange ban. A new mystery had supervened. They threw off their clothes, and he gathered her to him, and found her, found the pure, lambent reality of her forever invisible flesh. Quenched, inhuman, his fingers upon her unrevealed nudity were the fingers of silence upon silence the body of mysterious night upon the body of mysterious night, the night masculine and feminine, never to be seen with the eye or known with the mind, only known as a palpable revelation of living otherness. She had her desire of him. She touched she received the maximum of unspeakable communication in touch, dark, subtle, positively silent. A magnificent gift and give again, a perfect acceptance and yielding, a mystery. The reality of that which can never be known, vital, sensual reality, that can never be transmuted into mind-content, but remains outside, living body of darkness and silence and subtlety, the mystic body of reality. She had her desire fulfilled. He had his desire fulfilled. For she was to him what he was to her, the immemorial magnificence of mystic, palpable, real otherness. They slept the chilly night through under the hood of the car, 
a night of unbroken sleep. It was already high day when he awoke. They looked at each other and laughed, then looked away, filled with darkness and secrecy. Then they kissed, and remembered the magnificence of the night. It was so magnificent, such an inheritance of a universe of dark reality, that they were afraid to seem to remember. They hid away the remembrance and the knowledge. End of chapter 23 Recording by Ruth Golding Chapter 24 of Women in Love This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding Women in Love by D. H. Lawrence Chapter 24 Death and Love Thomas Cry died slowly terribly slowly. It seemed impossible to everybody that the thread of life could be drawn out so thin and yet not break. The sick man lay unutterably weak and spent, kept alive by morphia and by drinks, which he sipped slowly. He was only half conscious a thin strand of consciousness linking the darkness of death with the light of day. Yet his will was unbroken. He was integral, complete. Only he must have perfect stillness about him. Any presence but that of the nurses was a strain and an effort to him now. Every morning Gerald went into the room, hoping to find his father passed away at last. Yet always he saw the same transparent face, the same dread dark hair on the waxen forehead, and the awful inchoate dark eyes, which seemed to be decomposing into formless darkness, having only a tiny grain of vision within them. And always as the dark, inchoate eyes turned to him, there passed through Gerald's bowels a burning stroke of revolt that seemed to resound through his whole being, threatening to break his mind with its clangour, and making him mad. Every morning the sun stood there, erect and taut with life, gleaming in his blondness. The gleaming blondness of his strange, imminent being put the father into a fever of fretful irritation. He could not bear to meet the uncanny, downward look of Gerald's blue eyes. But it was only for a moment. Each on the brink of departure, the father and son looked at each other, then parted. For a long time Gerald preserved a perfect sang-froid, he remained quite collected, but at last fear undermined him. He was afraid of some horrible collapse in himself. He had to stay and see this thing through. Some perverse will made him watch his father drawn over the borders of life. And yet now, every day, the great red-hot stroke of horrified fear through the bowels of the sun struck a further inflammation. Gerald went about all day with a tendency to cringe, as if there were the point of a sword of Damocles pricking the nape of his neck. There was no escape. He was bound up with his father, he had to see him through. And the father's will never relaxed or yielded to death. It would have to snap when death at last snapped it, if it did not persist after a physical death. In the same way the will of the sun never yielded, he stood firm and immune, he was outside this death and this dying. It was a trial by ordeal, 
could he stand and see his father slowly dissolve and disappear in death, without once yielding his will, without once relenting before the omnipotence of death? Like a red Indian undergoing torture, Gerald would experience the whole process of slow death, without wincing or flinching. He even triumphed in it. He somehow wanted this death, even forced it. It was as if he himself were dealing the death, even when he most recoiled in horror. Still, he would deal it, he would triumph through death. But in the stress of this ordeal, Gerald, too, lost his hold on the outer daily life. That which was much to him came to mean nothing. Work, pleasure, it was all left behind. He went on more or less mechanically with his business, but this activity was all extraneous. The real activity was this ghastly wrestling for death in his own soul, and his own will should triumph. Come what might, he would not bow down, or submit, or acknowledge a master. He had no master in death. But as the fight went on, and all that he had been and was continued to be destroyed, so that life was a hollow shell all round him, roaring and clattering like the sound of the sea, a noise in which he participated externally, and inside this hollow shell was all the darkness and fearful space of death, he knew he would have to find reinforcements, otherwise he would collapse inwards upon the great dark void which circled at the centre of his soul. His will held his outer life, his outer mind, his outer being, unbroken and unchanged. But the pressure was too great. He would have to find something to make good the equilibrium. Something must come with him into the hollow void of death in his soul, fill it up, and so equalise the pressure within to the pressure without. For day by day he felt more and more like a bubble filled with darkness, round which whirled the iridescence of his consciousness, and upon which the pressure of the outer world, the outer life, roared vastly. In this extremity his instinct led him to Gudrun. He threw away everything now. He only wanted the relation established with her. He would follow her to the studio, to be near her, to talk to her. He would stand about the room, aimlessly picking up the implements, the lumps of clay, the little figures she had cast. They were whimsical and grotesque, looking at them without perceiving them and she felt him following her, dogging her heels like a doom. She held away from him, and yet she knew he drew always a little nearer, a little nearer. "'I say,' he said to her one evening, in an odd, unthinking, uncertain way, "'won't you stay to dinner tonight? I wish you would.' She started slightly. He spoke to her like a man making a request of another man. "'They'll be expecting me at home,' she said. "'Oh, they won't mind, will they?' he said. "'I should be awfully glad if you'd stay.' Her long silence gave consent at last. "'I'll tell Thomas, shall I?' he said. "'I must go almost immediately after dinner,' she said. It was a dark, cold evening. There was no fire in the drawing-room. They sat in the library. He was mostly silent, absent, and Winifred talked a little. But when Gerald did rouse himself, he smiled, and was pleasant and ordinary with her. Then there came over him again the long blanks, of which he was not aware. She was very much attracted by him. He looked so preoccupied, and his strange, blank silences, which she could not read, moved her, 
and made her wonder over him, made her feel reverential towards him. But he was very kind. He gave her the best things at the table. He had a bottle of slightly sweet, delicious golden wine brought out for dinner, knowing she would prefer it to the burgundy. She felt herself esteemed, needed almost. As they took coffee in the library, there was a soft, very soft knocking at the door. He started and called, Come in! The timbre of his voice, like something vibrating at high pitch, unnerved Gudrun. A nurse in white entered, half hovering in the doorway like a shadow. She was very good-looking, but, strangely enough, shy and self-mistrusting. "'The doctor would like to speak to you, Mr. Cry,' she said, in her low, discreet voice. "'The doctor?' he said, starting up. "'Where is he?' "'He is in the dining-room.' "'Tell him I'm coming.' He drank up his coffee and followed the nurse, who had dissolved like a shadow. "'Which nurse was that?' asked Gudrun. "'Miss Inglis. I like her best,' replied Winifred. After a while Gerald came back, looking absorbed by his own thoughts, and having some of that tension and abstraction which is seen in a slightly drunken man. He did not say what the doctor had wanted him for, but stood before the fire, with his hands behind his back and his face open, and as if rapt. Not that he was really thinking. He was only arrested in pure suspense inside himself, and thoughts wafted through his mind without order. "'I must go now and see Mamma," said Winifred, "'and see Dada before he goes to sleep.' She bade them both good-night. Gudrun also rose to take her leave. "'You needn't go yet, need you?' said Gerald, glancing quickly at the clock. "'It is early yet. I'll walk down with you when you go. Sit down. Don't hurry away.' Gudrun sat down, as if, absent as he was, his will had power over her. She felt almost mesmerised. He was strange to her, something unknown. What was he thinking? What was he feeling as he stood there so rapt, saying nothing? He kept her, she could feel that. He would not let her go. She watched him in humble submissiveness. "'Had the doctor anything new to tell you?' she asked softly, at length, with that gentle, timid sympathy which touched a keen fibre in his heart. He lifted his eyebrows with a negligent, indifferent expression. "'No, nothing new,' he replied, as if the question were quite casual, trivial. He says the pulse is very weak indeed, very intermittent, but that doesn't necessarily mean much, you know. He looked down at her. Her eyes were dark and soft and unfolded, with a stricken look that roused him. No, she murmured at length, I don't understand anything about these things. Just as well not, he said. I say, won't you have a cigarette? Do. He quickly fetched the box and held her a light. Then he stood before her on the hearth again. No, he said, we've never had much illness in the house either, not till father. He seemed to meditate a while. Then, looking down at her, with strangely communicative blue eyes that filled her with dread, he continued, it's something you don't reckon with, you know, till it is there. And then you realise that it was there all the time. It was always there. You understand what I mean? The possibility of this incurable illness, this slow death. He moved his feet uneasily on the marble hearth, and put his cigarette to his mouth, looking up at the ceiling. I know murmured Gudrun. 
It is dreadful. He smoked without knowing. Then he took the cigarette from his lips, bared his teeth, and, putting the tip of his tongue between his teeth, spat off a grain of tobacco, turning slightly aside, like a man who is alone, or who is lost in thought. "'I don't know what the effect actually is on one,' he said, and again he looked down at her. Her eyes were dark and stricken with knowledge, looking into his. He saw her submerged, and he turned aside his face. "'But I absolutely am not the same. There's nothing left, if you understand what I mean. You seem to be clutching at the void, and at the same time you avoid yourself. And so you don't know what to do.' "'No,' she murmured. A heavy thrill ran down her nerves, heavy, almost pleasure, almost pain. "'What can be done?' she added. He turned and flipped the ash from his cigarette onto the great marble hearthstones that lay bare in the room, without fender or bar. "'I don't know, I'm sure,' he replied. "'But I do think you've got to find some way of resolving the situation. Not because you want to, but because you've got to, otherwise you're done. The whole of everything, and yourself included, is just on the point of caving in, and you're just holding it up with your hands. Well, it's a situation that obviously can't continue. You can't stand holding the roof up with your hands for ever. You know that sooner or later you'll have to let go. Do you understand what I mean? And so something's got to be done, or there's a universal collapse, as far as you yourself are concerned. He shifted slightly on the hearth, crunching a cinder under his heel. He looked down at it. Gudrun was aware of the beautiful old marble panels of the fireplace, swelling softly carved, round him and above him. She felt as if she were caught at last by fate, imprisoned in some horrible and fatal trap. "'But what can be done?' she murmured humbly. "'You must use me if I can be of any help at all. But how can I? I don't see how I can help you.' He looked down at her critically. "'I don't want you to help,' he said, slightly irritated, "'because there's nothing to be done. "'I only want sympathy, do you see? "'I want somebody I can talk to sympathetically. "'That eases the strain. "'And there is nobody to talk to sympathetically. "'That's the curious thing. "'There is nobody. "'There's Rupert Birkin, but then he isn't sympathetic. "'He wants to dictate, and that is no use whatsoever.' She was caught in a strange snare. She looked down at her hands. Then there was the sound of the door softly opening. Gerald started. He was chagrined. It was his starting that really startled Gudrun. Then he went forward with quick, graceful, intentional courtesy. "'Oh, mother,' he said, "'how nice of you to come down. How are you?' The elderly woman, loosely and bulkily wrapped in a purple gown, came forward silently, slightly hulked as usual. Her son was at her side. He pushed her up a chair, saying, "'You know Miss Brangwen, don't you?' The mother glanced at Gudrun indifferently. "'Yes,' she said. Then she turned her wonderful forget-me-not blue eyes up to her son, as she slowly sat down in the chair he had brought her. "'I came to ask you about your father,' she said, in her rapid, scarcely audible voice. "'I didn't know you had company.' "'No? Didn't Winifred tell you? Miss Brangwen stayed to dinner to make us a little more lively.' Mrs. Cry turned slowly round to Gudrun, and looked at her, but with unseeing eyes. 
I am afraid it would be no treat to her. Then she turned again to her son. Winifred tells me the doctor had something to say about your father. What is it? Only that the pulse is very weak, misses altogether a good many times, so that he might not last the night out, Gerald replied. Mrs. Cry sat perfectly impassive, as if she had not heard. Her bulk seemed hunched in the chair, her fair hair hung slack over her ears, but her skin was clear and fine, her hands, as she sat with them, forgotten and folded, were quite beautiful, full of potential energy. A great mass of energy seemed decaying up in that silent, hulking form. She looked up at her son, as he stood keen and soldierly near to her. Her eyes were most wonderfully blue, bluer than forget-me-nots. She seemed to have a certain confidence in Gerald, and to feel a certain motherly mistrust of him. "'How are you?' she muttered in her strangely quiet voice as if nobody should hear but him. "'You're not getting into a state, are you? You're not letting it make you hysterical?' A curious challenge in the last words startled Gudrun. "'I don't think so, mother,' he answered, rather coldly cheery. "'Somebody's got to see it through, you know.' "'Have they? Have they?' answered his mother rapidly. "'Why should you take it on yourself?' "'What have you got to do seeing it through? "'It will see itself through. "'You're not needed.' "'No, I don't suppose I can do any good,' he answered. "'It's just how it affects us, you see.' "'You like to be affected, don't you? "'It's quite nuts for you. "'You would have to be important. "'You have no need to stop at home. "'Why don't you go away?' "'These sentences, evidently the ripened grain of many dark hours, took Gerald by surprise. "'I don't think it's any good going away now, mother, at the last minute,' he said coldly. "'You take care,' replied his mother. "'You mind yourself. That's your business. You take too much on yourself. You mind yourself, or you'll find yourself in Queer Street. That's what will happen to you. You're hysterical, always were.' "'I'm all right, mother.' he said. There's no need to worry about me, I assure you. Let the dead bury their dead. Don't go and bury yourself along with them. That's what I tell you. I know you well enough. He did not answer this, not knowing what to say. The mother sat bunched up in silence, her beautiful white hands that had no rings whatsoever, clasping the pommels of her armchair. "'You can't do it,' she said, almost bitterly. "'You haven't the nerve. "'You're as weak as a cat, really, always were. "'Is this young woman staying here?' "'No,' said Gerald. "'She is going home to-night.' "'Then she'd better have the dog-cart. "'Does she go far?' "'Only to Beldover.' "'Ah!' "'The elderly woman never looked at Gudrun.' yet she seemed to take knowledge of her presence. "'You are inclined to take too much on yourself, Gerald,' said the mother, pulling herself to her feet with a little difficulty. "'Will you go, mother?' he asked politely. "'Yes, I'll go up again,' she replied. Turning to Gudrun, she bade her good-night.' Then she went slowly to the door, as if she were unaccustomed to walking. At the door she lifted her face to him implicitly. He kissed her. "'Don't come any further with me,' she said in her barely audible voice. "'I don't want you any further.' He bade her good-night, watched her across to the stairs and mount slowly. Then he closed the door and came back to Gudrun. Gudrun rose also to go. "'A queer being, my mother,' he said. "'Yes,' replied Gudrun. "'She 
have their own thoughts. Yes, said Gudrun. Then they were silent. You want to go? he asked. Half a minute. I'll just have a horse put in. No, said Gudrun. I want to walk. He had promised to walk with her down the long, lonely mile of drive, and she wanted this. You might just as well drive, he said. I'd much rather walk, she asserted with emphasis. You would. Then I will come along with you. You know where your things are. I'll put boots on. He put on a cap and an overcoat over his evening dress. They went out into the night. "'Let us light a cigarette,' he said, stopping in a sheltered angle of the porch. "'You have one, too.' So, with the scent of tobacco on the night air, they set off down the dark drive that ran between close-cut hedges through sloping meadows. He wanted to put his arm around her. If he could put his arm round her and draw her against him as they walked, he would equilibriate himself. For now he felt like a pair of scales, the half of which tips down and down into an indefinite void. He must recover some sort of balance. And here was the hope and the perfect recovery. Blind to her, thinking only of himself, he slipped his arm softly round her waist and drew her to him. Her heart fainted, feeling herself taken. But then his arm was so strong, she quailed under its powerful close grasp. She died a little death and was drawn against him as they walked down the stormy darkness. He seemed to balance her perfectly in opposition to himself in their dual motion of walking. So suddenly he was liberated and perfect, strong, heroic. He put his hand to his mouth and threw his cigarette away, a gleaming point, into the unseen hedge. Then he was quite free to balance her. "'That's better,' he said with exultancy. The exultation in his voice was like a sweetish, poisonous drug to her. Did she then mean so much to him? She sipped the poison. "'Are you happier?' she asked wistfully. "'Much better,' he said, in the same exultant voice. "'And I was rather far gone.' She nestled against him. He felt her all soft and warm. She was the rich, lovely substance of his being. The warmth and motion of her walk suffused through him wonderfully. "'I'm so glad if I help you,' she said. "'Yes,' he answered. "'There's nobody else could do it if you wouldn't.' "'That is true,' she said to herself with a thrill of strange, fatal elation. As they walked, he seemed to lift her nearer and nearer to himself, till she moved upon the firm vehicle of his body. He was so strong, so sustaining, and he could not be opposed. She drifted along in a wonderful interfusion of physical motion down the dark, blowy hillside. Far across shone the little yellow lights of Beldover, many of them, spread in a thick patch on another dark hill. But he and she were walking in perfect, isolated darkness, outside the world. "'But how much do you care for me?' came her voice, almost querulous. "'You see, I don't know, I don't understand.' "'How much?' His voice rang with a painful elation. "'I don't know either, but everything!' He was startled by his own declaration. It was true. So he stripped himself of every safeguard in making this admission to her. He cared everything for her. She was everything. "'But I can't believe it!' said her low voice, amazed trembling. She was trembling with doubt and exultance. 
This was the thing she wanted to hear, only this. Yet now she heard it, heard the strange clapping vibration of truth in his voice as he said it. She could not believe. She could not believe. She did not believe. Yet she believed, triumphantly, with fatal exultance. "'Why not?' he said. "'Why don't you believe it? It's true. It is true as we stand at this moment.' He stood still with her in the wind. "'I care for nothing on earth or in heaven outside this spot where we are. And it isn't my own presence I care about. It is all yours.' I'd sell my soul a hundred times, but I couldn't bear not to have you here. I couldn't bear to be alone. My brain would burst. It is true. He drew her closer to him with definite movement. No, she murmured, afraid. Yet this was what she wanted. Why did she so lose courage? They resumed their strange walk. They were such strangers, and yet they were so frightfully, unthinkably near. It was like a madness. Yet it was what she wanted. It was what she wanted. They had descended the hill, and now they were coming to the square arch where the road passed under the colliery railway. The arch, Gudrun knew, had walls of squared stone, mossy on one side, with water that trickled down, dry on the other side. She had stood under it to hear the train rumble thundering over the logs overhead. And she knew that under this dark and lonely bridge the young colliers stood in the darkness with their sweethearts in rainy weather. And so she wanted to stand under the bridge with her sweetheart, and be kissed under the bridge in the invisible darkness. Her steps dragged as she drew near. So, under the bridge, they came to a standstill, and he lifted her upon his breast. His body vibrated taut and powerful as he closed upon her, and crushed her, breathless and dazed and destroyed, crushed her upon his breast. Oh! It was terrible and perfect. Under this bridge the colliers pressed their lovers to their breast, and now under the bridge the master of them all pressed her to himself. And how much more powerful and terrible was his embrace than theirs, how much more concentrated and supreme his love was than theirs in the same sort. She felt she would swoon, die, under the vibrating, inhuman tension of his arms and his body. She would pass away. Then the unthinkable high vibration slackened, and became more undulating. He slackened and drew her with him to stand with his back to the wall. She was almost unconscious. So the colliers' lovers would stand with their backs to the walls, holding their sweethearts and kissing them as she was being kissed. Ah, but would their kisses be fine and powerful as the kisses of the firm mouth master? Even the keen short-cut moustache, the colliers would not have that. And the colliers' sweethearts would, like herself, hang their heads back, limp over their shoulder, and look out from the dark archway at the close patch of yellow lights on the unseen hill in the distance, or at the vague form of trees, and at the buildings of the colliery woodyard in the other direction. His arms were fast around her. He seemed to be gathering her into himself, her warmth, her softness, her adorable weight, drinking in the suffusion of her physical being, avidly. He lifted her, and seemed to pour her into himself, like wine into a cup. "'This is worth everything,' 
he said, in a strange, penetrating voice. So she relaxed, and seemed to melt, to flow into him, as if she were some infinitely warm and precious suffusion filling into his veins, like an intoxicant. Her arms were round his neck. He kissed her, and held her perfectly suspended. She was all slack and flowing into him, and he was the firm, strong cup that receives the wine of her life. So she lay cast upon him, stranded, lifted up against him, melting and melting under his kisses, melting into his limbs and bones, as if he were soft iron becoming surcharged with her electric life. Till she seemed to swoon, gradually her mind went, and she passed away, everything in her was melted down and fluid, and she lay still, become contained by him, sleeping in him as lightning sleeps in a pure soft stone. So she was passed away and gone in him, and he was perfected. When she opened her eyes again, and saw the patch of lights in the distance, it seemed to her strange that the world still existed, that she was standing under the bridge resting her head on Gerald's breast. Gerald, who was he? He was the exquisite adventure, the desirable unknown to her. She looked up, and in the darkness saw his face above her, his shapely male face. There seemed a faint white light emitted from him, a white aura, as if he were visitor from the unseen. She reached up, like Eve reaching to the apples on the tree of knowledge, and she kissed him, though her passion was a transcendent fear of the thing he was, touching his face with her infinitely delicate, encroaching, wondering fingers. Her fingers went over the mould of his face, over his features. How perfect and foreign he was! Ah, how dangerous! Her soul thrilled with complete knowledge. This was the glistening, forbidden apple, this face of a man. She kissed him, putting her fingers over his face, his eyes, his nostrils, over his brows and his ears, to his neck, to know him, to gather him in by touch. He was so firm and shapely, with such satisfying, inconceivable shapeliness, strange yet unutterably clear. He was such an unutterable enemy, yet glistening with uncanny white fire. She wanted to touch him and touch him and touch him, till she had him all in her hands till she had strained him into her knowledge. Ah, if she could have the precious knowledge of him, she would be filled, and nothing could deprive her of this. For he was so unsure, so risky in the common world of day. You are so beautiful, she murmured in her throat. He wondered, and was suspended, but she felt him quiver, and she came down involuntarily nearer upon him. He could not help himself. Her fingers had him under their power. The fathomless, fathomless desire they could evoke in him was deeper than death, where he had no choice. But she knew now, and it was enough. For the time her soul was destroyed with the exquisite shock of his invisible fluid lightning. She knew. And this knowledge was a death from which she must recover. How much more of him was there to know? Ah, much, much, many days, 
harvesting for her large yet perfectly subtle and intelligent hands upon the field of his living radioactive body. Oh, her hands were eager, greedy for knowledge, but for the present it was enough, enough, as much as her soul could bear. Too much, and she would shatter herself, she would fill the fine vial of her soul too quickly, and it would break. Enough now, enough for the time being. There were all the after-days when her hands, like birds, could feed upon the fields of his mystical plastic form, till then enough. And even he was glad to be checked, rebuked, held back, for to desire is better than to possess. The finality of the end was dreaded as deeply as it was desired. They walked on towards the town, towards where the lamps threaded singly, at long intervals, down the dark high-road of the valley. They came at length to the gate of the drive. "'Don't come any further,' she said. "'You'd rather I didn't?' he asked, relieved. He did not want to go up the public streets with her, his soul all naked and alight as it was. "'Much rather.' Good night. She held out her hand. He grasped it, then touched the perilous, potent fingers with his lips. Good night, he said. Tomorrow. And they parted. He went home full of the strength and the power of living desire. But the next day she did not come. She sent a note that she was kept indoors by a cold. Here was a torment. But he possessed his soul in some sort of patience, writing a brief answer, telling her how sorry he was not to see her. The day after this he stayed at home. It seemed so futile to go down to the office. His father could not live the week out, and he wanted to be at home, suspended. Gerald sat on a chair by the window in his father's room. The landscape outside was black and winter-sodden. His father lay grey and ashen on the bed. A nurse moved silently in her white dress, neat and elegant, even beautiful. There was a scent of eau de cologne in the room. The nurse went out of the room. Gerald was alone with death facing the winter-black landscape. "'Is there much more water in Denley?' came the faint voice, determined and querulous, from the bed. The dying man was asking about a leakage from Willy Water into one of the pits. "'Some more. We shall have to run off the lake,' said Gerald. "'Will you?' The faint voice filtered to extinction. There was dead stillness. The grey-faced sick man lay with eyes closed, more dead than death. Gerald looked away. He felt his heart was seared. It would perish if this went on much longer. Suddenly he heard a strange noise. Turning round, he saw his father's eyes wide open, strained and rolling in a frenzy of inhuman struggling. Gerald started to his feet, and stood transfixed in horror. <coughs> Came a horrible, choking rattle from his father's throat, the fearful, frenzied eye, rolling awfully in its wild, fruitless search for help, passed blindly over Gerald. Then up came the dark blood and mess, pumping over the face of the agonised being. The tense body relaxed. The head fell aside down the pillow. 
Gerald stood transfixed, his soul echoing in horror. He would move, but he could not. He could not move his limbs. His brain seemed to re-echo like a pulse. The nurse in white softly entered. She glanced at Gerald, then at the bed. Oh! came her soft, whimpering cry, and she hurried forward to the dead man. Oh! came the slight sound of her agitated distress, as she stood bending over the bedside. Then she recovered, turned, and came for towel and sponge. She was wiping the dead face carefully, and murmuring, almost whimpering, very softly, "'Poor Mr. Cry! Poor Mr. Cry! Poor Mr. Cry!' "'Is he dead?' clanged Gerald's sharp voice. "'Oh, yes, he's gone.' replied the soft, moaning voice of the nurse, as she looked up at Gerald's face. She was young and beautiful and quivering. A strange sort of grin went over Gerald's face, over the horror, and he walked out of the room. He was going to tell his mother. On the landing he met his brother, Basil. "'He's gone, Basil,' he said, scarcely able to subdue his voice, not to let an unconscious, frightening exultation sound through. "'What?' cried Basil, going pale. Gerald nodded. Then he went on to his mother's room. She was sitting in her purple gown, sewing, very slowly sewing, putting in a stitch, then another stitch. She looked up at Gerald with her blue, undaunted eyes. "'Father's gone,' he said. "'He's dead. Who says so?' "'Oh, you know, mother, if you see him.' She put her sewing down and slowly rose. "'Are you going to see him?' he asked. "'Yes,' she said. By the bedside the children already stood in a weeping group. "'Oh, mother!' cried the daughters, almost in hysterics, weeping loudly. But the mother went forward. The dead man lay in repose, as if gently asleep, so gently, so peacefully, like a young man sleeping in purity. He was still warm. She stood looking at him in gloomy, heavy silence for some time. I, she said bitterly at length, speaking as if to the unseen witnesses of the air, "'You're dead.' She stood for some minutes in silence, looking down. "'Beautiful,' she asserted, "'beautiful as if life had never touched you.' never touched you. God send I look different. I hope I shall look my years when I am dead. Beautiful, beautiful, she crooned over him. You can see him in his teens with his first beard on his face. A beautiful soul, beautiful. Then there was a tearing in her voice as she cried, "'None of you look like this when you are dead. Don't let it happen again!' It was a strange, wild command from out of the unknown. Her children moved unconsciously together in a nearer group at the dreadful command in her voice. The colour was flushed bright in her cheek. She looked awful and wonderful. "'Blame me, blame me, if you like, that he lies there like a lad in his teens, with his first beard on his face. Blame me, if you like, but you none of you know.' She was silent, in intense silence. Then there came, 
in a low, tense voice. "'If I thought that the children I bore would lie looking like that in death, I'd strangle them when they were infants, yes.' "'No, mother,' came the strange clarion voice of Gerald from the background. "'We are different. We don't blame you.' She turned and looked full in his eyes. Then she lifted her hands in a strange half-gesture of mad despair. "'Pray,' she said strongly, "'pray for yourselves to God, for there's no help for you from your parents.' "'Oh, mother!' cried her daughters wildly. But she had turned and gone, and they all went quickly away from each other. End of the first part of chapter 24 Recording by Ruth Golding Part two of chapter twenty four of Women in Love. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Women in Love by D. H. Lawrence. The second part of chapter twenty four Death and Love. When Gudrun heard that Mr. Cry was dead, she felt rebuked. She had stayed away lest Gerald should think her too easy of winning, and now he was in the midst of trouble, whilst she was cold. The following day she went up as usual to Winifred, who was glad to see her, glad to get away into the studio. The girl had wept, and then, too frightened, had turned aside to avoid any more tragic eventuality. She and Gudrun resumed work as usual in the isolation of the studio, and this seemed an immeasurable happiness, a pure world of freedom after the aimlessness and misery of the house. Gudrun stayed on till evening. She and Winifred had dinner brought up to the studio, where they ate in freedom, away from all the people in the house. After dinner Gerald came up. The great high studio was full of shadow and a fragrance of coffee. Gudrun and Winifred had a little table near the fire at the far end, with a white lamp whose light did not travel far. They were a tiny world to themselves, the two girls surrounded by lovely shadows, the beams and rafters shadowy overhead the benches and implements shadowy down the studio. "'You're cosy enough here,' said Gerald, going up to them. There was a low brick fireplace full of fire, an old blue Turkish rug, the little oak table with the lamp and the white and blue cloth and the dessert, and Gudrun making coffee in an odd brass coffee-maker, and Winifred scalding a little milk in a tiny saucepan. "'Have you had coffee?' said Gudrun. "'I have, but I'll have some more with you,' he replied. "'Then you must have it in a glass. There are only two cups,' said Winifred. "'It's the same to me,' he said, taking a chair and coming into the charmed circle of the girls. How happy they were, how cosy and glamorous it was with them in a world of lofty shadows. The outside world, in which he had been transacting funeral business all the day, was completely wiped out. In an instant he snuffed glamour and magic. They had all their things very dainty, two odd and lovely little cups, scarlet and solid gilt, and a little black jug with scarlet discs, and the curious coffee machine whose spirit flame flowed steadily almost invisibly. There was the effect of rather sinister richness, in which Gerald at once escaped himself. They all sat down, and Gudrun carefully poured out the coffee. "'Will you have milk?' she asked calmly, 
yet nervously poising the little black jug with its big red dots. She was always so completely controlled, yet so bitterly nervous. "'No, I won't,' he replied. So, with a curious humility, she placed him the little cup of coffee, and herself took the awkward tumbler. She seemed to want to serve him. "'Why don't you give me the glass? It's so clumsy for you,' he said. He would much rather have had it, and seen her daintily served, but she was silent, pleased with the disparity, with her self-abasement. "'You're quite en ménage,' he said. "'Yes, we aren't really at home to visitors,' said Winifred. "'You're not. Then I'm an intruder.' For once he felt his conventional dress was out of place. He was an outsider. Gudrun was very quiet. She did not feel drawn to talk to him. At this stage silence was best, or mere light words. It was best to leave serious things aside. So they talked gaily and lightly, till they heard the man below lead out the horse, and call it to back, back, into the dog-cart that was to take Gudrun home. So she put on her things, and shook hands with Gerald, without once meeting his eyes, and she was gone. The funeral was detestable. Afterwards, at the tea-table, the daughters kept saying, "'He was a good father to us, the best father in the world,' or else— we shan't easily find another man as good as father was. Gerald acquiesced in all this. It was the right conventional attitude, and as far as the world went he believed in the conventions. He took it as a matter of course. But Winifred hated everything, and hid in the studio and cried her heart out, and wished Gudrun would come. Luckily everybody was going away. The cries never stayed long at home. By dinner-time Gerald was left quite alone. Even Winifred was carried off to London for a few days with her sister Laura. But when Gerald was really left alone he could not bear it. One day passed by, and another, and all the time he was like a man hung in chains over the edge of an abyss. Struggle as he might, he could not turn himself to the solid earth, he could not get footing. He was suspended on the edge of a void, writhing. Whatever he thought of was the abyss, whether it were friends or strangers or work or play, it all showed him only the same bottomless void in which his heart swung perishing. There was no escape, there was nothing to grasp hold of. He must writhe on the edge of the chasm, suspended in chains of invisible physical life. At first he was quiet, he kept still, expecting the extremity to pass away, expecting to find himself released into the world of the living, after this extremity of penance. But it did not pass, and a crisis gained upon him. As the evening of the third day came on, his heart rang with fear. He could not bear another night. Another night was coming on. For another night he was to be suspended in chain of physical life over the bottomless pit of nothingness. And he could not bear it. He could not bear it. He was frightened deeply and coldly, frightened in his soul. He did not believe in his own strength any more. He could not fall into this infinite void and rise again. If he fell he would be gone for ever. He must withdraw, he must seek reinforcements. He did not believe in his own single self any further than this. After dinner, faced with the ultimate experience of his own nothingness, he turned aside. He pulled on his boots, put on his coat, and set out to walk in the night. It was dark and misty. He went through the wood, 
stumbling and feeling his way to the mill. Birkin was away. Good, he was half glad. He turned up the hill, and stumbled blindly over the wild slopes, having lost the path in the complete darkness. It was boring. Where was he going? No matter. He stumbled on till he came to a path again. Then he went on through another wood. His mind became dark. He went on automatically. Without thought or sensation he stumbled unevenly on, out into the open again, fumbling for stiles, losing the path, and going along the hedges of the fields till he came to the outlet. And at last he came to the high road. It had distracted him to struggle blindly through the maze of darkness, but now he must take a direction, and he did not even know where he was. But he must take a direction now. Nothing would be resolved by merely walking, walking away. He had to take a direction. He stood still on the road that was high in the utterly dark night, and he did not know where he was. It was a strange sensation, his heart beating, and ringed round with the utterly unknown darkness. So he stood for some time. Then he heard footsteps, and saw a small swinging light. He immediately went towards this. It was a miner. "'Can you tell me,' he said, "'where this road goes?' "'Road? I goes to Watmore.' "'Watmore? Oh, thank you. That's right. I thought I was wrong. Good night.' "'Good night,' replied the broad voice of the miner. Gerald guessed where he was. At least, when he came to Watmore he would know. He was glad to be on a high road. He walked forward, as in a sleep of decision. That was Watmore village. Yes, the King's Head, and there the hall gates. He descended the steep hill, almost running. Winding through the hollow, he passed the grammar school, and came to Willie Green Church. The churchyard! He halted. Then, in another moment, he had clambered up the wall and was going among the graves. Even in this darkness he could see the heaped pallor of old white flowers at his feet. This, then, was the grave. He stooped down. The flowers were cold and clammy. There was a raw scent of chrysanthemums and tube-roses deadened. He felt the clay beneath, and shrank. It was so horribly cold and sticky. He stood away in revulsion. Here was one centre, then, here in the complete darkness beside the unseen raw grave. But there was nothing for him here. No, he had nothing to stay here for. He felt as if some of the clay were sticking cold and unclean on his heart. No, enough of this. Where, then? Home? Never. It was no use going there. That was less than no use. It could not be done. There was somewhere else to go. Where? A dangerous resolve formed in his heart, like a fixed idea. There was Gudrun. She would be safe in her home, but he could get at her. He would get at her. He would not go back to-night till he had come to her, if it cost him his life. He staked his all on this throw. He set off, walking straight across the fields towards Beldover. It was so dark nobody could ever see him. His feet were wet and cold heavy with clay. But he went on, persistently, like a wind, straight forward as if to his fate. There were great gaps in his consciousness. He was conscious that he was at Winthorpe Hamlet, but quite unconscious how he had got there. And then, as in a dream, he was in the long street of Beldover, with its street lamps. 
There was a noise of voices, and of a door shutting loudly, and being barred, and of men talking in the night. The Lord Nelson had just closed, and the drinkers were going home. He had better ask one of these where she lived, for he did not know the side streets at all. "'Can you tell me where Somerset Drive is?' he asked of one of the uneven men. "'Where what?' replied the tipsy miner's voice. "'Somerset Drive!' "'Somerset Drive. I've heard of such a place, but I couldn't for my life say where it is. Who might you be wanting?' "'Mr. Brangwyn. William Brangwyn. William Brangwyn. Who teaches at the grammar school, at Willie Green. His daughter teaches there, too.' "'Oh, Brangwyn. Now I've got you. Of course, William Brangwyn. Yes, yes, he's got two lasses as teachers, aside his cell. Ah, that's him, that's him. Why, certainly I know where he lives. Back your life I do. Yeah, what place they call it? Somerset Drive, repeated Gerald patiently. He knew his own colliers fairly well. Somerset Drive, for certain, said the collier swinging his arm as if catching something up. Somerset Drive, yeah. I couldn't for my life lay hold of the locality of the place. Yes, I know the place, to be sure I do. He turned unsteadily on his feet, and pointed up the dark, nigh-deserted road. You go up there, and you take the first, yeah, the first turning on your left. On that side, past Withams's Tuffy shop. I know, said Gerald. Aye. You go down a bit, past where the waterman lives, and then Somerset Drive, as they call it, branches off to right-hand side, and there's nought but three houses in it, no more than three, I believe, and I'm almost certain there's the last. The last of the three, see? Thank you very much, said Gerald. Good night. And he started off, leaving the tipsy man there standing rooted. Gerald went past the dark shops and houses, most of them sleeping now, and twisted round to the little blind road that ended on a field of darkness. He slowed down as he neared his goal, not knowing how he should proceed. What if the house were closed in darkness? But it was not. He saw a big lighted window, and heard voices. Then a gate banged. His quick ears caught the sound of Birkin's voice. His keen eyes made out Birkin, with Ursula standing in a pale dress on the step of the garden path. Then Ursula stepped down, and came along the road, holding Birkin's arm. Gerald went across into the darkness, and they dawdled past him, talking happily, Birkin's voice low, Ursula's high and distinct. Gerald went quickly to the house. The blinds were drawn before the big lighted window of the dining-room. Looking up the path at the side, he could see the door left open, shedding a soft, coloured light from the hall lamp. He went quickly and silently up the path, and looked up into the hall. There were pictures on the walls, and the antlers of a stag, and the stairs going up on one side, and just near the foot of the stairs, the half-opened door of the dining-room. With heart drawn fine, Gerald stepped into the hall, whose floor was of coloured tiles, went quickly and looked into the large, pleasant room. In a chair by the fire the father sat asleep, his head tilted back against the side of the big oak chimney-piece, his ruddy face seen foreshortened, the nostrils open, the mouth fallen a little. It would take the merest sound to wake him. Gerald stood a second, suspended. He glanced down the passage behind him. It was all dark. Again he was suspended. 
Then he went swiftly upstairs. His senses were so finely, almost supernaturally keen, that he seemed to cast his own will over the half-unconscious house. He came to the first landing. There he stood, scarcely breathing. Again, corresponding to the door below, there was a door again. That would be the mother's room. He could hear her moving about in the candlelight. She would be expecting her husband to come up. He looked along the dark landing. Then, silently, on infinitely careful feet, he went along the passage, feeling the wall with the extreme tips of his fingers. There was a door. He stood and listened. He could hear two people's breathing. It was not that. He went stealthily forward. There was another door, slightly open. The room was in darkness, empty. Then there was the bathroom. He could smell the soap and the heat. Then at the end another bedroom. One soft breathing. This was she. With an almost occult carefulness he turned the door-handle and opened the door an inch. It creaked slightly. Then he opened it another inch, then another. His heart did not beat. He seemed to create a silence about himself, an obliviousness. He was in the room. Still the sleeper breathed softly. It was very dark. He felt his way forward inch by inch with his feet and hands. He touched the bed. He could hear the sleeper. He drew nearer, bending close, as if his eyes would disclose whatever there was. And then, very near to his face, to his fear, he saw the round, dark head of a boy. He recovered turned round, saw the door ajar, a faint light revealed, and he retreated swiftly, drew the door to without fastening it, and passed rapidly down the passage. At the head of the stairs he hesitated. There was still time to flee. But it was unthinkable. He would maintain his will. He turned past the door of the parental bedroom like a shadow, and was climbing the second flight of stairs. They creaked under his weight. It was exasperating. Ah, what disaster if the mother's door opened just beneath him, and she saw him! It would have to be, if it were so. He held the control still. He was not quite up these stairs when he heard a quick running of feet below. The outer door was closed and locked. He heard Ursula's voice, then the father's sleepy exclamation. He pressed on swiftly to the upper landing. Again a door was ajar, a room was empty. Feeling his way forward with the tips of his fingers, travelling rapidly like a blind man, anxious lest Ursula should come upstairs, he found another door. There, with his preternaturally fine sense alert, he listened. He heard someone moving in bed. This would be she. Softly now, like one who has only one sense, the tactile sense, he turned the latch. It clicked. He held still. The bedclothes rustled. His heart did not beat. Then again he drew the latch back, and very gently pushed the door. It made a sticking noise as it gave. Ursula, said Gudrun's voice, frightened. He quickly opened the door and pushed it behind him. Is it you, Ursula? came Gudrun's frightened voice. He heard her sitting up in bed. In another moment she would scream. No, it's me, he said, feeling his way towards her. It is I, Gerald. She sat motionless in her bed in sheer astonishment. She was too astonished, too much taken by surprise, even to be afraid. "'Gerald!' she echoed, in blank amazement. He had found his way to the bed, and his outstretched hand touched her warm breast blindly, 
she shrank away. "'Let me make a light,' she said, springing out. He stood perfectly motionless. He heard her touch the matchbox, he heard her fingers in their movement. Then he saw her in the light of a match which she held to the candle. The light rose in the room, then sank to a small dimness as the flame sank down on the candle before it mounted again. She looked at him as he stood near the other side of the bed. His cap was pulled low over his brow, his black overcoat was buttoned close up to his chin, his face was strange and luminous. He was inevitable as a supernatural being. When she had seen him, she knew. She knew there was something fatal in the situation, and she must accept it. Yet she must challenge him. "'How did you come up?' she asked. "'I walked up the stairs. The door was open.' She looked at him. "'I haven't closed this door, either,' he said. She walked swiftly across the room and closed her door softly, and locked it. Then she came back. She was wonderful, with startled eyes and flushed cheeks, and her plait of hair rather short and thick down her back, and her long, fine, white nightdress falling to her feet. She saw that his boots were all clayey, even his trousers were plastered with clay and she wondered if he had made footprints all the way up. He was a very strange figure, standing in her bedroom near the tossed bed. "'Why have you come?' she asked, almost querulous. "'I wanted to,' he replied. And this she could see from his face. It was fate. "'You are so muddy,' she said, in distaste, but gently. He looked down at his feet. "'I was walking in the dark,' he replied. But he felt vividly elated. There was a pause. He stood on one side of the tumbled bed, she on the other. He did not even take his cap from his brows. "'And what do you want of me?' she challenged. He looked aside and did not answer. Save for the extreme beauty and mystic attractiveness of this distinct, strange face, she would have sent him away. But his face was too wonderful and undiscovered to her. It fascinated her with the fascination of pure beauty, cast a spell on her, like nostalgia, an ache. "'What do you want of me?' she repeated, in an estranged voice. He pulled off his cap in a movement of dream liberation, and went across to her. But he could not touch her, because she stood barefoot in her nightdress, and he was muddy and damp. Her eyes, wide and large and wondering, watched him, and asked him the ultimate question. "'I came because I must,' he said. "'Why do you ask?' She looked at him in doubt and wonder. "'I must ask,' she said. He shook his head slightly. "'There is no answer,' he replied, with strange vacancy. There was about him a curious and almost godlike air of simplicity, and naive directness. He reminded her of an apparition, the young Hermes. "'But why did you come to me?' she persisted. "'Because it has to be so. If there weren't you in the world, then I shouldn't be in the world either.' She stood looking at him with large, wide, wondering, stricken eyes. His eyes were looking steadily into hers all the time, and he seemed fixed in an odd supernatural steadfastness. She sighed. She was lost now. She had no choice. 
"'Won't you take off your boots?' she said. "'They must be wet.' He dropped his cap on a chair, unbuttoned his overcoat, lifting up his chin to unfasten the throat-buttons. His short, keen hair was ruffled. He was so beautifully blonde, like wheat. He pulled off his overcoat. Quickly he pulled off his jacket, pulled loose his black tie, and was unfastening his studs which were headed each with a pearl. She listened, watching, hoping no one would hear the starched linen crackle. It seemed to snap like pistol shots. He had come for vindication. She let him hold her in his arms, clasp her close against him. He found in her an infinite relief. Into her he poured all his pent-up darkness and corrosive death, and he was whole again. It was wonderful, marvellous. It was a miracle. This was the ever-recurrent miracle of his life, at the knowledge of which he was lost in an ecstasy of relief and wonder, and she, subject, received him as a vessel filled with his bitter potion of death. She had no power at this crisis to resist. The terrible frictional violence of death filled her, and she received it in an ecstasy of subjection, in throes of acute violent sensation. As he drew nearer to her, he plunged deeper into her enveloping soft warmth, a wonderful creative heat that penetrated his veins and gave him life again. He felt himself dissolving and sinking to rest in the bath of her living strength. It seemed as if her heart in her breast were a second unconquerable sun, into the glow and creative strength of which he plunged further and further. All his veins that were murdered and lacerated healed softly as life came pulsing in stealing invisibly into him, as if it were the all-powerful effluence of the sun. His blood, which seemed to have been drawn back into death, came ebbing on the return, surely, beautifully, powerfully. She felt his limbs growing fuller and flexible with life, his body gained an unknown strength, he was a man again, strong and rounded. And he was a child, so soothed and restored, and full of gratitude. And she? She was the great bath of life. He worshipped her. Mother and substance of all life she was. And he, child and man, received of her, and was made whole. His pure body was almost killed, but the miraculous soft effluence of her breast suffused over him, over his seared, damaged brain, like a healing lymph, like a soft, soothing flow of life itself, perfect, as if he were bathed in the womb again. His brain was hurt, seared, the tissue was as if destroyed. He had not known how hurt he was, how his tissue, the very tissue of his brain, was damaged by the corrosive flood of death. Now, as the healing lymph of her effluence flowed through him, he knew how destroyed he was, like a plant whose tissue is burst from inwards by a frost. He buried his small, hard head between her breasts, and pressed her breasts against him with his hands, and she, with quivering hands, pressed his head against her as he lay suffused out, and she lay fully conscious. The lovely creative warmth flooded through him like a sleep of fecundity within the womb. 
Oh, if only she would grant him the flow of this living effluence, he would be restored, he would be complete again. He was afraid she would deny him before it was finished. Like a child at the breast, he cleaved intensely to her, and she could not put him away. And his seared, ruined membrane relaxed, softened. That which was seared and stiff and blasted, yielded again, became soft and flexible, palpitating with new life. He was infinitely grateful, as to God, or as an infant is at its mother's breast. He was glad and grateful like a delirium, as he felt his own wholeness come over him again, as he felt the full, unutterable sleep coming over him, the sleep of complete exhaustion and restoration. But Gudrun lay wide awake destroyed into perfect consciousness. She lay motionless, with wide eyes, staring motionless into the darkness, whilst he was sunk away in sleep, his arms round her. She seemed to be hearing waves break on a hidden shore, long, slow, gloomy waves, breaking with the rhythm of fate, so monotonously that it seemed eternal this endless breaking of slow, sullen waves of fate held her life a possession, whilst she lay with dark, wide eyes looking into the darkness. She could see so far, as far as eternity, yet she saw nothing. She was suspended in perfect consciousness, and of what was she conscious? This mood of extremity, when she lay staring into eternity, utterly suspended, and conscious of everything to the last limits, passed and left her uneasy. She had lain so long motionless, she moved, she became self-conscious, she wanted to look at him, to see him. But she dared not make a light, because she knew he would wake, and she did not want to break his perfect sleep that she knew he had got of her. She disengaged herself softly, and rose up a little to look at him. There was a faint light, it seemed to her, in the room. She could just distinguish his features as he slept the perfect sleep. In this darkness she seemed to see him so distinctly. But he was far off, in another world, Ah, oh, she could shriek with torment, he was so far off, and perfected, in another world. She seemed to look at him as at a pebble, far away, under clear dark water. And here was she, left with all the anguish of consciousness, whilst he was sunk deep into the other element of mindless, remote, living shadow-gleam. He was beautiful, far off and perfected. They would never be together. Ah, this awful, inhuman distance which would always be interposed between her and the other being. There was nothing to do but to lie still and endure. She felt an overwhelming tenderness for him, and a dark, understirring of jealous hatred, that he should lie so perfect and immune in an other world, whilst she was tormented with violent wakefulness, cast out in the outer darkness. She lay in intense and vivid consciousness, an exhausting super-consciousness. The church clock struck the hours, it seemed to her, in quick succession. She heard them distinctly in the tension of her vivid consciousness, and he slept as if time were one moment, unchanging and unmoving. She was exhausted, wearied, yet she must continue in this state of violent, active super-consciousness. 
she was conscious of everything, her childhood, her girlhood, all the forgotten incidents, all the unrealised influences, and all the happenings she had not understood pertaining to herself, to her family, to her friends, her lovers, her acquaintances, everybody. It was as if she drew a glittering rope of knowledge out of the sea of darkness, drew and drew and drew it out of the fathomless depths of the past, and still it did not come to an end, there was no end to it. She must haul and haul at the rope of glittering consciousness, pull it out phosphorescent from the endless depths of the unconsciousness, till she was weary, aching, exhausted and fit to break, and yet she had not done. Ah, if only she might wake him! She turned uneasily. When could she rouse him and send him away? When could she disturb him? And she relapsed into her activity of automatic consciousness that would never end. But the time was drawing near when she could wake him. It was like a release. The clock had struck four, outside in the night. Thank God the night had passed almost away. At five he must go, and she would be released. Then she could relax and fill her own place. Now. She was driven up against his perfect sleeping motion, like a knife white-hot on a grindstone. There was something monstrous about him, about his juxtaposition against her. The last hour was the longest. And yet at last it passed. Her heart leapt with relief. Yes, there was the slow, strong stroke of the church clock at last, after this night of eternity. She waited to catch each slow, fatal reverberation. Three, four, five. There! It was finished. A weight rolled off her. She raised herself, leaned over him tenderly, and kissed him. She was sad to wake him. After a few moments she kissed him again, but he did not stir. The darling, he was so deep in sleep. What a shame to take him out of it. She let him lie a little longer, but he must go. He must really go. With full over-tenderness she took his face between her hands and kissed his eyes. The eyes opened. He remained motionless, looking at her. Her heart stood still. To hide her face from his dreadful opened eyes in the darkness, she bent down and kissed him, whispering, "'You must go, my love!' But she was sick with terror, sick. He put his arms round her. Her heart sank. "'But you must go, my love, it's late.' "'What time is it?' he said. Strange, his man's voice. She quivered. It was an intolerable oppression to her. Past five o'clock, she said. But he only closed his arms round her again. Her heart cried within her in torture. She disengaged herself firmly. You really must go, she said. Not for a minute, he said. She lay still, nestling against him, but unyielding. "'Not for a minute,' he repeated, clasping her closer. "'Yes,' she said, unyielding. "'I'm afraid if you stay any longer.' There was a certain coldness in her voice that made him release her, and she broke away, rose and lit the candle. That then was the end. He got up. He was warm and full of life and desire, yet he felt a little bit ashamed, humiliated, putting on his clothes before her in the candlelight. For he felt revealed, 
exposed to her at a time when she was in some way against him. It was all very difficult to understand. He dressed himself quickly without collar or tie. Still he felt full and complete, perfected. She thought it humiliating to see a man dressing, the ridiculous shirt, the ridiculous trousers and braces. But again an idea saved her. It is like a workman getting up to go to work, thought Gudrun, and I am like a workman's wife. But an ache like nausea was upon her, a nausea of him. He pushed his collar and tie into his overcoat pocket. Then he sat down and pulled on his boots. They were sodden, as were his socks and trouser-bottoms, but he himself was quick and warm. "'Perhaps you ought to have put your boots on downstairs,' she said. At once, without answering, he pulled them off again, and stood holding them in his hand. She had thrust her feet into slippers, and flung a loose robe round her. She was ready. She looked at him as he stood waiting his black coat buttoned to the chin, his cap pulled down, his boots in his hand. And the passionate, almost hateful fascination revived in her for a moment. It was not exhausted. His face was so warm-looking, wide-eyed, and full of newness, so perfect. She felt old, old. She went to him heavily to be kissed. He kissed her quickly. She wished his warm, expressionless beauty did not so fatally put a spell on her, compel her, and subjugate her. It was a burden upon her that she resented but could not escape. Yet when she looked at his straight man's brows, and at his rather small, well-shaped nose, and at his blue, indifferent eyes, she knew her passion for him was not yet satisfied. Perhaps never could be satisfied, only now she was weary, with an ache like nausea. She wanted him gone. They went downstairs quickly. It seemed they made a prodigious noise. He followed her as, wrapped in her vivid green wrap, she preceded him with the light. She suffered badly with fear lest her people should be roused. He hardly cared. He did not care now, who knew? And she hated this in him. One must be cautious. One must preserve oneself. She led the way to the kitchen. It was neat and tidy as the woman had left it. He looked up at the clock, twenty minutes past five. Then he sat down on a chair to put on his boots. She waited, watching his every movement. She wanted it to be over. It was a great nervous strain on her. He stood up. She unbolted the back door and looked out. A cold, raw night, not yet dawn, with a piece of a moon in the vague sky. She was glad she need not go out. "'Good-bye, then,' he murmured. "'I'll come to the gate,' she said. And again she hurried on in front to warn him of the steps, and at the gate once more she stood on the step, whilst he stood below her. "'Good-bye,' she whispered. He kissed her dutifully and turned away. She suffered torments, hearing his firm tread going so distinctly down the road. Ah, oh, the insensitiveness of that firm tread! She closed the gate, and crept quickly and noiselessly back to bed. When she was in her room and the door closed, and all safe, she breathed freely, and a great weight fell off her. She nestled down in bed, in the groove his body had made, in the warmth he had left and excited, worn out, yet still satisfied, she fell soon into a deep, heavy sleep. Gerald walked quickly through the raw darkness of the coming dawn. He met nobody. 
His mind was beautifully still and thoughtless, like a still pool, and his body full and warm and rich. He went quickly along towards Shortlands, in a grateful self-sufficiency. End of chapter 24 Recording by Ruth Golding Chapter 25 of Women in Love This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Women in Love by D. H. Lawrence. Chapter 25 Marriage or Not. The Brangwen family was going to move from Beldover. It was necessary now for the father to be in town. Birkin had taken out a marriage licence, yet Ursula deferred from day to day. She would not fix any definite time. She still wavered. Her month's notice to leave the grammar school was in its third week. Christmas was not far off. Gerald waited for the Ursula-Birkin marriage. It was something crucial to him. "'Shall we make it a double-barrelled affair?' he said to Birkin one day. "'Who for the second shot?' asked Birkin. "'Gudrun and me,' said Gerald, the venturesome twinkle in his eyes. Birkin looked at him steadily, as if somewhat taken aback. "'Serious or joking?' he asked. "'Oh, serious!' "'Shall I? Shall Gudrun and I rush in along with you?' "'Do by all means,' said Birkin. "'I didn't know you'd got that length.' "'What length?' said Gerald, looking at the other man and laughing. "'Oh, yes, we've gone all the lengths.' "'There remains to put it on a broad social basis and to achieve a high moral purpose,' said Birkin. "'Something like that. The length and breadth and height of it,' replied Gerald, smiling. "'Oh, well,' said Birkin, "'it's a very admirable step to take, I should say.' Gerald looked at him closely. "'Why aren't you enthusiastic?' he asked. "'I thought you were such dead nuts on marriage.' Birkin lifted his shoulders. One might as well be dead nuts on noses. There are all sorts of noses, snub and otherwise. Gerald laughed. And all sorts of marriage, also snub and otherwise, he said. That's it. And you think if I marry it will be snub? asked Gerald quizzically, his head a little on one side. Birkin laughed quickly. How do I know what it will be? he said. Don't lambaste me with my own parallels. Gerald pondered a while. But I should like to know your opinion, exactly, he said. On your marriage, or marrying, why should you want my opinion? I've got no opinions. I'm not interested in legal marriage one way or another. It's a mere question of convenience. Still Gerald watched him closely. "'More than that, I think,' he said seriously. "'However you may be bored by the ethics of marriage, yet really to marry in one's own personal case is something critical, final.' "'You mean there is something final in going to the registrar with a woman?' "'If you're coming back with her, I do,' said Gerald. It is in some way irrevocable. Yes, I agree, said Birkin. No matter how one regards legal marriage, yet to enter into the married state, in one's own personal instance, is final. I believe it is, said Birkin, somewhere. The question remains, then, should one do it, said Gerald. Birkin watched him narrowly, with amused eyes. 
"'You are like Lord Bacon, Gerald,' he said. "'You argue it like a lawyer, or like Hamlet's to be or not to be. "'If I were you, I would not marry. But ask Gudrun, not me. You're not marrying me, are you?' Gerald did not heed the latter part of this speech. "'Yes,' he said. "'One must consider it coldly. "'It is something critical. "'One comes to the point where one must take a step in one direction or another, "'and marriage is one direction.' "'And what is the other?' asked Birkin quickly. "'Gerald looked up at him with hot, strangely conscious eyes that the other man could not understand. "'I can't say,' he replied. "'If I knew that—' He moved uneasily on his feet, and did not finish. "'You mean, if you knew the alternative?' asked Birkin. "'And since you don't know it, marriage is a piece alley.' Gerald looked up at Birkin with the same hot, constrained eyes. "'One does have the feeling that marriage is a peace alley,' he admitted. "'Then don't do it,' said Birkin. "'I tell you,' he went on, "'the same as I've said before. Marriage, in the old sense, seems to me repulsive. Egoisme à deux is nothing to it. It's a sort of tacit hunting in couples, the world all in couples, each couple in its own little house, watching its own little interests and stewing in its own little privacy. It's the most repulsive thing on earth. I quite agree, said Gerald. There's something inferior about it. But as I say, what's the alternative? One should avoid this home instinct. It's not an instinct, it's a habit of cowardliness. One should never have a home. I agree, really, said Gerald. But there's no alternative. We've got to find one. I do believe in a permanent union between a man and a woman. Chopping about is merely an exhaustive process. But a permanent relation between a man and a woman isn't the last word. It certainly isn't. Quite, said Gerald. In fact, said Birkin, because the relation between man and woman is made the supreme and exclusive relationship, that's where all the tightness and meanness and insufficiency comes in. Yes, I believe you, said Gerald. You've got to take down the love and marriage ideal from its pedestal. We want something broader. I believe in the additional perfect relationship between man and man, additional to marriage. I can never see how they can be the same, said Gerald. Not the same, but equally important, equally creative, equally sacred, if you like. I know, said Gerald, you believe something like that. Only I can't feel it, you see. He put his hand on Birkin's arm, with a sort of deprecating affection, and he smiled as if triumphantly. He was ready to be doomed. Marriage was like a doom to him. He was willing to condemn himself in marriage, to become like a convict, condemned to the minds of the underworld, living no life in the sun, but having a dreadful subterranean activity. He was willing to accept this. And marriage was the seal of his condemnation. He was willing to be sealed thus in the underworld, like a soul damned but living for ever in damnation. But he would not make any pure relationship with any other soul. He could not. Marriage was not the committing of himself into a relationship with Gudrun. It was a committing of himself in acceptance of the established world. 
he would accept the established order in which he did not livingly believe, and then he would retreat to the underworld for his life. This he would do. The other way was to accept Rupert's offer of alliance, to enter into the bond of pure trust and love with the other man, and then subsequently with the woman. If he pledged himself with the man, he would later be able to pledge himself with the woman, not merely in legal marriage, but in absolute mystic marriage. Yet he could not accept the offer. There was a numbness upon him, a numbness either of unborn, absent volition, or of atrophy. Perhaps it was the absence of volition. For he was strangely elated at Rupert's offer. Yet he was still more glad to reject it, not to be committed. End of chapter 25 Recording by Ruth Golding Chapter 26 of Women in Love this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Women in Love by D. H. Lawrence. Chapter 26 A Chair. There was a jumble market every Monday afternoon in the old market place in town. Ursula and Birkin strayed down there one afternoon. They had been talking of furniture, and they wanted to see if there was any fragment they would like to buy amid the heaps of rubbish collected on the cobblestones. The old market square was not very large, a mere bare patch of granite sets, usually with a few fruit stalls under a wall. It was in a poor quarter of the town. Meagre houses stood down one side. There was a hosiery factory, a great blank with myriad oblong windows at the end, a street of little shops with flagstone pavement down the other side, and for a crowning monument the public baths of new red brick with a clock tower. The people who moved about seemed stumpy and sordid. The air seemed to smell rather dirty. There was a sense of many mean streets, ramifying off into warrens of meanness. Now and again a great chocolate and yellow tram-car ground round a difficult bend under the hosiery factory. Ursula was superficially thrilled when she found herself out among the common people, in the jumbled place piled with old bedding, heaps of old iron, shabby crockery in pale lots muffled lots of unthinkable clothing. She and Birkin went unwillingly down the narrow aisle between the rusty wares. He was looking at the goods, she at the people. She excitedly watched a young woman who was going to have a baby, and who was turning over a mattress, and making a young man, down at heel and dejected, feel it also. So secretive and active and anxious the young woman seemed, so reluctant, slinking the young man. He was going to marry her because she was having a child. When they had felt the mattress, the young woman asked the old man, seated on a stool among his wares, how much it was. He told her, and she turned to the young man. The latter was ashamed and self-conscious. He turned his face away, though he left his body standing there, and muttered aside. And again the woman anxiously and actively fingered the mattress, and added up in her mind, and bargained with the old, unclean man. All the while the young man stood by, shamefaced and down at heel, submitting. "'Look,' said Birkin, "'there is a pretty chair.' "'Charming!' cried Ursula. "'Oh, charming!' It was an armchair of simple wood, probably birch, 
but of such fine delicacy of grace, standing there on the sordid stones, it almost brought tears to the eyes. It was square in shape, of the purest slender lines, and four short lines of wood in the back that reminded Ursula of harp-strings. It was once, said Birkin, gilded, and it had a cane seat. Somebody has nailed this wooden seat in. Look, here is a trifle of the red that underlay the gilt. The rest is all black, except where the wood is worn pure and glossy. It is the fine unity of the lines that is so attractive. Look, how they run and meet and counteract. But of course the wooden seat is wrong. It destroys the perfect lightness and unity intention the cane gave. I like it, though. Ah, oh, yes, said Ursula, so do I. How much is it? Birkin asked the man. Ten shillings. And you will send it? It was bought. So beautiful, so pure, Birkin said. It almost breaks my heart. They walked along between the heaps of rubbish. My beloved country! It had something to express, even when it made that chair. And hasn't it now? asked Ursula. She was always angry when he took this tone. No, it hasn't. When I see that clear, beautiful chair, and I think of England, even Jane Austen's England, it had living thoughts to unfold even then, and pure happiness in unfolding them. And now we can only fish among the rubbish heaps for the remnants of their old expression. There is no production in us now, only sordid and foul mechanicalness. It isn't true, cried Ursula. Why must you always praise the past at the expense of the present? Really, I don't think so much of Jane Austen's England. It was materialistic enough, if you like. It could afford to be materialistic, said Birkin, because it had the power to be something other, which we haven't. We are materialistic because we haven't got the power to be anything else. Try as we may, we can't bring off anything but materialism. Mechanism, the very soul of materialism. Ursula was subdued into angry silence. She did not heed what he said. She was rebelling against something else. "'And I hate your past. I'm sick of it,' she cried. "'I believe I even hate that old chair, though it is beautiful. It isn't my sort of beauty. I wish it had been smashed up when its day was over, not left to preach the beloved past to us. I am sick of the beloved past. Not so sick as I am of the accursed present, he said. Yes, just the same. I hate the present, but I don't want the past to take its place. I don't want that old chair. He was rather angry for a moment. Then he looked at the sky shining beyond the tower of the public baths, and he seemed to get over it all. He laughed. "'All right,' he said. "'Then let us not have it. I'm sick of it all, too. At any rate, one can't go on living on the old bones of beauty.' "'One can't,' she cried. "'I don't want old things.' "'The truth is, we don't want things at all,' he replied. "'The thought of a house and furniture of my own is hateful to me.' This startled her for a moment. Then she replied, "'So it is to me. But one must live somewhere.' "'Not somewhere. Anywhere,' he said. "'One should just live anywhere, not have a definite place. I don't want a definite place. As soon as you get a room, and it is complete, you want to run from it. Now my rooms at the mill are quite complete. I want them at the bottom of the sea.' It is a horrible tyranny of a fixed milieu, where each piece of furniture is a commandment stone. She clung to his arm as they walked away from the market. 
"'But what are we going to do?' she said. "'We must live somehow. "'And I do want some beauty in my surroundings. "'I want a sort of natural grandeur, even. Splendour. "'You'll never get it in houses and furniture, or even clothes. "'Houses and furniture and clothes, "'they're all terms of an old base world, "'a detestable society of man.' and if you have a Tudor house and old beautiful furniture, it is only the past perpetuated on top of you. Horrible! And if you have a perfect modern house done for you by Poiret, it is something else perpetuated on top of you. It is all horrible. It is all possessions, possessions, bullying you and turning you into a generalisation. You have to be like Rodin, Michelangelo, and leave a piece of raw rock unfinished to your figure. You must leave your surroundings sketchy, unfinished, so that you are never contained, never confined, never dominated from the outside. She stood in the street contemplating. And we are never to have a complete place of our own? Never a home? she said. Pray God in this world, no he answered. "'But there's only this world,' she objected. He spread out his hands with a gesture of indifference. "'Meanwhile, then, we'll avoid having things of our own,' he said. "'But you've just bought a chair,' she said. "'I can tell the man I don't want it,' he replied. She pondered again. Then a queer little movement twitched her face. No, she said, we don't want it. I'm sick of old things. New ones as well, he said. They retraced their steps. There, in front of some furniture, stood the young couple, the woman who was going to have a baby, and the narrow-faced youth. She was fair, rather short, stout. He was of medium height, attractively built. His dark hair fell sideways over his brow from under his cap. He stood strangely aloof, like one of the damned. "'Let us give it to them,' whispered Ursula. "'Look, they are getting a home together.' "'I won't aid a bet them in it,' he said petulantly, instantly sympathising with the aloof, furtive youth against the active, procreant female. "'Oh, yes!' cried Ursula. It's right for them. There's nothing else for them. Very well, said Birkin. You offer it to them. I'll watch. Ursula went rather nervously to the young couple, who were discussing an iron washstand, or rather the man was glancing furtively and wonderingly, like a prisoner, at the abominable article, whilst the woman was arguing. We bought a chair said Ursula, and we don't want it. Would you have it? We should be glad if you would. The young couple looked round at her, not believing that she could be addressing them. Would you care for it? repeated Ursula. It's really very pretty, but—but— but... She smiled rather dazzlingly. The young couple only stared at her and looked significantly at each other to know what to do. And the man curiously obliterated himself, as if he could make himself invisible as a rat can. "'We wanted to give it to you,' explained Ursula, now overcome with confusion and dread of them. She was attracted by the young man. He was a still, mindless creature, hardly a man at all, a creature that the towns have produced, strangely pure, bred, and fine in one sense, furtive, quick, subtle. His lashes were dark and long and fine over his eyes that had no mind in them, only a dreadful kind of subject, inward consciousness, glazed and dark. His dark brows and all his lines were finely drawn, he would be a dreadful but wonderful lover to a woman, so marvellously contributed. His legs would be marvellously subtle and alive under the shapeless trousers. 
he had some of the fineness and stillness and silkiness of a dark-eyed, silent rat. Ursula had apprehended him with a fine frisson of attraction. The full-built woman was staring offensively. Again Ursula forgot him. "'Won't you have the chair?' she said. The man looked at her with a sideways look of appreciation, yet far off, almost insolent. The woman drew herself up. There was a certain costermonger richness about her. She did not know what Ursula was after. She was on her guard, hostile. Birkin approached, smiling wickedly at seeing Ursula so nonplussed and frightened. "'What's the matter?' he said, smiling. His eyelids had dropped slightly. There was about him the same suggestive, mocking secrecy that was in the bearing of the two city creatures. The man jerked his head a little on one side, indicating Ursula, and said, with curious, amiable, jeering warmth, "'What she want, eh?' An odd smile writhed his lips. Birkin looked at him from under his slack, ironical eyelids. "'To give you a chair, that, with the label on it,' he said, pointing. The man looked at the object indicated. There was a curious hostility in male, outlawed understanding between the two men. "'What you want to give it us for, Governor?' he replied, in a tone of free intimacy that insulted Ursula. "'Thought you'd like it. It's a pretty chair. We bought it and don't want it. No need for you to have it. Don't be frightened,' said Birkin, with a wry smile. The man glanced up at him, half inimical, half recognising. "'Why don't you want it for yourself, if you just bought it?' asked the woman coolly. "'Tain't good enough for you, now you've had a look at it. Frightened it's got something in it, eh?' She was looking at Ursula admiringly, but with some resentment. "'I'd never thought of that,' said Birkin. "'But no, the wood's too thin everywhere.' "'You see,' said Ursula, her face luminous and pleased, "'we are just going to get married, and we thought we'd buy things. Then we decided just now that we wouldn't have furniture. We'd go abroad.' The full-built, slightly blousy city girl looked at the fine face of the other woman with appreciation. They appreciated each other. The youth stood aside, his face expressionless and timeless, the thin line of the black moustache drawn strangely suggestive over his rather wide, closed mouth. He was impassive, abstract, like some dark, suggestive presence, a gutter presence. "'It's all right to be some folks,' said the city girl, turning to her own young man. He did not look at her, but he smiled with the lower part of his face, putting his head aside in an odd gesture of assent. His eyes were unchanging, glazed with darkness. "'Course something to change your mind,' he said, in an incredibly low accent. "'Only ten shillings this time,' said Birkin. The man looked up at him with a grimace of a smile, furtive, unsure. "'Cheap half a quid, Governor,' he said. "'Not like getting divorced.' "'We're not married yet,' said Birkin. "'No, no more, aren't we?' said the young woman loudly. "'But we shall be a Saturday.' Again she looked at the young man with a determined, protective look, at once overbearing and very gentle. He grinned sicklily, turning away his head. She had got his manhood, but, Lord, what did he care? He had a strange furtive pride and slinking singleness. "'Good luck to you,' said Birkin. "'Same to you,' said the young woman. Then, rather tentatively, "'When's yours coming off, then?' Birkin looked round at Ursula. "'It's for the lady to say,' he replied. We go to the registrar the moment she's ready. Ursula laughed, covered with confusion and bewilderment. No hurry, said the young man, grinning suggestive. 
"'Oh, don't break your neck to get there,' said the young woman. "'It's like when you're dead. You're long time married.' The young man turned aside as if this hit him. "'The longer the better, let us hope,' said Birkin. "'That's it, Governor," said the young man admiringly. "'Enjoy it while it lasts. Nibber whip a dead donkey.' "'Only when he's shamming dead,' said the young woman, looking at her young man with caressive tenderness of authority. "'Ah, oh, there's a difference,' he said satirically. "'What about the chair?' said Birkin. "'Yes, all right.' said the woman. They trailed off to the dealer, the handsome but abject young fellow, hanging a little aside. "'That's it,' said Birkin. "'Will you take it with you, or have the address altered?' "'Oh, Fred can carry it. Make him do what he can for the dear old home.' "'Make use of him,' said Fred, grimly humorous, as he took the chair from the dealer. His movements were graceful, yet curiously abject, slinking. "'Here's mother's cosy chair,' he said, "'wants a cushion.' And he stood it down on the market-stones. "'Don't you think it's pretty?' laughed Ursula. "'Oh, I do,' said the young woman. "'Have a sit in it. You'll wish you'd kept it,' said the young man. Ursula promptly sat down in the middle of the market-place. "'Awfully comfortable,' she said but rather hard. You try it." She invited the young man to a seat, but he turned uncouthly, awkwardly aside, glancing up at her with quick, bright eyes, oddly suggestive, like a quick, live rat. "'Don't spoil him,' said the young woman. "'He's not used to armchairs, he isn't.' The young man turned away and said, with averted grin, "'Only wants legs on his.' The four parted. The young woman thanked them. "'Thank you for the chair. It'll last till it gives way.' "'Keep it for an ornament,' said the young man. "'Good afternoon.' "'Good afternoon,' said Ursula and Birkin. "'Good luck to you,' said the young man, glancing and avoiding Birkin's eyes as he turned aside his head. The two couples went asunder, Ursula clinging to Birkin's arm. When they had gone some distance, she glanced back, and saw the young man going beside the full, easy young woman. His trousers sank over his heels. He moved with a sort of slinking evasion, more crushed with odd self-consciousness, now he had the slim old armchair to carry, his arm over the back, the four fine square tapering legs swaying perilously near the granite sets of the pavement. And yet... He was somewhere indomitable and separate, like a quick, vital rat. He had a queer subterranean beauty, repulsive too. "'How strange they are!' said Ursula. "'Children of men,' he said. "'They remind me of Jesus. The meek shall inherit the earth.' "'But they aren't the meek,' said Ursula. "'Yes.' "'I don't know why, but they are,' he replied. They waited for the tram-car. Ursula sat on top and looked out on the town. The dusk was just dimming the hollows of crowded houses. "'And are they going to inherit the earth?' she said. "'Yes, they.' "'Then what are we going to do?' she asked. "'We're not like them, are we? We're not the meek.' "'No, we've got to live in the chinks they leave us.' "'How horrible!' cried Ursula. "'I don't want to live in chinks.' "'Don't worry,' he said. "'They are the children of men. "'They like market-places and street-corners best. "'That leaves plenty of chinks.' "'All the world,' she said. "'Ah, oh, no, but some room.' The tram-car mounted slowly up the hill, where the ugly winter-grey masses of houses looked like a vision of hell that is cold and angular. They sat and looked. Away in the distance was an angry redness of sunset. It was all cold, somehow small, crowded, 
and like the end of the world. "'I don't mind it even then,' said Ursula, looking at the repulsiveness of it all. "'It doesn't concern me.' "'No more it does,' he replied, holding her hand. "'One needn't see. One goes one's way. In my world it is sunny and spacious.' "'It is, my love, isn't it?' she cried, hugging near to him on the top of the tramcar, so that the other passengers stared at them. "'And we will wander about on the face of the earth,' he said, "'and we'll look at the world beyond just this bit.' There was a long silence. Her face was radiant like gold as she sat, thinking. "'I don't want to inherit the earth,' she said. "'I don't want to inherit anything.' He closed his hand over hers. "'Neither do I. I want to be disinherited.' She clasped his fingers closely. "'We won't care about anything,' she said. He sat still and laughed. "'And we'll be married and have done with them,' she added. Again he laughed. "'It's one way of getting rid of everything,' she said, "'to get married.' and one way of accepting the whole world, he added. A whole other world, yes, she said happily. Perhaps there's Gerald and Gudrun, he said. If there is, there is, you see, she said. It's no good our worrying. We can't really alter them, can we? No, he said. One has no right to try, not with the best intentions in the world. "'Do you try to force them?' she asked. "'Perhaps,' he said. "'Why should I want him to be free if it isn't his business?' She paused for a time. "'We can't make him happy, anyhow,' she said. "'He'd have to be it of himself.' "'I know,' he said. "'But we want other people with us, don't we?' "'Why should we?' she asked. "'I don't know,' he said uneasily. "'One has a hankering after a sort of further fellowship.' "'But why?' she insisted. "'Why should you hanker after other people? "'Why should you need them?' "'This hit him right on the quick. "'His brows knitted. "'Does it end with just our two selves?' he asked, tense. "'Yes. What more do you want?' If anybody likes to come along, let them. But why must you run after them? His face was tense and unsatisfied. You see, he said, I always imagine our being really happy with some few other people, a little freedom with people. She pondered for a moment. Yes, one does want that, but it must happen. You can't do anything for it with your will. You always seem to think you can force the flowers to come out. People must love us because they love us. You can't make them. I know, he said, but must one take no steps at all? Must one just go as if one were alone in the world, the only creature in the world? You've got me, she said. Why should you need others? Why must you force people to agree with you? Why can't you be single by yourself, as you are always saying? You try to bully Gerald, as you tried to bully Hermione. You must learn to be alone. And it's so horrid of you. You've got me, and yet you want to force other people to love you as well. You do try to bully them to love you, and even then you don't want their love. His face was full of real perplexity. "'Don't I?' he said. "'It's the problem I can't solve. "'I know I want a perfect and complete relationship with you, "'and we've nearly got it, we really have. "'But beyond that, do I want a real, ultimate relationship with Gerald? "'Do I want a final, almost extra-human relationship with him? "'A relationship in the ultimate of me and him?' Or don't I?" She looked at him for a long time, 
with strange bright eyes, but she did not answer. End of chapter 26 Recording by Ruth Golding Chapter 27 of Women in Love This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding Women in Love by D. H. Lawrence Chapter 27 Flitting That evening Ursula returned home very bright-eyed and wondrous which irritated her people. Her father came home at supper-time, tired after the evening class and the long journey home. Gudrun was reading, the mother sat in silence. Suddenly Ursula said to the company at large, in a bright voice, "'Rupert and I are going to be married to-morrow.' Her father turned round stiffly. "'You what?' he said. "'Tomorrow?' echoed Gudrun. "'Indeed,' said the mother. But Ursula only smiled wonderfully, and did not reply. "'Married to-morrow!' cried her father harshly. "'What are you talking about?' "'Yes,' said Ursula. "'Why not?' Those two words from her always drove him mad. "'Everything is all right.' We shall go to the registrar's office." There was a second's hush in the room after Ursula's blithe vagueness. "'Really, Ursula,' said Gudrun, "'might we ask why there has been all this secrecy?' demanded the mother, rather superbly. "'But there hasn't,' said Ursula. "'You knew.' "'Who knew?' now cried the father. "'Who knew? What do you mean by your you knew?' He was in one of his stupid rages. She instantly closed against him. "'Of course you knew,' she said coolly. "'You knew we were going to get married.' There was a dangerous pause. "'We knew you were going to get married, did we? Knew?' "'Why does anybody know anything about you, you shifty bitch?' "'Father!' cried Gudrun, flushing deep in violent remonstrance. Then, in a cold but gentle voice, as if to remind her sister to be tractable, "'But isn't it a fearfully sudden decision, Ursula?' she asked. "'No, not really,' replied Ursula, with the same maddening cheerfulness. "'He's been wanting me to agree for weeks.' He's had the licence ready. Only I—I I wasn't ready in myself. Now I am ready. Is there anything to be disagreeable about?" "'Certainly not,' said Gudrun, but in a tone of cold reproof. "'You're perfectly free to do as you like.' "'Ready in yourself. Yourself, that's all that matters, isn't it? I wasn't ready in myself.' he mimicked her phrase offensively. "'You and yourself, you are of some importance, aren't you?' She drew herself up, and set back her throat, her eyes shining yellow and dangerous. "'I am to myself,' she said, wounded and mortified. "'I know I am not to anybody else. You only wanted to bully me. You never cared for my happiness.' He was leaning forward, watching her, his face intense like a spark. "'Ursula, what are you saying? Keep your tongue still!' cried her mother. Ursula swung round, and the lights in her eyes flashed. "'No, I won't!' she cried. "'I won't hold my tongue and be bullied. What does it matter which day I get married? What does it matter? It doesn't affect anybody but myself.' Her father was tense, and gathered together like a cat about to spring. "'Doesn't it?' he cried, coming nearer to her. She shrank away. "'No! How can it?' she replied, shrinking but stubborn. "'It doesn't matter to me, then, what you do, what becomes of you?' he cried, in a strange voice, like a cry. 
the mother and Gudrun stood back as if hypnotised. "'No,' stammered Ursula. Her father was very near to her. "'You only want to—' She knew it was dangerous, and she stopped. He was gathered together, every muscle ready. "'What?' he challenged. "'Bully me!' she muttered. And even as her lips were moving, his hand had caught her smack at the side of the face, and she was sent up against the door. "'Father!' cried Gudrun in a high voice. "'It is impossible!' He stood unmoving. Ursula recovered. Her hand was on the door-handle. She slowly drew herself up. He seemed doubtful now. "'It's true!' she declared with brilliant tears in her eyes, her head lifted up in defiance. "'What has your love meant? What did it ever mean? Bullying and denial, it did!' He was advancing again with strange tense movements and clenched fist and the face of a murderer. But swift as lightning she had flashed out of the door, and they heard her running upstairs. He stood for a moment, looking at the door. Then, like a defeated animal, he turned and went back to his seat by the fire. Gudrun was very white. Out of the intense silence the mother's voice was heard, saying, cold and angry, "'Well, you shouldn't take so much notice of her!' Again the silence fell. Each followed a separate set of emotions and thoughts. Suddenly the door opened again. Ursula, dressed in hat and furs, with a small valise in her hand. "'Good-bye,' she said, in her maddening, bright, almost mocking tone. "'I'm going!' And in the next instant the door was closed. They heard the outer door then her quick steps down the garden path, then the gate banged and her light footfall was gone. There was a silence like death in the house. Ursula went straight to the station, hastening heedlessly on winged feet. There was no train, she must walk on to the junction. As she went through the darkness she began to cry, and she wept bitterly, with a dumb, heart-broken child's anguish, all the way on the road and in the train. Time passed unheeded and unknown. She did not know where she was nor what was taking place. Only she wept from fathomless depths of hopeless, hopeless grief, the terrible grief of a child that knows no extenuation. Yet her voice had the same defensive brightness as she spoke to Birkin's landlady at the door. "'Good evening. Is Mr. Birkin in? Can I see him?' "'Yes, he's in. He's in his study.' Ursula slipped past the woman. His door opened. He had heard her voice. Hello! he exclaimed in surprise, seeing her standing there with the valise in her hand and marks of tears on her face. She was one who wept without showing many traces, like a child. "'Do I look a sight?' she said, shrinking. "'No. Why? Come in.' He took the bag from her hand, and they went into the study. There, immediately, her lips began to tremble like those of a child that remembers again, and the tears came rushing up. "'What's the matter?' he asked, taking her in his arms. She sobbed violently on his shoulder, whilst he held her still, waiting. "'What's the matter?' he said again, when she was quieter. But she only pressed her face further into his shoulder, in pain, like a child that cannot tell. "'What is it, then?' he asked. Suddenly she broke away, wiped her eyes, regained her composure, and went and sat in a chair. "'Father hit me,' she announced, sitting bunched up rather like a ruffled bird, 
her eyes very bright. "'What for?' he said. She looked away, and would not answer. There was a pitiful redness about her sensitive nostrils and her quivering lips. "'Why?' he repeated, in his strange, soft, penetrating voice. She looked round at him rather defiantly. "'Because I said I was going to be married to-morrow, and he bullied me.' "'Why did he bully you?' Her mouth dropped again. She remembered the scene once more. The tears came up. "'Because I said he didn't care, and he doesn't. It's only his domineeringness that's hurt,' she said. Her mouth pulled awry by her weeping all the time she spoke, so that he almost smiled. It seemed so childish. Yet it was not childish. It was a mortal conflict, a deep wound. "'It isn't quite true,' he said. "'And even so you shouldn't say it.' "'It is true! It is true!' she wept. "'And I won't be bullied by his pretending it's love when it isn't. "'He doesn't care. How can he? No, he can't!' He sat in silence. She moved him beyond himself. "'Then you shouldn't rouse him if he can't,' replied Birkin quietly. "'And I have loved him, I have,' she wept. "'I've loved him always, and he's always done this to me. He has—' "'It's been a love of opposition, then,' he said. "'Never mind. It will be all right. It's nothing desperate.' "'Yes,' she wept. "'It is.' It is. Why? I shall never see him again. Not immediately. Don't cry. You had to break with him. It had to be. Don't cry. He went over to her and kissed her fine, fragile hair, touching her wet cheeks gently. Don't cry, he repeated. Don't cry any more. He held her head close against him, very close and quiet. At last she was still. Then she looked up, her eyes wide and frightened. "'Don't you want me?' she asked. "'Want you?' His dark and steady eyes puzzled her, and did not give her play. "'Do you wish I hadn't come?' she asked anxious now again for fear she might be out of place. No, he said. I wish there hadn't been the violence, so much ugliness. But perhaps it was inevitable. She watched him in silence. He seemed deadened. But where shall I stay? she asked, feeling humiliated. He thought for a moment. Here, with me, he said. We're married as much today as we shall be tomorrow. But— I'll tell Mrs. Varley, he said. Never mind now. He sat looking at her. She could feel his darkened, steady eyes looking at her all the time. It made her a little bit frightened. She pushed her hair off her forehead nervously. Do I look ugly? she said, and she blew her nose again. A small smile came round his eyes. No, he said, fortunately. And he went across to her, and gathered her like a belonging in his arms. She was so tenderly beautiful. He could not bear to see her. He could only bear to hide her against himself. Now, washed all clean by her tears, she was new and frail like a flower just unfolded. A flower so new, so tender, so made perfect by inner light, that he could not bear to look at her. He must hide her against himself, cover his eyes against her. She had the perfect candour of creation, something translucent and simple, like a radiant shining flower that moment unfolded in primal blessedness. 
she was so new, so wonder-clear, so undimmed. And he was so old, so steeped in heavy memories. Her soul was new, undefined and glimmering with the unseen, and his soul was dark and gloomy. It had only one grain of living hope, like a grain of mustard seed. But this one living grain in him matched the perfect youth in her. I love you, he whispered as he kissed her, and trembled with pure hope, like a man who is born again to a wonderful, lively hope, far exceeding the bounds of death. She could not know how much it meant to him, how much he meant by the few words. Almost childish, she wanted proof and statement, even overstatement, for everything seemed still uncertain, unfixed to her. But the passion of gratitude with which he received her into his soul the extreme, unthinkable gladness of knowing himself living and fit to unite with her, he who was so nearly dead, who was so near to being gone with the rest of his race down the slope of mechanical death, could never be understood by her. He worshipped her as age worships youth, he gloried in her, because in his one grain of faith he was young as she, he was her proper mate. This marriage with her was his resurrection and his life. All this she could not know. She wanted to be made much of, to be adored. There were infinite distances of silence between them. How could he tell her of the imminence of her beauty? that was not form or weight or colour, but something like a strange golden light. How could he know himself what her beauty lay in for him? He said, your nose is beautiful, your chin is adorable, but it sounded like lies, and she was disappointed, hurt. Even when he said, whispering with truth, I love you. I love you. It was not the real truth. It was something beyond love, such a gladness of having surpassed oneself, of having transcended the old existence. How could he say I, when he was something new and unknown, not himself at all? This I, this old formula of the age, was a dead letter. In the new superfine bliss, a peace superseding knowledge, there was no I and you. There was only the third unrealised wonder, the wonder of existing not as oneself, but in a consummation of my being and of her being, in a new one, a new paradisal unit regained from the duality nor can I say, I love you, when I have ceased to be, and you have ceased to be. We are both caught up and transcended into a new oneness where everything is silent, because there is nothing to answer. All is perfect and at one. Speech travels between the separate parts, but in the perfect one there is perfect silence of bliss. They were married by law on the next day, and she did as he bade her. She wrote to her father and mother. Her mother replied, not her father. She did not go back to school. She stayed with Birkin in his rooms, or at the mill, moving with him as he moved but she did not see anybody save Gudrun and Gerald. She was all strange and wondering as yet, but relieved as by dawn. 
Gerald sat talking to her one afternoon in the warm study down at the mill. Rupert had not yet come home. "'You are happy?' Gerald asked her with a smile. "'Very happy,' she cried, shrinking a little in her brightness. "'Yes, one can see it.' "'Can one?' cried Ursula in surprise. He looked up at her with a communicative smile. "'Oh, yes, plainly.' She was pleased. She meditated a moment. "'And can you see that Rupert is happy as well?' He lowered his eyelids and looked aside. "'Oh, yes,' he said. "'Really? Oh, yes.' He was very quiet, as if it were something not to be talked about by him. He seemed sad. She was very sensitive to suggestion. She asked the question he wanted her to ask. "'Why don't you be happy as well?' she said. "'You could be just the same.' He paused a moment. "'With Gudrun?' he asked. "'Yes,' she cried, her eyes glowing. But there was a strange tension, an emphasis, as if they were asserting their wishes against the truth. "'You think Gudrun would have me, and we should be happy?' he said. "'Yes, I'm sure,' she cried. Her eyes were round with delight, yet underneath she was constrained. She knew her own insistence. "'Oh, I'm so glad,' she added. He smiled. "'What makes you glad?' he said. "'For her sake,' she replied. "'I'm sure you'd—' You're the right man for her. You are, he said. And do you think she would agree with you? Oh, yes, she exclaimed hastily. Then, upon reconsideration, very uneasy. Though Gudrun isn't so very simple, is she? One doesn't know her in five minutes, does one? She's not like me in that. She laughed at him, with her strange, open, dazzled face. "'You think she's not much like you?' Gerald asked. She knitted her brows. "'Oh, in many ways she is. But I never know what she will do when anything new comes.' "'You don't,' said Gerald. He was silent for some moments. Then he moved tentatively. "'I was going to ask her, in any case, to go away with me at Christmas,' he said in a very small, cautious voice. "'Go away with you? For a time, you mean?' "'As long as she likes,' he said, with a deprecating movement. They were both silent for some minutes. "'Of course,' said Ursula at last, "'she might just be willing to rush into marriage. You can see.' "'Yes,' smiled Gerald, "'I can see. But in case she won't—' Do you think she would go abroad with me for a few days, or for a fortnight?" "'Oh, yes,' said Ursula. "'I'd ask her. Do you think we might all go together?' "'All of us?' Again Ursula's face lighted up. "'It would be rather fun, don't you think?' "'Great fun,' he said. "'And then you could see,' said Ursula. "'What?' "'How things went.' I think it is best to take the honeymoon before the wedding, don't you?" She was pleased with this mot. He laughed. "'In certain cases,' he said. "'I'd rather it were so in my own case.' "'Would you?' exclaimed Ursula. Then, doubtingly, "'Yes, perhaps you're right. One should please oneself.' Birkin came in a little later and Ursula told him what had been said. "'Gudrun!' exclaimed Birkin. "'She's a born mistress, just as Gerald is a born lover, amant en titre. If, as somebody says, all women are either wives or mistresses, then Gudrun is a mistress.' "'And all men either lovers or husbands,' cried Ursula. "'But why not both?' "'The one excludes the other,' he laughed. "'Then I want a lover,' cried Ursula. "'No, you don't,' he said. "'But I do,' 
she wailed. He kissed her and laughed. It was two days after this that Ursula was to go to fetch her things from the house in Beldover. The removal had taken place, the family had gone, Gudrun had rooms in Willy Green. Ursula had not seen her parents since her marriage. She wept over the rupture, yet what was the good of making it up? Good or not good, she could not go to them. So her things had been left behind, and she and Gudrun were to walk over for them in the afternoon. It was a wintry afternoon, with red in the sky when they arrived at the house. The windows were dark and blank. Already the place was frightening. A stark, void entrance hall struck a chill to the hearts of the girls. "'I don't believe I dare have come in alone,' said Ursula. "'It frightens me.' "'Ursula!' cried Gudrun. "'Isn't it amazing? Can you believe you lived in this place and never felt it? How I lived here a day without dying of terror, I cannot conceive.' They looked in the big dining-room. It was a good-sized room, but now a cell would have been lovelier. The large bay windows were naked, the floor was stripped, and a border of dark polish went round the tract of pale boarding. In the faded wallpaper were dark patches where furniture had stood, where pictures had hung. The sense of walls, dry, thin, flimsy-seeming walls, and a flimsy flooring, pale with its artificial black edges, was neutralising to the mind. Everything was null to the senses. There was enclosure without substance, for the walls were dry and papery. Where were they standing, on earth, or suspended in some cardboard box? In the hearth was burnt paper, and scraps of half-burnt paper. "'Imagine that we passed our days here,' said Ursula. "'I know,' cried Gudrun. "'It is too appalling. What must we be like if we are the contents of this?' "'Vile,' said Ursula. "'It really is.' And she recognised half-burnt covers of Vogue, half-burnt representations of women in gowns lying under the grate. They went to the drawing-room. Another piece of shut-in air, without weight or substance, only a sense of intolerable, papery imprisonment in nothingness. The kitchen did look more substantial, because of the red-tiled floor and the stove, but it was cold and horrid. The two girls tramped hollowly up the bare stairs. Every sound re-echoed under their hearts. They tramped down the bare corridor. Against the wall of Ursula's bedroom were her things, a trunk, a work-basket, some books, loose coats, a hat-box, standing desolate in the universal emptiness of the dusk. "'A cheerful sight, aren't they?' said Ursula, looking down at her forsaken possessions. "'Very cheerful,' said Gudrun. The two girls set to, carrying everything down to the front door. Again and again they made the hollow, re-echoing transit. The whole place seemed to resound about them with a noise of hollow, empty futility. In the distance the empty, invisible rooms sent forth a vibration almost of obscenity. They almost fled with the last articles into the out-of-door. But it was cold. They were waiting for Birkin, who was coming with the car. They went indoors again, and upstairs to their parents' front bedroom, whose windows looked down on the road, and across the country at the black barred sunset, black and red barred without light. They sat down in the window seat to wait. Both girls were looking over the room. It was void with a meaninglessness that was almost dreadful. "'Really,' said Ursula, "'this room couldn't be sacred, could it?' Gudrun looked over it with slow eyes. "'Impossible,' 
she replied. When I think of their lives, fathers and mothers, their love and their marriage, and all of us children and our bringing up, would you have such a life, Prune? I wouldn't, Ursula. It all seems so nothing, their two lives. There's no meaning in it. Really, if they had not met, and not married, and not lived together, it wouldn't have mattered, would it? Of course, you can't tell, said Gudrun. No, but if I thought my life was going to be like it, Prune, she caught Gudrun's arm, I should run. Gudrun was silent for a few moments. As a matter of fact, one cannot contemplate the ordinary life. One cannot contemplate it, replied Gudrun. With you, Ursula, it is quite different. You will be out of it all with Birkin. He's a special case. But with the ordinary man, who has his life fixed in one place, marriage is just impossible. There may be, and there are, thousands of women who want it, and could conceive of nothing else. But the very thought of it sends me mad. One must be free. Above all, one must be free. One may forfeit everything else, but one must be free. One must not become Seven Pinchbeck Street, or Somerset Drive, or Shortlands. No man will be sufficient to make that good, no man. To marry, one must have a freelance or nothing, a comrade in arms, a Glücksritter. A man with a position in the social world, well, it is just impossible, impossible. What a lovely word, a Glücksritter, said Ursula, so much nicer than a soldier of fortune. Yes, isn't it? said Gudrun. I'd tilt the world with a Glücksritter. But a home, an establishment, Ursula, what would it mean? Think. I know, said Ursula. We've had one home. That's enough for me. Quite enough, said Gudrun. The little grey home in the west, quoted Ursula ironically. Doesn't it sound grey, too? said Gudrun grimly. They were interrupted by the sound of the car. There was Birkin. Ursula was surprised that she felt so lit up, that she became suddenly so free from the problems of grey homes in the West. They heard his heels click on the hall pavement below. Hello, he called his voice echoing alive through the house. Ursula smiled to herself. He was frightened of the place, too. "'Hello! Here we are!' she called downstairs, and they heard him quickly running up. "'This is a ghostly situation,' he said. "'These houses don't have ghosts. They've never had any personality, and only a place with personality can have a ghost,' said Gudrun. I suppose so. Are you both weeping over the past? We are, said Gudrun grimly. Ursula laughed. Not weeping that it's gone, but weeping that it ever was, she said. Oh, he replied, relieved. He sat down for a moment. There was something in his presence, Ursula thought, lambent and alive. It made even the impertinent structure of this null house disappear. "'Gudrun says she could not bear to be married and put into a house,' said Ursula, meaningful. They knew this referred to Gerald. He was silent for some moments. "'Well,' he said, "'if you know beforehand you couldn't stand it, you're safe.' "'Quite,' said Gudrun. Why does every woman think her aim in life is to have a hubby and a little grey home in the West? Why is this the goal of life? Why should it be? said Ursula. Il faut avoir le respect de ses bêtises, said Birkin. 
"'But you needn't have the respect for the bêtise before you've committed it,' laughed Ursula. "'Ah, then, des bêtises du papa?' "'Et de la maman,' added Gudrun satirically. "'Et des voisins,' said Ursula. They all laughed and rose. It was getting dark. They carried the things to the car. Gudrun locked the door of the empty house. Birkin had lighted the lamps of the automobile. It all seemed very happy, as if they were setting out. "'Do you mind stopping at Coulson's? I have to leave the key there,' said Gudrun. "'Right,' said Birkin, and they moved off. They stopped in the main street. The shops were just lighted. The last miners were passing home along the causeways, half-visible shadows in their grey pit-dirt moving through the blue air. But their feet rang harshly in manifold sound along the pavement. How pleased Gudrun was to come out of the shop and enter the car, and be borne swiftly away into the downhill of palpable dusk with Ursula and Birkin. What an adventure life seemed at this moment! How deeply, how suddenly she envied Ursula! Life for her was so quick, and an open door, so reckless, as if not only this world, but the world that was gone, and the world to come, were nothing to her. Ah, if she could be just like that, it would be perfect. For always, except in her moments of excitement, she felt a want within herself. She was unsure. She had felt that now, at last, in Gerald's strong and violent love, she was living fully and finally. But when she compared herself with Ursula, already her soul was jealous, unsatisfied. She was not satisfied, she was never to be satisfied. What was she short of now? It was marriage, it was the wonderful stability of marriage. She did want it, let her say what she might. She had been lying. The old idea of marriage was right even now, marriage and the home. Yet her mouth gave a little grimace at the words. She thought of Gerald and Shortlands, marriage and the home. Ah, well, let it rest. He meant a great deal to her. But perhaps it was not in her to marry. She was one of life's outcasts, one of the drifting lives that have no root. No, no, it could not be so. She suddenly conjured up a rosy room, with herself in a beautiful gown, and a handsome man in evening dress who held her in his arms in the firelight and kissed her. This picture she entitled Home. It would have done for the Royal Academy. "'Come with us to tea, do,' said Ursula, as they ran nearer to the cottage of Willie Green. "'Thanks awfully, but I must go in,' said Gudrun. She wanted very much to go on with Ursula and Birkin. That seemed like life indeed to her yet a certain perversity would not let her. "'Do come! Yes, it would be so nice!' pleaded Ursula. "'I'm awfully sorry. I should love to, but I can't, really.' She descended from the car in trembling haste. "'Can't you really?' came Ursula's regretful voice. "'No, really, I can't,' responded Gudrun's pathetic, chagrined words out of the dusk. "'All right, are you?' called Birkin. "'Quite,' said Gudrun. "'Good night.' "'Good night,' they called. "'Come whenever you like. We shall be glad,' called Birkin. "'Thank you very much,' called Gudrun, in the strange, twanging voice of lonely chagrin that was very puzzling to him. She turned away to her cottage gate, and they drove on but immediately she stood to watch them as the car ran vague into the distance. And as she went up the path to her strange house, 
her heart was full of incomprehensible bitterness. In her parlour was a long case clock, and inserted into its dial was a ruddy, round, slant-eyed, joyous-painted face that wagged over with the most ridiculous ogle when the clock ticked, and back again with the same absurd glad eye at the next tick. All the time the absurd, smooth, brown-ruddy face gave her an obtrusive glad eye. She stood for minutes watching it, till a sort of maddened disgust overcame her, and she laughed at herself hollowly, and still it rocked, and gave her the glad eye from one side, then from the other, from one side, then from the other. Oh, how unhappy she was! in the midst of her most active happiness. Oh, how unhappy she was! She glanced at the table. Gooseberry jam, and the same homemade cake with too much soda in it. Still, gooseberry jam was good, and one so rarely got it. All the evening she wanted to go to the mill but she coldly refused to allow herself. She went the next afternoon instead. She was happy to find Ursula alone. It was a lovely, intimate, secluded atmosphere. They talked endlessly and delightedly. "'Aren't you fearfully happy here?' said Gudrun to her sister, glancing at her own bright eyes in the mirror. She always envied, almost with resentment, the strange, positive fullness that subsisted in the atmosphere around Ursula and Birkin. "'How really beautifully this room is done,' she said aloud. "'This hard, plaited matting, what a lovely colour it is, the colour of cool light!' And it seemed to her perfect. "'Ursula,' she said at length, in a voice of question and detachment. Did you know that Gerald Cry had suggested our going away altogether at Christmas? Yes, he's spoken to Rupert. A deep flush dyed Gudrun's cheek. She was silent a moment, as if taken aback, and not knowing what to say. But don't you think, she said at last, it is amazingly cool? Ursula laughed. I like him for it, she said. Gudrun was silent. It was evident that, whilst she was almost mortified by Gerald's taking the liberty of making such a suggestion to Birkin, yet the idea itself attracted her strongly. There's rather lovely simplicity about Gerald, I think, said Ursula. So defiant, somehow. Oh, I think he's very lovable. Gudrun did not reply for some moments. She had still to get over the feeling of insult at the liberty taken with her freedom. "'What did Rupert say, do you know?' she asked. "'He said it would be most awfully jolly,' said Ursula. Again Gudrun looked down and was silent. "'Don't you think it would?' said Ursula tentatively. She was never quite sure how many defences Gudrun was having round herself. Gudrun raised her face with difficulty, and held it averted. "'I think it might be awfully jolly, as you say,' she replied. "'But don't you think it was an unpardonable liberty to take, to talk of such things to Rupert, who, after all—you see what I mean, Ursula? They might have been two men arranging an outing with some little teep they'd picked up. Oh, I think it's unforgivable, quite. She used the French word, deep. Her eyes flashed, her soft face was flushed and sullen. Ursula looked on, rather frightened. Frightened, most of all, because she thought Gudrun seemed rather common. Really like a little teep. But she had not the courage quite to think this, not right out. Oh, oh no! she cried, stammering. Oh, no, not at all like that. Oh, no. No, I think it's rather beautiful, the friendship between Rupert and Gerald. They just are simple, 
They say anything to each other, like brothers. Gudrun flushed deeper. She could not bear it that Gerald gave her away, even to Birkin. "'But do you think even brothers have any right to exchange confidences of that sort?' she asked, with deep anger. "'Oh, yes,' said Ursula. "'There's never anything said that isn't perfectly straightforward. No, the thing that's amazed me most in Gerald, how perfectly simple and direct he can be. And, you know, it takes rather a big man. Most of them must be indirect. They are such cowards.' But Gudrun was still silent with anger. She wanted the absolute secrecy kept with regard to her movements. "'Won't you go?' said Ursula. "'Do. We might all be so happy. There is something I love about Gerald. He's much more lovable than I thought him. He's free, Gudrun. He really is.' Gudrun's mouth was still closed, sullen and ugly. She opened it at length. "'Do you know where he proposes to go?' she asked. "'Yes, to the Tyrol, where he used to go when he was in Germany. A lovely place where students go, small and rough and lovely, for winter sport.' Through Gudrun's mind went the angry thought, "'They know everything.' "'Yes,' she said aloud. "'About forty kilometres from Innsbruck, isn't it? "'I don't know exactly where, but it would be lovely, don't you think? "'High in the perfect snow?' "'Very lovely,' said Gudrun sarcastically. "'Ursula was put out. "'Of course,' she said, "'I think Gerald spoke to Rupert "'so that it shouldn't seem like an outing with a teep.' "'I know, of course,' said Gudrun, that he quite commonly does take up with that sort. "'Does he?' said Ursula. "'Why, how do you know?' "'I know of a model in Chelsea,' said Gudrun coldly. Now Ursula was silent. "'Well,' she said at last, with a doubtful laugh, "'I hope he has a good time with her.' At which Gudrun looked more glum. End of chapter 27 Recording by Ruth Golding